Texas Rangers. Texas Rangers, first to advance, last to retreat. Texas, more than 260,000 square miles. And 50 men who make up the most famous and oldest law enforcement body in North America. From the files of the Texas Rangers come these stories based on fact. Only names, dates, and places are fictitious for obvious reasons. The events themselves are a matter of record. To a Texas Ranger may go as many as four assignments a week. A case may lead him into the remotest corner of the plains or the crowded streets of the biggest cities. But wherever he goes, he commands respect. To Texans, his badge is the symbol of security. This is Ranger Jace Pearson. The case we called by just a number began on the morning of July 15th last year. The Stevens Ranch, located just about in the middle of Carson County, is where it started. It started when the Stevens kid, age nine, came running up a long drive to his house. <laughs> is just like me and Sam Stevens found it. Yeah. Except the bodies. Sure. Kind of a mess. It was a lot worse. Any fingerprints, Sheriff? Nobody's touched anything, not even the phone. Been leaving the prints for you. Okay, I'll see what we can pick up. Meantime, we'll... Well, what are you looking at? Rain here lately? Rain? Nary a drop, what? Look. Got kicked under the bed. Mean anything? Maybe. Funny shape. Kind of like it came from the instep of a man's boot. So? Let's go outside. Sure. Only one way a piece of dirt could pump in a man's boot. If you walk in wet earth. Nice bone around here. So? Chances are nobody around here had this piece of mud in his boot. It ain't like it. Now, wait a second. Now. Now. Different kind of earth here. I say, you got something to go on? Sure. Only one thing wrong. What's that? When was the man here? 
When they kill Flo and Tom and and Terry. Yeah, and why? Maybe, maybe if we learn when, uh, why I'll answer it so. How's that been? <laughs> Don't know. Not yet. Well, let's get back to town. I want to match this clump of mud against the boots of everybody who went in that room. It ain't going to be hard. Only five people from around here. Not counting everything. Let's get back. Pretty well kept ranch. Yep. Tom Evans liked it there. Mm hmm. Wonder why I let that fence go. Fence? Which? Right here. Hey, what is it? The hogs. Hogs? Sure, Tom's hogs. This air sty. Ain't one here. Think the killer stole them? Come on. Here's why they're not here, Sheriff. This break in the fence. Figure the killer might have busted through? Oh. Uh -huh. Hogs did, more than likely. Rails are broken through the inside, see? Pushed out. Hogs did. It'd be unlikely a man would steal hogs. Too easy for somebody to spot him, so why? Why what? Hogs broke out for some reason. Scared? Well, if the killer cut across the sty, there's no chance of finding his tracks not in here. Look, I, I wonder if I can talk to Billy Stevens. All right, so I got an idea. Let's go. Billy. Huh? Nice pony, Billy. Yours? Yeah, he's mine. He don't know you, mister. Oh, I'll fix it. Oh, boy. He got a name, Billy? Uh-huh. Jinx. <laughs> Fixing for trouble, huh? Mm, got a good mouth. Fine legs. Good boy, Jinx. He don't let everybody pet him. Oh, I can't blame him for that. Oh, by the way, my name's Pearson, Billy. Chase Pearson. Howdy. Howdy. You come to see my dad? Well, matter of fact, Billy, I dropped by to see you. Me? Yeah. Ever seen one of these, Billy? Texas Ranger badge. That's right. You, you a ranger? Sure am. Gee. Billy. Yeah, Ranger Pearson? Kind of need your help. Mine? Real bad. I, but, sure. The other day, you went to see your friend. Carl. Carl Evans. Uh, I want you to remember something, Billy. It'll be a big help to me. I ain't going to think. No, I ain't not, go not about that, Billy. About the hogs. Hogs? Mm hmm Did you see the hogs? Mr. Evans Falls? That's it? Sure. I saw it. In the sty, huh? No, no, they were loose. Running around loose. Sure? Sure. Running around making noise. And then I went up to the, the door. I knocked. And nobody answered. I went to the window. I looked in. I looked in and I... Fine, fine. Guess we'll... Write down about the hogs in the notebook. And I'll put it in the report. With my name? With your name. You'll probably get a letter of thanks from the I will? Sure thing. Well, Billy, be seeing you. Hey, can I tell the kids I helped the ranger? You want to? Gee, you betcha. Okay. You tell them I couldn't have done without you. Billy told me what I wanted to know. Sheriff Larkins and I went back to the Evans Ranch. In the barn, we found three sacks of feed, two full and one with just enough taken out for one feed of the hogs. Then I checked with the feed store in town. Sure, Tom Evans bought all his feed here. You got a record of the last time he's in, ma'am? Sure have. Right here in the camp. Can I see it, ma'am? Certainly can. Anything for a ranger. It is. Right here. Mm. The ninth of July. That's right. Just six days for for Billy Stevens. Uh -huh. Six days before. Pearson, any time you're ready, got all the people together who's in that room. Got on the same boots of war that day. Oh, thanks, Sheriff. Now, ma'am, 
You're sure it was a nine? It was a nine. So I told you that, Pearson. A couple other folks saw Tom Evans here in town. Yeah, I know. So him and his family could have been killed any time between the ninth and the 15th. Yeah. Uh, ma'am. Yeah? Tom Evans say anything, uh, uh, in a hurry? Anything like that? Why, yes. I remember him telling me he had to get back to the feed. He was all out. Sure of that? As sure as I'm standing here. Good. Thank you, ma'am. Let's go, Sheriff. Thank you, ma'am. Everything fitting together? Murders were committed late on the 9th or early the morning of the 10th. Oh, well, I figured. Tom Evans bought feed on the 9th, three bags of it. And he said he was all out of feed at the ranch. He had to get home to feed the hogs. We found those bags of feed, Sheriff. Two of them unopened. Yeah, and the third... With just enough to be taken out for one feed. Sure. Tom fed the hogs on the 9th. But on the 10th, he didn't. He was dead. Murdered. Got something to go on at last. Yeah. Well, it is something. I guess so. But I'm counting more on this, Sheriff. A little piece of mud. Earth that came from someplace else carried in by the murderer on his boot. How do you know it comes from someplace else? You see earth this color around here? Nope. I've seen this kind. In Wheeler County. Wheeler? That's a long piece. So much the better. Eh? Come on, Sheriff. I got a lot of questions to ask in a real short space of time to get them asked. Mud hogs. <laughs> Didn't sound or look like much. Meantime, the killer might have made tracks for any place in Texas. He might have headed to the border in New Mexico or got himself lost in the lonely stretches of New Mexico or in the big cities of Oklahoma. Got a whole week's start. Meantime, I reported back to my company captain, Clay Travis. He wasn't enthusiastic. Yeah, it's not much to go on, Chase. Mm, little enough, but working on a shoestring is better than nothing. How's a shoestring look? Never gets any longer. Anyway, Cap, Evans was in town on the ninth, and I went to the bank, threw out a hundred dollars. Couldn't find that money on his bank. Robbery? Yeah. The way I figured, the killer was surprised, grabbed this, and iron. Uh-huh. And that iron's been gone over by the lab, and the only thing on it was blood. Couldn't pick up a clean print any place in the murder room. Ever figure it mightn't have been a stranger? Sure. But I'm laying my money on that piece of mud. Oh, say, a report on it came from the Austin lab. You got it? Sure do. Thank you. That is. Well, you were right about Wheeler County. Mm-hmm. It's like we're narrowing down there. This particular sample found in southwest New York. Yeah, still covers a good piece of territory. Yeah. There's just so many ranches in that such Ranches? Oh, you figure your man might have worked on them. Could be. The way I look at it, he wandered down into Carson County, into town, might have seen Evans with the money, tailed into the ranch. Not being seen by anyone? What's the point, Cap? This time of year, there's a lot of folks passing through, looking for work. Ever pay much attention to yeah, lots of times. <laughs> You're paid to do it. Other folks aren't. Not unless he acts up to attract attention. So you've got no description. I have got one. I'm in I'm going to check every ranch there and send in samples of earth from every one of them. Be seeing you. How are you going? Just hit the radio car. Keep in touch that way. And I'd like to take this flat iron with me. Yeah, it was okay with me. Oh, uh, better take a horse trailer too. Something tells me when I... Find our man, it'll be someplace on the course. Somewhere I once read that a man had found a needle in a haystack. Get it on a bed. No, well, there's only one haystack. Southwest Wheeler County was one ranch after another. Another dead end I ran into was a cure, another break, a longer lead, a better chance to get away. And the man who found the needle knew what a needle looked like. We had noticed it. The needle stayed in one place. Our man could move around. I asked a lot of questions, all the same other things. Then the ranch in the first year of the Come on, have some coffee. We can talk. Don't go to any trouble. Trouble for a ranger? <laughs> you boys got any idea what you look like when you turn up? 
<laughs> Good or bad? Son, does folks living out here all alone that bad Joe wins like a handshake? <laughs> How'd you like some people? Well, it can't stay long, Mr. Williams. Oh, looking for somebody, huh? A murderer. Uh, can I help any? I don't know. It all depends. Depends on whether you hired any hands the last, oh, month or so. Sure, got some here now. You want to see them? No. Besides, I don't think my man would be here. Huh? But you're looking. You come here. I want to know if any hands left here around the ninth of the month. This month. Mm, no, no. Nope, didn't close out nobody on the ninth. The seventh do. Just about right. Closed out all well that day. Orwell? You know him? Never laid eyes on him before I took him on a couple of months ago. Why'd he leave? Ornery cuts. Never got along with anyone. Always asking for his pay in advance. Had it spent before it hit his pocket. I want you to think carefully. Give me the best description of him you possibly can give. Every detail, how he talked, acted, looked, everything. Uh, you figure he's your man, huh? I don't know, Mr. Williams. Till I get a better lead, I'll fail this one. <laughs> Suspect still in state. Why Unit 10? When Suspect left Williams Ranch, he had his pay. Didn't keep it long. Evidence indicates Suspect a drifter. Probably thinks he's safe by now and won't move fast. Highway patrols and ranger units near borders alerted. Suspect's previous travel habits indicate he stays to back trails. Uh, which direction are you moving, Unit 10? Unit 10 moving west toward Carson County. We'll keep Unit 3 informed. Unit 10, 10 4. Covered every ranch, every farm, traveling by radio car when I could and on horse when I had to leave the highways. Once or twice I got a dim lead on Orwell, but he was like quicksilver. He kept moving. The more he did, the more I was convinced he was the killer. And then I just got over into Carson County when Captain Travis contacted me with radio. Unit 3 to Unit 10. Unit 3 to Unit 10. Unit 10 to Unit 3. Go ahead, Unit 3. Another lead on Carson County suspect. This one's still smoking. Just came in. Here it is, Unit 10. A man answering suspect's description reported seen near Pelly Ranch up near Amarillo. We'll investigate. Unit 10, 10 4. the 60-odd miles to the Pelly Ranch near Amarillo in something less than an hour. Got in touch with the foreman and told him what I wanted. But he told me... Got no hand named Orwell, Ranger? Sure? Darn sure. And you describe a folk named Martin. That doesn't mean a thing. Probably a phony name. Sure, could be. What do you want to do about it? Where is this Martin? Riding fence, north of here. I want to get to him. Not in your car. I got a horse. You need it. Look at here. This guy is what you say. He ain't going to stay long in one place. Man's got paid off yesterday. Martin's headed for the North Fence early this morning. Ready to start fine. Sure. Come on. You say this Orwell was riding a sorrel? That's what he left the Williams Ranch on. Well, this Martin's riding the black. Man can change horses as well as his name. Sure. You see him start out this morning? Yep. Rode as far as the edge of the corral with me. Tell him what I want it done. That'll help some. Looks like it'll be a trailing job. Yes, guess so. Well, here's where he started from. Big mess of tracks here. No telling which one's Martin's horse. But you ride off alone? Uh-huh. Straight north, heading for the pinch. Well, thanks a lot. I'll see if I can pick him up. I 
rode for two hours, cutting back and forth in an arc trying to pick up the train. Then I got a break. Someone had pulled up the stream to water his horse, and there were boot tracks in the soft earth around the stream. Cigarette butt that hadn't been smoked too long before. The paper was still fresh. The horse's tracks didn't go north from there. They turned off due west, kept along the bank of the stream. Looked like Orwell or Martin was keeping close to water. That meant he wasn't going to ride any north fence, but was heading for the border of New Mexico. He wanted good camping spots handy. You want my saddlebag, Martin? I, I thought you were asleep. No, don't reach for it, Martin. I'll blow your head off. What do you get head up? Man starts to go through my saddlebags while I'm sleeping.
Yeah, sure, sure. Yeah, you got a cigarette? Packs in the saddlebag. Yeah, don't mind me losing around him now. How will I'm looking? No. Cigarettes wrapped up in a piece of old blanket. This bag? Other one. Is it? Yeah, that's it. Wrapped up in that. What do you got in here? Feels like a ton of iron. Might be. Unroll the blanket. <laughs> Recognize that flat iron Orwell? Johnny! Orwell got himself to meet me and my horse. He slapped it around the horse jumped toward me. I rolled over in the way when Orwell fired again. I was gone. I waited for more to give him a ticket to clean. I trailed him on the foot. For over an hour, we played cat and mouse in the stillness of the country. Then I came to another world. from the files of the Texas Rangers. Tonight's script was written by Russell Hughes and produced by Stacy Keith. Next week, the National Broadcasting Company will bring you another case from the records of the oldest law enforcement body in North America, the Texas Rangers. Wheaties presents Joel McRae in Tales of the Texas Rangers. On stage tonight, transcribed from Hollywood, another in the Wheaties big parade of exciting half-hour presentations. Tales of the Texas Rangers, starring Joel McRae as Ranger Pearson. Texas, more than 260,000 square miles, and 50 men who make up the most famous and oldest law enforcement body in North America. Now, from the files of the Texas Rangers come these stories based on facts. Only names, dates, and places are fictitious for obvious reasons. The events themselves are a matter of record. Case for tonight, the White Elephant.
It is January 16, 1950. The time, 6.28 p.m. A freight train just outside of a West Texas town gains speed and rolls through the gathering dusk. Inside a gondola car, a hobo crouches in the corner as the brakeman comes toward him. This is where you get up. Now, listen, pal. Just let me get to the next town. I just, just... I said this is where you get up. <laughs> but we're moving. Yeah, I... you get on where we was moving, you can get up. Now, come on or I'll touch the top of your head. Now, listen, don't, don't, don't do it. I just... Get don't... on your Please. feet like this. Now, let, let go. No, let go. Let me get up. Go, you. Don't get... Oh, you. Oh, you. Oh, you. Oh, me, will you? Oh, you ain't get me. I'm coming. Tales of the Texas Rangers will continue in just a moment. You take a nice, ripe, plump kernel of wheat, and you roll it out flat, and you toast it a little. And what have you got? A wheaty. Do that over and over and over again. Do that enough times. And pretty soon, you have a whole bowl full of wheat, and you can sit down to breakfast. Now, of course, you and I know not many people go to all that work to get their breakfast Wheaties. They just tip up that big Wheaties box and let those crisp little flakes tumble into the bowl. And you know what? When you do that, you get the very same 100% whole wheat goodness and energy that you would get if you rolled out your own Wheaties flakes kernel by kernel. And the best tip I can give you is to tip the Wheaties into your own bowl first thing in the morning and see how Wheaties at 7 can help at 11. At 2.55 a.m. of the morning following the freight train incident, a rancher named Banker noticed a small coupe parked in the shoulder of the road. It bore Oklahoma license plates. Banker turned his spotlight on the car, saw a man slumped down in the driver's seat. A half hour later, Sheriff Caldwell, notified by Banker, began investigation of the murder and called in the Texas Rangers. Ranger Jace Pearson was assigned to the case. And a few hours later, Pearson, Banker, and Sheriff Caldwell stood at the scene. Pearson listened to Banker. It was just about three this morning when I saw it, Ranger. How come you were driving along this road that late? I went into a rancher's meeting in Almira's. I was going to spend the night there and change my mind. Mm -hmm. Did you take this road when you left for Almira's? Yes. What time? Uh, yesterday morning, about uh, 7, 7.30. And this car came here sometime between 7.30 yesterday morning and 3 this morning. I guess so. You never saw the dead man before, huh? It was the first time I laid eyes on him. All right, Mr. Banker, you can go. Hey, if you need me, I'll be home. No identification on the body at all, huh, Sheriff? Nothing in the pockets. Picked clean as a whistle. Anybody else been around the car? Nope. Deputy kept his eyes on it. The car is facing west. Going west when it was stopped. The tire tracks on the shoulder tell that. Blood on the seat. Yep. 38 bullet on it. 38. Might be a police special. Banker got one. Banker, but uh, uh, just ask him for now. You see, I see something. Look here, Sheriff. Huh? Set of tracks leading up to the car. Ordinary shoes, not boots. Heel marks are too broad for boots. Yeah, looks like it. Look at this one. So print with a hole. Now look. The prints lead from that way north up to the car. A little scuffle, and the prince turned back north. Mm -hmm. In other words, Sheriff, somebody walked up to the car, stood there, then turned and went back north. Oh, and here's something else. Grease. Looks like grease. Smeared on the car door. Same side footprints are more. Grease might be from the car. Oh, it's too stiff and heavy for that. Yeah. What about it coming from a freight train, Jace? Why? Well, there's tracks about a mile north of here. Freights use a side and a pull-on when passengers got to pass. Mm -hmm. Maybe it all ties in, Shoe, shoe with a hole in it, grease, freight side. Yeah, might be worth going after. Where do we start? Here at the car first. I'm going to check it over inch by inch. Meantime, you get hold of a freight schedule. I'll meet you at your office. <laughs> sent a sample of grease to the laboratory for analysis.
analysis and took plaster casts of the footprints. Then went on to Sheriff Caldwell's office. He had the information I'd requested. Here it is, Jace. Schedule of freights went through yesterday. How many? Three of them. You can check those, all right. Of course, we might be sending the dogs up the wrong tree. Looks like a hobo to me. Yeah. Let me see the dead man's fingerprints. Sure. Here you are. Oh, these match with some of the prints in the car, see? Exposed Delta. Here you are. Uh, how about those others you got? Pick these up on the door that had the grease on it. Smeared all over. A couple clear enough to use, only... Or only what, Jason? You know, there wasn't a single print on the steering wheel. Seems like the dead man's prints ought to be on it. Gloves? Didn't find any gloves on him, nor in the car. Yeah. You know, by the way, I got a call out if any hobo picked up or seen on those trains. Good. Now, I found these tucked under the sun visor in front of the driver's seat. Gasoline receipts made out to Carl Thompson. Oh, that'll save a lot of checking. And forward the dead man's prints anyway. That steering wheel bothers me. Excuse me, Jace. Sheriff Caldwell. Oh, yeah, good. Hold him. We'll be there as soon as we can make it. Something else, Jace. Brakeman in one of those freights we've been checking has a story. Some hobo slugged him and jumped. Okay, let's go. <laughs> the approximate spot the hobo jumped off the freight. Sheriff Caldwell and I picked up the trail and followed it by horse. We hoped to apprehend the suspect before he could reach a town and lose himself and us. After six hours, we stopped. What's the matter, Jace? Tracks are different. Come here and take a look. Different? Yeah, look. The right print's a little deeper, favoring his left a little. Hurt himself, huh? He must have twisted his leg when he took the jump off the freight. It kept getting worse. He sat down here, smoked a cigarette. Here's the button. He ain't going to make such a good time with a bum leg. We've been traveling at a steady trot. Uh-huh. Okay. Let's get going. <laughs> Suspect's trail showed increased favoring of his left leg. His progress became slower. More and more often he stopped to rest and the trail became fresher and fresher. Evidence in a deserted shack showed Suspect had rested there for quite a while. We picked up the trail again. We're getting close, Sheriff. How do you know? Notice something just now. Take a look at these prints. Same as the ones we've been following. Not quite hole in the right shoe. It's not that. I'm talking about this anthill he crushed. Well, what about it? Quite a few of the prints had anthills in them, crushed and rebuilt. So? Ants start working on a new hill when the old one's been tramped down. This one's so fresh, they haven't had time to rebuild. Hey, that's right. He can't be far off. So we better leave the horses tied up here, Sheriff, and start moving on foot. <laughs> Was there. I didn't do it. Ever own a gun? 38 police special? I told you a hundred times. I never owned no kind of gun. How'd you take all that skin off your arm? I don't know. Fell, maybe. You got that while you were running away. When you jumped off the freight, after you slugged the brake. No, no. Grease on your tank. How'd it get there? Yeah, maybe. Maybe off the freight. Sure. The car we showed you. The one you said you'd never seen before. That's it, too. Is it? Hold up your right foot. Huh? Hold it up. Uh, Hold in the right shoe. Uh, what is it? Here's a plaster cast. Cast at the print of the scene of the murder. Take a good look. Yeah, but I wasn't there, I think. Ever hear of fingerprints? Oh, sure. Here are yours. And here's a set found at the crime. They match. You still say you weren't there? I didn't kill nobody. Let me see your hands. When did you wash them last? I don't know. Maybe a couple of days ago. You know we can tell if you fired a gun. I never had no gun. Did you rob the man in the car? No, no. Look at me. You were there, weren't you? We can prove it. Hooray! All right. All right, it was there. But I didn't kill him. 
Why'd you lie? Well, I was scared. If you're innocent, you don't have to be scared. No, French. I, I got a couple of uh, wraps, bag wraps. That all? <laughs> sure. We can check that, too. Uh, all right. Uh, later. I got a couple of wraps for pinching stuff. Nothing big. Now, look. Tell me exactly what you did. Well, well I, I come in off afraid. I was walking across when I seen the car. I figured it was funny. Something funny. Why? Well, car kind of parked like that. Then I walked over, seen the fella in there. He was dead. I beat it. Hop the freight. That all? You know what else? Up to now. Did you get in the car? Uh, no, sir. No, sir. Did you touch the body or take anything? I, I swear, Ranger, I didn't. Did you touch the steering wheel and then wipe it off? Well, why did he? No, no. What for? Look, I'll tell you. I... Jason? Yeah, Sheriff. Come here, will you? Sure. You stay put. I got no place to go. Here's all the dope on the murdered man, Thompson. Come in just now. Carl Thompson. Resident of Tulsa, Oklahoma. Traveling salesman for Prince Extract Company. This check? Double. Yep. Alleys with the gasoline receipts. Mm -hmm. What about him? A hobo? Yeah. I think the only crime he committed was failure to report what he saw. His fingerprints were all over the outside of the one door of that car, and none inside. Seems to me if he thought of cleaning up the inside, he'd have done the same outside. Yeah, looks like it. We'll give him the paraffin test anyway and see if he's fired a gun lately. And if he didn't? Start all over. And start with that clean steering wheel. In just a moment, we continue with Tales of the Texas Rangers, starring Joel McRae as Ranger Jace Pearson. I guess nobody gets much of a taste treat out of taking their calcium and iron and phosphorus or their vitamins straight. But you simply have to have all those things to keep feeling good. And you should have them first thing in the morning, too. Because morning's the time you do most of your big day's work. That's when you really need the energy. You see, morning is the time when you really... Uh, wait a minute, Frank. Uh, why don't you just tell them this? See how Wheaties at 7 can help at 11. Why, you took the words right out of my mouth, of course. Wheaties at 7. Because Wheaties have all those vitamins and minerals. That's how Wheaties give you the zip it takes to feel eager and ready for anything all morning long. Whether you drive a truck or plow a field or if you're just plain busy with a multitude of household duties. And Wheaties do you another big favor. Wheaties wrap all those vitamins up in a wonderful, sunny, toasty, nut-like flavor that fairly hollers, give me some more. Wheaties are crisp and munchy. You know, fun to chew on. Tastes as good going down as they make you feel when they get there. So do this, will you? Not for me, but for yourself. Hurry on down to the Wheaties tomorrow morning and just see for yourself how Wheaties at 7 can help at 11. back to my captain, Stenson, at company headquarters. I told him I was pretty sure that the hobo story checked out. Yeah, it looks like it. But somebody killed Thompson. Killed him and then drove him in his own car to where that rancher spotted him. There wasn't anything on Thompson, huh? No money, no papers, only these. Gasoline charge account receipts. Somebody went to an awful lot of trouble to clean him, but they overlooked these. Mm -hmm. On top, this looks like a plain case of murder with robbery as the motive, but if that was it, why go to all the risk of being spotted in a car with Oklahoma plates? Why not just kill him and leave him? I don't know, Jace. What's your thinking? Well, Thompson was a traveling salesman. Traveled a lot in a few days. Now, suppose the killer realized that with Thompson far enough away from the scene of the crime, we'd have a pretty tough time finding out just where the murder was committed. Yeah, that could be. But why? Well, maybe the killer couldn't leave the spot. So he did the next best thing. Took Thompson's body away. And maybe it wasn't just robbery. Well, what else? I don't know yet, but... I got some more checking to do. It'll take maybe a couple of hours, and then I might have some answers. Well, a couple hours on the nose. 
news, Jace. You get anything new? It's more dope on Thompson, Captain. He never carried much money. Never was known to have picked up a hitchhiker. And I got a pretty good idea of where he was killed. His gasping receipts tell a fair story. Yeah? Oh. Well, this one, for example, dated the 15th day before he was killed. Made out in Banner. He got 16 gallons of gas there. Well, did you ever think somebody else might have been using his credit card? Yeah, but Thompson traveled that route pretty often. Chances are he was well known at the service stations. Yeah, that's right. Okay, go on. I ran a mileage test on his car. He got about 17 miles a gallon. Now his tank holds 16. I did a little figuring. Just about enough gas was used to get him from Bannon to where his body was found. But he could have been killed anywhere between Bannon and where he was found dead. Sure, I know that. It still looks like my next stop is Bannon. Oh, howdy, Ranger. Howdy. Now, how many? Whatever she'll take. Ah, uh, sure thing. You the owner here? Ah, uh, yes, sir. How long? Oh, a couple of years. You work alone? Nights, yeah. Take a look at this, will you? One of my receipts. Credit card stuff. You know this Carl Thompson? Yeah, I see him ever, oh, four or five months. When did you see Thompson last? The evening he bought that gas. Why, anything wrong, Ranger? Was Thompson alone that evening? I, uh, yeah. I never remember him ever having anybody alone. What else do you remember about that evening? Oh, one of the worst sleet storms we ever had. Hit like It'll a... It'll be tough for him to drive then, huh? Oh, sure. Hey, uh, he was asking about some place to stay. He never stayed in Bannon before? I don't know. Leastways, he didn't know much about the places. I told him to try the hotel. He said it was full up. He said the motels were jam-packed. A lousy way. You know where he went? He said he was going to try and find a place along the highway. Why, anything wrong? Plenty. Here's for the gas. I might come back and ask you some more questions. Thanks. <laughs> possible place Thompson might have stayed that night, but I drew one blank after another. Then I got a lead at a motel on the outskirts of Bannon. Sure, Ranger, I remember that night. Sleep was an inch thick. We was full up here, but I sent him to a place down the highway, the Star Motel, been closing up for sale for quite a spell, but I heard it was opened up again. Every cabin was locked, the windows boarded. There wasn't a soul around. I was just about to leave when I noticed something. The electricity must have been on somewhere in the place because the little wheel under the dials of the meter was spinning. It was enough to send me back into town to ask a few more questions. Now, uh, let me see you, Ranger. Star Motels. Hey, yes, sir, here's what we want right here. Uh-huh. Are these all the electricity bills? Yes, sir. Let me see. Up to three months ago, the bills were just for meter installation, minimum service charge. That's right, Ranger. For the last three months, 475, 389, 560. <laughs> kind of funny, isn't it? The place is closed, but for the last three months, the bills have averaged over $4 a month. Didn't that seem peculiar to you? Well, Ranger, we just sure. Sure, I know. Now, can you give me the name of the person to whom these bills were sent? Get it for you right away. Why, yes, Ranger, Mr. Carlson's here. I believe he's on the phone right now, but if you come in... Thank you, ma'am. You Mrs. Carlson? Yes. Hope I'm not bothering you any, Mrs. Carlson. Not at all, Ranger. My husband's here. Sure. Tell you what, I'll come out a little later. I'll bring the client with me. Sure. Thanks for calling. Goodbye. Andy, this is Ranger Pierce. 
Oh, hello. Sorry to barge in like this, Mr. Carlson, but I got a few questions. Questions? Sure, what about? You own the Star Motel, don't you? Yes, I do. Star Motel? Oh, that white elephant. White elephant? <laughs> yeah, I've been trying to get rid of it for two years. Why? Well, like Bessie said, it ain't been worth the hoot since the new highway went in two years ago. Half the traffic that used to pass it. It hasn't been used for two years. Well, I guess I didn't mean exactly that. What did you mean? I, I tried to keep it going for a year after the highway went through, but couldn't rent enough rooms. It wasn't worth trying to save. You got the keys to it? Keys? Sure. Is something wrong, Ranger? Might be, ma'am. Can you take me through the motel, Mr. Calson? Anytime. Right now, suit you? Couldn't be better. Let's go. <laughs> been out here for close on three or four weeks. Did you go through the cabins then? Well, just take a look, see. Kids sometimes fool around. That's why I boarded up the window. Want to take a look in the office? Yeah. Go ahead, Mr. Nelson. Sure. Nothing in here, Ranger? Nope, there's not. Particularly you're looking for? Yeah. Do you have this floor washed lately? Oh, heck no. Ain't no use paying for something like that. It's been washed recently. Huh? Why? How do you know? Scrubbing wood with hot water always raises the drain. Hot water isn't as good as cold to wash out blood stains. What? Blood? blood? Reach! Oh, oh, yeah. oh, run to him. Get away from the guns, Ranger. Hold oh, yeah. it. Sit down. Go on. Hey! Hey! Come on! Well, what the devil is this? Who are you fellas? My guess is a couple of men I want for murder, Mr. Kelson. Murder? Just check the telephone wire. Everything okay? Yeah, of course that guy. Me? Why, I never carry a gun. Well, yeah, we just make sure. Yeah, he's clean. All right, now strip the ranger's gun, though. Wait a minute. You got the drop on me. Maybe I'd have to be a fool to draw. But if you don't want me to be a fool, don't touch these guns. You try and take them off me and I'll go down and use them. And I might get lucky. All right, Mark. Let him alone. He's too smart to start it. Go get the panel truck out and start loading our stuff fast. Well, what about them? We can lock them in. Fix their car so they can't get out of here for a while after we leave. If they try to come out while we're still here, we'll blast whatever door or window they try to come through. Get that, Ranger? I get it. Okay. I'll be outside, Chuck. So your name's Chuck, huh? What is any? What are you and that other fellow doing in my place? Go ahead, Chuck. Tell him. Some other time, friend. Now you two listen. Because I ain't going to say this twice. Try to bust out before you hear us drive off and you'll get it good. Now stay put. They got us locked in. Yeah. Look, don't go near that window. You heard what he said. I'm cracking the morning. I'm just taking a look. What are they doing? Come here, take a look for yourself. Oh, you should have watched the place more. I, I never knew anyone who's used it. And used plenty. Look what they're taking out. Furs. All kinds of stuff. It's beginning to make sense. Closed down motel made a nice storage bin for stolen and smuggled goods. Until they could run it to the markets. Oh, they'll get away. You you said there was a murder. Take it easy, Mr. Johnson. We'll get them. We'll be across the border in a half an hour before we could even reach a phone. Maybe you better take a chance and get shot down in cold blood. No, but we'll get them all right. Know why, Mr. Kelson? Why? <laughs> because you'll help. I pinned Kelson with a quick headlock and then got one arm up on him and applied pressure so I could keep him still while I had a free hand. I reached into his jacket and found what I was looking for under his shoulder. Then I pushed him. <laughs> Are you crazy? You almost broke my arm. Shut up, Calson. Don't you think I saw this gun bulging under your coat? When they deliberately missed it when they frisked you? You played it real smart, almost. Well, I don't know what you're talking about. This gun and the electric bills. You paid them. Paid bills that were being run up in a place that was supposed to be shut down. Seemed kind of funny you never complained to the power company. So what? Wait, so you what? got a phone call from your friends out there. They tipped you because they saw me nosing around here earlier, right? No. Okay. Okay, take a look out there. They're almost finished. In a couple of minutes, they'll be gone. 
In half an hour, they'll be over the border. How about you? You want to stick back here and face a murder charge? There's nothing you can prove. There's plenty we can prove, Calson. And you're holding the bag. You'll have a tough time explaining those electric bills and them missing your gun. I didn't kill that man. Did this Chuck do it? Yeah, yeah, that salesman come in. Joe was going on. Chuck killed him. Then drove him away. All right. Now listen real carefully. I'm going to fire this gun. Then you hammer on the door and holler for me. Get it? Well, what do you want to Just do Just listen. When they come up, tell them you had to kill me. Tell them to open the door. Then Mr. Carlson step back and out of the way fast. They'll be gone in a minute. Make up your mind. All right. Go ahead, I'll do it. Any funny tricks and you get it first. Now, ready? Hey! Turn the door and holler. Chuck, Clark, give me a pass. Open the door. Now, when it's open, get back. What's the matter? Carlson, open the door. I had to kill him. He was making a break for him. Get your chuck knocked him out. Reach. Over. Hey, what's the big idea? Why, you... Oh, you and me get back to town. I got you a deal for this white elephant motel. You can trade it for a jail cell. morning I said to myself, now look, Martin, you got to get up. Why fight it? Think about something pleasant. And right away I thought, we did. That's about the pleasantest thing a man can do. Why, when you figure you can sit down to a bowl of good, crisp Wheaties and then feel like tackling the world, when you know a bowl of Wheaties and milk and fruit can help you work with because you feel good, why, it almost makes you want to shake hands with your alarm clock. And when you hear it come morning, roll out happy, reach for the big orange and blue box, and see how Wheaties at 7 can help at 11. Next week, Joel McRae in another authentic reenactment of a case from the files of the Texas Rangers. will soon be seen starring in the Universal International Technicolor production, Saddle Trim. Tonight's cast included Tony Barrett, Paul McVeigh, Lou Krugman, Jeff Corey, Robert Bruce, Byron Kane, and Jeanette Nolan. This story was transcribed and adapted by Russell Hughes. The program was produced and directed by Stacy Keith. And this is Hal Gibney speaking. This is the Wheaties man, Frank Martin, inviting you to listen Monday night to Frank Lovejoy in Night Beat on the Wheaties Big Parade. See you then. Listen tomorrow for the Summer Symphony. Now it's Basin Street time on NBC. Wheaties presents Joel McRae in Tales of the Texas Rangers. On stage tonight, transcribed from Hollywood, another in the Wheaties' big parade of exciting half-hour presentations. The Texas Rangers, starring Joel McRae as Ranger Pearson. Texas, more than 260,000 square miles. And 50 men who make up the most famous and oldest law enforcement body in North America. Texas.
Texas Rangers tell me stories based on fact. Only names, dates, and places are fictitious for obvious reasons. The events themselves are a matter of record. Case for tonight, Apache Peak. Shortly after midnight on October 4 last, a late model blue sedan came to a stop at a traffic light on the highway leading southwest out of Wichita Falls, Texas. While the driver waited for the light to change, a figure moved out from the shadows and tapped on the window of the sedan. Come on, go to Aspen, mister. I didn't hear you with the window up. I said you're going near Aspen. I don't know. Where is it? I'm headed for El Paso. That's my direction. How about a ride? All right. Hop in. Thanks. Mighty hard getting a ride. As you like. Uh-huh. How far is uh, Haskell? About 80 miles. But I'm going past there up near Apache Peak. Ain't far from El Paso. Oh, good. Keep me from falling asleep at the wheel. I got to be in El Paso in the morning. Business appointment. You from the east? <laughs> New York. I guess the accent sticks out, huh? I reckon so. What kind of business you in? Salesman. Airplane parts. You get tired. I can drive a spell. Hey, that's a thought. As soon as I start to feel sleepy. Sure. Give me a chance to rest up. Do it. Almost 4 a.m. Be in Odessa in 20 minutes. You want to take over? Yeah. Guess I can stop any place on this highway. I haven't seen another car in an hour. Yeah, I'll slide over. You get out and run. No, you get out. Well, it's just as easy for you. Hey. Hey, what are you doing with that gun? I need money, mister, and you've got it. Oh, sure, sure. I'll give it to you. I won't report it or anything. I'll get... I know you won't, mister. Oh! Tales of the Texas Rangers will continue in just a moment. Tonight, as special guest, Wheaties champion, Robert Feller. Well, by golly, it's always fun to meet a Wheaties champion. Especially when he's as nice a guy as Bob Feller, the Cleveland Indian. Hello, Bob. Hi, Ed. Are you seeing many baseball games these days? Oh, you bet, Robert. You eating many Wheaties these days? <laughs> what a question. Well, I've been eating Wheaties for breakfast almost every morning for pretty close to 20 years. Still going strong, huh? Wheaties are mighty tough to get tired of. I guess Wheaties and milk and fruit will still be my favorite breakfast when I'm too old to climb out of the dugout. <laughs> well, that won't be happening for a lot of years yet. Thanks for stopping in, Bob Feller. A real Wheaties champ. You know, gentlemen of the audience, this man Feller has a wife and youngsters even as you and I. His paycheck depends in part on healthy energy, just as ours does. You have my point? We need them too. We need breakfast of champions. Get yours. And now, back to our story with Joel McRae as Ranger Pearson. The body was discovered at 8.15 on the morning of October 4 when a fence rider from a ranch bordering the highway found it in the brush at the side of the road. He reported the discovery to the nearest sheriff, and the sheriff relayed the report to the Texas Rangers. Ranger Jace Pearson was assigned to the case. There's the body, Jace, under that sheet. Where was he found, Sheriff? Oh, about 11 miles east. Must have been dumped out of a car. Hmm. Shot three times. One through the neck and two through the chest. 38 caliber? Yeah. Coroner got two of the slugs. Any identification on him? Or anything, Jace. Whoever done it even stole the clothes off him. Except in his shirt and shorts and necktie. And a pack of cigarettes from his shirt pocket. It's all there on the table. Hmm. Laundry mark on the shirt, that might help. 
coroner say how long he's been dead? Oh, since four or five o'clock this morning. Hmm. These cigarettes, were they on him? Yeah. One. Help him? Maybe a whole lot. Look at this. New York State tax stamp. And can you make something out of that? Only the one pack of cigarettes wouldn't have lasted him from New York to Texas. Probably bought a carton or two to start out on the trip. So his home might be in New York. I reckon an awful lot of folks buy a carton of smokes in New York, please. Yeah, but it's a place to start checking that laundry mark on the shirt. It'd be a help if we know who this man is. I'll send these things into the lab, and they can send a wire photo of the mark to New York. The coroner has some pictures of the body. I'll put them on the wire, too. You got a deputy to get the stuff to my headquarters? Sure thing. I'll call him. Good. Now we can get out and check the scene. This little piece of road here blocked off so no cars could wipe out anything. Good. The yeah, body was found right in here. Yeah. Dragged in from the road. Back of the heel scraped along there. Clothing caught on the mesquite here. And what you picking off there? Little fibers of cloth snagged on here. Lab men get through with these and may be able to tell us what kind of duds they came from. Let's take a look at the road. Fresh set of tire tracks here on the shoulder, James. Yeah, I noticed them. Impression's deeper here. That's where they stopped. Look at the marks around. Body was dragged out of the driver's side. That makes a difference? Means the dead man must have been driving. So, there's a good chance it was his own car. Mm, I reckon that answer. But how about the other thing? Could be the same old story, Sheriff. A hitchhiker. Man had to be a fool to take a hitchhiker through this country, isn't man. Yeah, a fool. The trouble with fools is most of them are nice people. And they don't rape being killed. I'm going to play a hunch. Make some work for the highway patrol. Captain Stimson's out on investigation. I may be able to reach him in his car. Unit 10 to Unit 3. Unit 10 to Unit 3. Unit 10 requests all points bulletin alerting highway patrol and ranger units to stop and check all cars carrying New York State plates. The exhibits you sent over have arrived, Unit 10. You're not just going on that cigarette tax stamp, are you? No, Captain. Murder scene check indicates victim was driving car he was dumped from. Might have been his own. Worth trying, I guess. How soon can we expect report from New York police on laundry mark? Keep Unit 3 informed if I move from this location. Unit 10, 10 4. After the 10 4 sign off, I took the sheriff back to his office. And that's when the hardest part of all hunting began the waiting. The only thing we knew for certain about the murder car was that it was heading west on the road to Pecos and El Paso. I headed the same way, stopping to ask questions to all the smaller towns, the cafes and service stations, wherever a man on the run might risk stopping. But all the answers were the same. New York car, you say? Mm, no, no, I don't think so. I only saw one out of state all day from Oklahoma. Well, thanks anyhow, ma'am. Uh, sit down, have some coffee and pie, Ranger. Oh, no thanks. I gotta find a problem. <laughs> No, I'd sure remember it if a New York car stopped here for gas. Ain't seen one in a week. Well, thanks. Uh, Ranger. Yeah? The kid runs the pumps a little while I'm eating. Maybe he saw something. I'll call him out if you want to wait till I catch his fellow's windshield. I'll wait. Oh, well, gee, I, I just remembered. The kid didn't sell nothing today. Thanks, anyway. We've been working on the Royal Basin, York. 
Well, we don't know. There's nobody. Yeah, I guess not. They detour past you 50 yards away. Only the one who might see is Juan. He holds the red flag when the car is coming down there. But he don't even look up. He just hears the car and wave the flag. He's too busy looking in the movie magazine at Betty Gravel. Well, thanks. <laughs> nightfall, I was just outside of Pecos. I pulled into a grove near an auto court, a place I'd stopped before. Let my horse Charcoal get down from the trailer. Barely got him unloaded when another ranger car pulled in. Engine case? Yeah, Kurtz. Howdy, boy. Howdy. What are you doing down here? Got a teletype for you from headquarters. Murdered man's name was Roger Bradley, New York City. Salesman for an airplane pods outfit. Identification positive? Yeah. Pictures, laundry mark, everything. Police up there traced the laundry mark. Bradley's wife identified the pictures. Was married, huh? Yeah. Three kids. The car you're looking for is a 49 blue sedan. Here's the make and license number. Highway patrol hasn't spotted it any place. Nope. But here's a list of all the clothes Bradley was carrying on the trip. Pretty complete description. I can't understand why nobody's seen that car. That killer might have gotten out of the state. Had a good start. I hope that isn't it, Kurt. Three kids have to grow up without their father because of a gun-crazy hitchhiker. Uh, I know what you mean. Let's hope he's still in Texas. If he is, we're going to find him. <laughs> In just a moment, we continue with Tales of the Texas Rangers, starring Joel McRae as Ranger Chase Pearson. Next time you bounce out of bed in the morning, well, you do bounce, don't you? <laughs> okay, let's say next time you get out of bed, head for the Wheaties. Sure enough, head for the Wheaties at 7 a.m. and see how they help at 11 a.m. Yes, they can make a difference at 11 and they can make a difference at the breakfast table. It's likely to be a pleasanter place with a bowl full of crisp little old Wheaties next to your spoon and napkin. The reason is, of course, the wholehearted whole wheat taste of Wheaties. You're getting all that sweet as a nut whole wheat flavor in every Wheaties flavor. Pour on the milk, put on the fruit, and dig right in to one of the finest openings any morning ever had. And then, see how much finer the morning itself goes when you started with breakfast at camping. That full whole wheat really gives with vitality, you know. There's a whole kernel of wheat in every flake of wheat. Now see if you don't notice the difference all morning long. Less of the mid-morning slump, more of the up and atom punch. You know what I mean? All right then, you try it. Tomorrow, next day, for a good breakfast, for a good morning, start with wheat. See yourself how Wheaties at 7 can help at 11. And now, back to Joel McRae as Ranger Chase Pearson in Tales of the Texas Rangers. For the next five days, Ranger Kurtz and I worked our way west. We couldn't get a lead. Then on the afternoon of October 10th, Six days after the killing, we stopped and unloaded our horses at Eagle Flat in Hudspeth County. Blacksmith's place is open? Yeah. Horses can drink from his trough. Hey, look at that folk leaning against the fence there. <laughs> they sure do get dutied up for Saturday night in Eagle Flat. <laughs> yeah. Kurtz. Matter, Chase. That suit. No folk ordered that through a mail cap. Yeah, it looks like one of the suits described on the teletype. Yeah. Let's find out. Howdy. Well, howdy, Ranger. You live around here? Work the Longbow Ranch up near Tabernacle Mountain. Mighty nice suit you got there. Kind of fancy. Yeah. <laughs> Ain't it a dinger? <laughs> From New York, the label says. New York, huh? Where'd you get that suit? Well, I bought off... Now, wait a minute, Ranger. Wait. This ain't stolen, is it? Yeah. 
The man it was stolen from is dead. Oh, man, I, I just bought off on a fella come by the bunkhouse. When? Oh, reckon it was about five days ago. He, he drove up with a bunch of stuff. Drove up? What kind of car? A uh, new sedan, blue. Notice the license plates on the car? Uh, no, no. What do you think, Kurtz? He's seen our man or he is our man. Were you on the ranch October 4th? This is the first time I've been off in it in two weeks. I bought the suit, I'm telling you. Did you buy anything else? Yeah, this. Watch your hands. Well, I, I'm just going to show you a wallet the fella threw in with a suit. All right, get it out. Uh, there you are. I paid him $10 for the suit and this. Hmm. Identification cards and everything stripped. You take anything out of here? Well, nothing to take. It's just like I got it, except for my $5 and the money pocket. Killer took all identification out of these celluloid card holders. Might have left some prints. Or to get it to the lab. Yeah. All right, you better come with us. Now, look, I didn't do nothing. Why are you taking it? To the sheriff. You can give us a description of the man who sold you the duds. If your story checks out clean, you got nothing to worry about. Oh, it's clean. All right. Let's go. <laughs> checked the folks' story at the Longbow Ranch. He was telling the truth, all right. At least we had a description of the man we were after now. About 20 years old, dark, 5 foot 7, about 140 pounds. Kurtz and I unloaded our horses. Which way are we riding, Chase? Come on, boy. Head north, into the hills. Road Peter's out past his ranch, though, nothing but a trail. We might have turned back to the highway. Uh-huh. Alarm was out by the time he passed here. If he went back to a main highway, the car would have been spotted. He's ditched it up here someplace. Well, let's ride. Uh, get up there, Charco. Get up there, boy. Yeah. We rode north from the Longbow Ranch, cutting into the mesquite and cedar that flanked the road. It got thinner and more difficult. Just when I thought we might have come too far, we spotted the car. Reckon that's it? Let's see. Uh-huh. Smart. Rolled it into a gully and then covered it with dirt and grass. Nobody would ever spot it unless they were looking for it. Let's get back and report it. KTXP. Unit 10 to KTXP. KTXP to Unit 10. Go ahead, Unit 10. Unit 10 located blue sedan registered to Roger Bradley, New York City. All right, Unit 10. KTXP just got a report of fingerprints on celluloid card holders of wallets sent in. One said definitely those of murder victim Roger Bradley. Another said identified as being those of Lenny Tripper. Please repeat, Lenny Tripper. Lenny Tripper. Any line on him? Wanted by Army for desertion three months ago. Description checks. Last known address. Lived with father and mother in cabin near Apache Peak. Car was found north of Longbow Ranch. Apache Peak's about ten miles further in. We'll investigate. Unit 10, 10-4. started. And the country we had to go through is tough enough by daylight. It was after midnight when we sighted Apache Peak. There was still a light on in the cabin nested down in the foothills. Oh, boy. Easy. Keep kind of late hours up here, don't they? Too late. Better tie the horses to that mesquite. And slip up and look in. Yeah. Come on, boy. Jace something moving over there. See it? Looks like a couple of burrows. Let's take a look at it. You boys up past your bedtime, ain't you? Feel Both in a sweat, all caked up. Been packing, too. Yeah, the hair's matted down where they've been cinched. Plenty time to be working burrows. Yeah. 
Come on, let's see the house. Look through the window. Man eaten. Not our boy, though. Too old. Must be Tripper's father. Look, there's the old lady, too. You go around the back way, and I'll go in through the front. Wait till you hear me knock and get in. Right. Open up. Who's there? Texas Ranger. What do you want? Lenny Tripper. He ain't here. Mind if I come in and make sure? Let him in. Come on. Oh, what? Just another ranger at the back, Mrs. Tripper. You want to let him in, too? Go ahead. You don't mind if I finish eating, do you? No, I'll go right ahead. This your regular meal time? I eat one on one. Nothing on back, Chase. Where's your boy, Mr. Tripper? The little ranger. You find him. We ain't seen him in a year since he joined the army. And you haven't seen him in the last three months, either. Since he deserted from the army. You heard what she said. Get me a smoke. If you want to help your boy, you better help us. All right. I'm going to help you. He's in Mexico. Been there more than a month. Mexico, huh? Thanks. Mind if I uh, have one of those cigarettes, Mr. Tripper? Yeah, I mind. Reckon you can buy your own? Well, I just got a hankering for one of those. Can't always get a cigarette like that. What do you mean, Ranger? A New York tax stamp on the pack, Tripper. Those cigarettes were stolen from a murdered man six days ago. Murdered man? Shut what? up. What were you doing with those burrows outside? They've been packing. Uh, I was bringing some stuff down. Been prospecting up the feet. Abandoned silver mines up there, Chase. Is your son hiding out one of those mines, Tripper? Were you packing supplies to him? I told you what I was doing. That boy's wanted for murder, and if you're smart, you'll take us to him and tell him to surrender. Do what they say, Paul. Do what they say. Shut up. Leave her alone. I didn't know about the murder. He just said the army was after him. Come on, Kurtz. We better go up after him. Oh, don't hurt him. Go ahead, Ranger. Don't hurt him. Go after him. He'll kill you. That's what he'll do. He'll kill you. go up on foot. It was too treacherous for the horses, and trailing over that rocky ground in the darkness slowed us to the crawling speed of an overfed snake. I got to be less earth and more rock, and the burrow tracks grew fainter, so we tried to pick them up by moonlight and flashlight. They could have gone in any direction from here, Chase. Can't pick up a mark. Seems to level off a bit on that shelf ahead. Might be a narrow trail there. Hope so. Getting steeper. Too steep for burrows. Kurtz. What? Dwarf oak here. Flash your light. There, that's it. Hold it. Anything? Yeah. Branch pen. It's been brushed. Look here, been nibbled a bit, too. Recent. Torn leaves are still fresh. Now well, we're headed right, then. Must have gone straight ahead between those big rocks. Yeah. Yeah, this is it, all right. Look at the side of the rock. Flex the mica peel off. Little fiber stuff. Where are pack ropes? Must have scraped it. Let's keep going. Chase. Yeah, but 20 feet back in. He could pick us off and we'd never even get to see him. Stay down and keep the hole covered. What are you going to do? Just call him out. Tripper! Lanny Tripper! He ain't going to answer, Chase. You can't get out, Tripper! <coughs> Sit down, Chase. 
how he's got a rifle as well as that 38 he killed Bradley with. You gonna come out, Tripper? We'd only pack a stick of dynamite. He'd come out soon enough or be buried in there. Maybe the idea of dynamite would be enough. Go over down the shelf and let him see you just once on the way. Not long enough to draw a bead. Maybe we can bluff him. Why don't you go down and let me... It's my idea. I'll stay. Go ahead. Be careful, Chase. You missed him, Tripper! You're not gonna get another shot! He went down to our furrows to get some dynamite! We're gonna seal you in there, Tripper. You better come out. How do I know you ain't gonna kill me on sight? I won't if you do what I tell you. Leave your rifle in there. Come out with your hands clasped behind your head. Put your rifle up on a rock where I can see it into the field. All right, Tripper. Now come out. slowly, first a blur, then into the light with his hands behind his head. I got up and he walked toward me. He wasn't wearing a gun belt, but there was something in the way he moved that made me keep my hands close to my holsters. Then he made a quick sidestep and his hands came from behind his head and I caught the glint of a 38. I'm all right. Get a man. Gun hand and arm. Put a tourniquet on and we'll take him down. What's the matter with you, Jace? You look kind of funny. Just thinking of his folks down there. His mother and even the old man. Just trying to help him because he belongs to them in spite of everything he's done. Well, folks are like that. We gotta bring him in. He can break their hearts. Yeah. Makes you wonder why he ever wanted to wear a badge. Until you remember the man he killed and the three kids who have to grow up without him. That makes you know you couldn't ever want to do anything but wear a badge. <laughs> There's a tourniquet. That'll hold him. All right, Tripper, on your feet. Let's go. A ballistic check of the 38 that Lenny Tripper carried showed it to be the murder weapon used in the slaying of Roger Bradley. With that and other evidence accumulated by Ranger Pearson and the department, Tripper was convicted and sentenced to death in the electric chair. Well, Joel, you did a fine job of clearing up that case. Frank, I've got a little mystery at home. Maybe you can help me. Well, try to try, Joel. Well, it's the case of the disappearing Wheaties. Every once in a while, when I'm all set for a breakfast bowl of Wheaties, my cook says, sorry, or fresh out. Why, that's no mystery. Wheaties are so good, so crisp, so loaded with natural, sunny, whole wheat flavor, they just don't last long. Yes, I know, but what can I do? Well, you can get up early before anyone else gets at the Wheaties, or buy two or three boxes at a time. I think you hit it, Frank. Many thanks. Good night, and thank you, Joel McRae. Next week, Joel McRae in another authentic reenactment of a case from the files of the Texas Rangers. Joel McRae will soon be seen in the MGM production Stars in My Crown. Tonight's cast included Tony Barrett, Bill Johnstone, Sam Edwards, Paul Duboff, Byron Kane, and Virginia Gray. And this is the Wheaties man, Frank Martin, inviting you to listen on Monday to Frank Lovejoy and Night Beat on the Wheaties Big Parade. See you then. Tomorrow, listen for Dorothy Maynard. Now it's Basin Street on NBC. Wheaties presents Joel McRae in Tales of the Texas Rangers. On stage tonight, transcribed from Hollywood, another in the Wheaties big parade of exciting half-hour presentations. Tales of 
the Texas Rangers, starring Joel McRae as Ranger Pearson. Texas, more than 260,000 square miles. And 50 men who make up the most famous and oldest law enforcement body in North America. of the Texas Rangers come these stories based on fact. Only names, dates, and places are fictitious for obvious reasons. The events themselves are a matter of record. Case for tonight, The Trigger Men. Nine o'clock on the evening of May 27, 1947, Jasper Leach, operator of an independent service station in Haight, Oklahoma, was preparing to shut down for the night. Suddenly, two men in a green convertible pulled into the service island of his station. Close for the night, fellas. Pumps are all locked. We gotta get some gas. Uh, all night place on the highway south, mister. Big station, you're heading that way. I don't like big stations. We're gassing up right here. I got a tire you can fix. Now, look, I told you I'm close to the... Hey, stop the chat, will you? You heard him, Hick. Now get moving. I'll put a slug in you. All right, mister. I ain't arguing with a gun. He gets a pump cord and make him fill a couple extra five-gallon cans. All right, Joe. Stop playing the party and get that flat spare out of you so hot for action. Okay, okay, but let's take it up, man. Well, come on, Hayseed. Get with the pump. He's in the office. Let's get him. And while we're in here, you might as well open the safe. I, I don't know the combination. <laughs> yeah? Oh! Set open it, your hick. All right, mister, I'll open it. But you ain't getting that way with this. Not by a dang sight. That over later. Just you and me, Hick. Just you and me. KDX 8, all units. KDX 8, all units. Oklahoma State Police advised that about 9 p.m. of 527, gas station attendant in 8, Oklahoma was robbed and beaten to death with tire iron. Subjects tentatively identified as number one. Joe Gordon, average size, eyes blue, hair blonde, complexion fair. Number two, Tiny Gordon, six foot three, peculiar walk, pigeon toed. Same coloring as brother. Subjects now believed to be in Texas en route to Mexican border. Wanted six states and FBI for murder, bank robbery, narcotics, other charges. Use caution, these men are dangerous. PDX Ailes. Tales of the Texas Rangers will continue in just a moment. Get up and get at them with Wheaties. Yup, for folks up and doing, for folks going places, breakfast of champions. Sure, begin a better breakfast with Wheaties tomorrow. And see if you don't feel the difference all morning long. Here's why. There's a whole kernel of wheat in every Wheaties flake. You got it? There's a whole kernel of wheat in every Wheaties flake. That's why Wheaties can give so much. Energy, you bet. Whole wheat energy. Vitamins and minerals, you bet. And protein, too. That's why Wheaties at 7 can make a difference at 11. There's energy in them dar flakes. You try them. Tomorrow morning, make yours Wheaties. Pour on the milk, put on the fruit, and eat happy. Yes, and work happy. Tomorrow, see for yourself how Wheaties at 7 can help at 11. Breakfast of champions. Breakfast for you. There were no further signs of the Gordon brothers on the night of May 27th, but on the morning of the 28th, Captain Stinson of the Texas Rangers received a report that looked like a lead and immediately sent for Ranger Jace Pearson. Send for me, Captain. Yeah, Jace. I want you to get right over to the General Hospital in Palo Pinto County. Been a double shooting. Deputy Sheriff and his son. Where did it happen? Near Mineral Wells, but check the hospital first. Shooting took place during the night. 
rancher found them in this morning. Mineral wells. That's on the road south from Ada, Oklahoma. You think it might have been the Gordon brothers? It smells like them. They were headed south, according to all previous reports. I figure they're making their run for the border, and they'll kill anybody who tries to stop them. Sure looks that way. The deputy never saw who gunned him, Jace. If he can talk, get all the information you can. And if it looks like the Gordons, stay with it all the way. We don't want them to get across the border. I understand. Judging by their past movements, they steal cars and dump them for new ones at regular intervals before they get too hot. So don't pin too much in any car descriptions. I won't. I'll see you later. Oh, Jace. Yeah? You get anything hot, report it by phone. If I have anything for you, I'll have the radio dispatcher tell you to call in. The men we're after might have a short wave set. Right, Captain. One thing more, Jace. This department hasn't lost a man in a long time. Let's keep it that way. Yeah. I wouldn't want to be the one to spoil the record. I checked my car out and headed for Palopino County. I reached the hospital at 9.45 a.m. and saw the doctor in charge. He pulled through, I think, but his condition is critical. Shot three times through the back, one of the bullets is lodged in his spine. Which room's he in? I'll show you. Deputy's son hurt bad, too? Too bad, Ranger. Dead on arrival. He know it? You, he know it. It'd be better if you could wait. I wish I could. I can't. I understand. He's in here. The deputy was lying on his stomach. A dazed look on his face like he was remembering something over and over but still couldn't believe it. I knelt on the floor beside him so he could see me while he was telling me what happened. You see, my my boy built himself one of them hot rod cars. On an old chassis and spare parts. You know those. Yeah. That broke down on him last night. Fooled with it and couldn't get it to start. Called up home about midnight. Tell me and his ma who I was out so late. Sure. I drove out in my car to meet him where he called from at the sales bar. The book fooled around with his car some, but wasn't fixing to go at all. Here. I'll sip a little water through this glass straw. <laughs> Better? Yeah. Thank you. Uh, you couldn't get the car started? Uh, yeah. Yes. Yeah, so finally, I told the kid to come on home. We'd get it taken care of today. Mm. Reckon it's not bad enough. What happened on the way home? We passed the cup place. Big place. We raised a silk box. Here. Let me fix that pillow for you. Man. Thank you. Worms feed off the leaves of the mulberry trees. He was passing the grove. I was mulberries, and I spot a fire, a little campfire, like deep in the grove, almost out of sight. I see. And I better stop and look. The kid, he wanted to get out of the car with me. I don't know why I let him, but I had no way of knowing. And of course, you, you couldn't know. We walked in. I guess I heard his coming, one of them kicked at the fire. I, so his shadow. That's all. I yelled at him to stand where there was and started blasting. Go on. I turned, pushed the kid down. Something hit me in the back and out. When I, when I came to, my kid was lying there. Just a couple of feet from him. Fifteen years old. All right. Don't try to talk anymore. Get him on the Please get him. I need my kid. I left the hospital and headed for the Carbeth Ranch outside Mineral Wells. Big Jim Carbeth, the owner of the place, took me into the Mulberry Grove where the deputy and his boy had been gunned. Well, this is the spot. Yeah, it's going to over pretty complete, though. Hmm. Had their fire right over here. Yeah, what are you digging out of them ashes? 
fire wasn't burning on it. Started with a road map and an envelope. In the corner of the envelope, not quite burned, and just make out the stamp. Mm-hmm. It's Mexican. Maybe our lab can make out the postmark. Out of that shard, Hunk? Yeah. I can slide it into this fresh envelope without breaking it up too much. <laughs> you fellas sure can figure a lot from a little, I reckon. Sometimes. When they left, they went through there toward the road. How do you know that? Here's the mark where the fire was kicked. Steps from it moved that way. Might have been the sheriff and his men. Not in low heel eastern boots. See the impressions? Oh. One set, same as yours or mine, except for the difference in boots. Hmm. The other set scuffs in at the toes. The man who made those is pigeon-toed. Well, you sound like you could draw a picture of them. I could now. Let's see where these prints lead. <laughs> Just at the edge of the grove were tire markings where it parked and backed into the mulberries to screen from sight. Yeah, this is good, all right. You can see where it scraped the branches. Did more than scrape them. And the, this one's been torn off. The part that got torn off isn't on the ground. Low branch, too. Well, that means something. And the tire marks and the height of the branch, it means the baggage compartment of the car was open and then closed down on the end of the branch. See, it snapped off when the car moved. <laughs> You sound like that's worth knowing. It might be worth plenty. I wait the patrol turns up an abandoned car with a piece of mulberry branch caught on it. I drove back to headquarters and turned the charred envelope over to the lab. Then I went in and reported to Captain Stinson. Sounds like the Gordon brothers are all right. I'd bet on it. If they're in the habit of ditching their cars, we better check on all the stolen and abandoned. If we find the car, we'll know which way they're headed. I'll send out a bulletin on it. What did Lab say about the envelope? We're in pretty bad, Captain, but they think they can restore it. Take time, though. Well, if they can bring out that Mexican postmark, it might tell us where the Gordons plan to cross the border. That's what I was thinking. If they won't go through a regular border station, it'll be an illegal crossing. And they'll probably have a hideaway arranged on the other side. Yeah, probably other members of the Crawford gang. I figure they'll try to make it before tomorrow morning. They'll be making their big run tonight. Well, head south, Jace, toward the border. We'll relay all information to you as it comes up. I better get charcoal out of the barn and hitch up my horse trailer. Yeah, good idea. Wherever they try to cross, it's a cinch it won't be good territory for a car. Uh, the border stations are covered, though, aren't they, in case they do try a legal crossing? Now, their mugs are hanging in every customs house from Brownsville to El Paso. FBI has given them extra cover, and the Mexican police are helping, too. I uh, better get going then. So long, Captain. So long, Jace. And good luck. I loaded charcoal into the horse trailer and headed south, aiming for the center of the border near Valverde County so I could change my direction fast either way. I kept a lead foot on the gas pedal. Toward sundown, I was just outside El Dorado when the radio dispatcher came through telling me to call headquarters. I got Captain Stinson on long distance. That's all branch is off, please. Abandoned car with a piece of the in the trunk has just been found in Fort Stockton, Pickens County. How long ago? Less than 15 minutes, and the motor was still warm. Highway patrol was throwing up roadblocks at all points south of west. They can't be far out of Stockton. Must be planning to try a border crossing in Presidio or Booster County then. Any report on that burned envelope? You're working on it, James. You better head for Fort Scott. If they do get past our block, they're within 90 miles of the border. I'll do my best, Captain. So long. Well, it's another baseball summer with ball fans all over the country watching their favorites and baseball champions all over the major leagues eating their Wheaties. Yup, and do they eat their Wheaties? The Philadelphia Phillies, Ashburn and Ennis, the Cleveland Indians, Lemon and Boudreaux, Dan Musial of the St. Louis Cards, George Kell of the Detroit Tigers, Dewey Reese of the Dodgers. They're all getting their Wheaties breakfast of champions. And you know, so are a lot of other smart people. Folks who want high-stepping energy to stride through their morning high, wide, and handsome, they're getting Wheaties, too. Are you? Well, listen, you may not play ball for a living, but you can use Wheaties energy. You can use Wheaties vitamins, minerals, and proteins. You can use breakfast of champions, too. 
There's a whole kernel of wheat in every Wheaties plate. A whole golden kernel rolled out flat and full. Yes, there's a whole kernel of wheat in every Wheaties plate. That's why Wheaties can do so much and help send you through the morning on high. That's why Wheaties at 7 can help at 11. You have some Wheaties, the crisp way to get your whole wheat. Tomorrow morning, make yours milk and fruit and Wheaties. Breakfast of champions. See for yourself how Wheaties at 7 can help at 11. I started for the roadblock area in Pecos County, but I never got there. I was still 50 miles away when headquarters radioed me to contact them by phone. I had a feeling the news wasn't going to be good, and it wasn't. Forget about Pecos County, Jace. The Gordons broke through our roadblock. Where? The back road near Hobart. I turned a Tommy gun on the highway patrol and a sheriff's car. Kill anybody? Two. And two more badly wounded. The men were just around when they didn't answer a radio call. It happened two hours ago. And the Gordons could be at the border by now. The wildest part of it, Jace. People have to guess what... Just a second. Here it is, Jace. Lab report on the burnt envelope. Where was it mailed from? Tears. Right across the Rio Grande from the Santiago Mountains. That country's murdered. Worse for them than for us. Rivers swollen by spring rain. They'll need a boat to cross. The county sheriff can beat through the mountains with bosses. Ten miles each side. I'll get as close as I can by car and then charcoal and I'll ride in. The posse will corner them. We'll have them. You are the closest ranger unit, Jace. But those men are dangerous. You want to wait for some help? No time for waiting. Now's the time for getting them. You'll hear from me. In the south of Booster County, the world comes to an end. I drove as far as I could and met one wing of the sheriff's posse where Maravillas Creek runs into the Rio Grande. Any sign of them, Sheriff? Nope. Got men working in from the other side of the mountains, though. I'll get my horse and ride in with your ways. Then we can split and fan out. Good. Mighty fine horse, Ranger. Best. Come on, Charlie. Hey, which of your men knows this section best? Jaime Sanchez, I reckon. I'd like him to ride with me when we split. Oh, he'd be proud to. Sanchez! Hey. You want me for something, Sheriff? Ranger wants you to ride with him. That's good with me. Thanks, Sanchez. You got your signal arranged with the rest of your posse? Three shots. Two seconds between each one. Good. Let's ride. All right, men. Hop up. Well, we'll follow the river, and then you can drop off in pairs and head in toward the peak. The sheriff will pair you off. If you hit ground too rough for your horses, tie them off and move through on foot. All got that? All right. All right, let's move. Come on, get We moved along the river, closing the circle and hoping that Joe and Tiny Gordon were inside of it. The country got rougher and no horse could have taken it without the light of the moon. The posse cared off and thinned out. Finally, the sheriff and his last deputy turned off. Sanchez and I went on alone. We can go Kia, Sanchez. About five miles, senor, and we'll be right across the Rio. We better turn toward the peak, then. We can't go in very far in the horses. Maybe we should leave them right here. Easy to find again. You're probably right. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Oh, oh. Tie him off over here. See? There are some cabins up here in the mountains, but the men we are after wouldn't know about them. What kind of cabins? Old hunters have been from long ago when there was good hunting. But most of the game is gone. Nobody lives in them anymore. No, the Gordons might know about them anyhow. You said they do not know this country. Yeah, they could have been told. Meeting somebody in Mexico. Some of their gang might have come through here before. That's why they picked this spot. They're in such a hurry, though, I don't think they would stop. Mm, you would if the big boy got tired. The big boy? And the tiny Gordon. Pigeon toed. Something wrong with his feet. Big and heavy carrying a lot of weight. It's going to slow down in this country. 
I think you're right, Ranger Pearson. He, he ain't got good feet. He's still got plenty in here. The cabins in the territory we're covering? See, si, two of them. Now, let's take a look. Si, the first one is right up this way to the left, about two miles in. turning further back. I mean the group working in from the other side. No, they came all the way from Hot Springs further than where we start. That's where the sheriff's deputy went to get them. Flash your light around. Now. See. Wait. Wait, turn on that chair. Dust light on. Somebody sitting there not long ago. Scraped spot on the floor. Sat with his legs straight out. The scraping was done by his heels. See, you have a good eye. Stretch my legs. My heels reach those marks? No, not quite so far, but why do you do that? Because I'm six feet tall. The man that sat in that chair is taller. Tiny Gordon is six foot three. Look around and see which way they headed. I think this way, Ranger Pearson. Why? What'd you find? Somebody step on these dead logs, take off a piece of the bark. Yeah. There's prints there, too. You flash your light. See? Here. Two sets. One of them with the toes turned on. You throw the light that way. See? That bush. First one through here held the branch back for the other to pass. Knocked off a few berries. Crushed them on the ground. It's still wet from the goose. We got the direction now. Let's move. We better put that light up. They're headed for the Rio, all right. Should we fire the gun now to signal for the posse? No, we're too close. Gordon's might hear it too. Probably think they're safe in here. They don't know we've got a postmark. Better chance of getting them cold if they don't know. See. You think they're gonna fight if we catch them? With murder charges in a couple of states? They got nothing to lose. They'll fight plenty. They left the cliff all the way. They did the follow even by moonlight. Got fresher as he moved along and saw more and more spots where Tiny Gordon had stopped to rest. And the pace spots where Joe Gordon had moved around restlessly waiting for him. It wasn't long before we could hear the lapping of the Rio Grande as the foothills dipped down for him. And then we heard them moving and talking in the leaves at the edge of the river. How do you know? Hey, you believe in our letter? Back in the last night. Let's try it, Jim. No, we ain't moving on his tank stretches. Who's they don't come? Well, go back to that cabin and bowl up again until tomorrow night. Besides, you didn't see us here. Maybe Nidia or something. Hey, the who's ladder be cramping around? What are you, Daniel Boone or something? I have no one to tell me to try and do it. Come on, it's I figured that right. I'm expecting a pickup from the Mexican side. See, who can get both of them? Oh, those cops are good. Whether we could carry a 45. You try to carry a Tommy gun the way you were flopping around in that, and you kill yourself and me too. I might kill you someday, Joe. Shoot your mouth off. Come on, come on, try it. I'll blow your brain. Why are you? You want to put you in the door, Joe? Uh, well, they got 45s. But so do we. See? Let's move in and take them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Couldn't see him in the leaves, but they couldn't 
see us either. Sanchez reached his position and, and I straightened up. Tiny! Joe! I'm a Texas Ranger! There's a posse of 20 men in the hills. You're surrounded. Will you come out? That won't do you any good. This way, Tiny! Open up, Sanchez! That's a posse signal, Tiny. They'll all be heading this way. You won't be heard of here. Wait, What's the matter, Tiny? Your gun empty? Why is it, Chapman? Hey, how'd you fellas ever kill anybody? You don't even come close. Where are you, you hick? I'll kill all of you, you sick and hick. I'm over here, thank God. Oh, yeah? The rest of the posse will be here soon. It'll be daylight. We'll starve you out or burn you out. You're hogtied. You better give up while you can. I ain't giving up. I'll take all of your heads with me. Come on, Joe. Wait, 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 All right, Sanchez. You better stay off. Guess this job is almost finished. Almost finished? They look like they finished good. Yeah, I mean, the rest of the Crawford gang from across the river. And a nice surprise for them if they come over in their boat. Thought they'll be here soon and we'll be able to take them by surprise. Easier than this, too, senor. You know, I don't think they like it very much. I saw what they did to a deputy sheriff and his kid. I didn't like the Gordon brothers very much either. Two hours later, other members of the Crawford gang were surprised and captured without resistance when they crossed the Rio Grande to keep their rendezvous with the Gordon brothers. They were turned over to federal authorities to stand trial for their crimes. Well, partner, whether you're riding the Texas prairie or smelting steel in Pittsburgh, first you need your Wheaties. Yep, breakfast of champions for folks with big things to do. It's a brighter morning and a better job when you begin a good breakfast with Wheaties. Here's why. There's a whole kernel of wheat in every Wheaties plate. Yes, there's a whole kernel of wheat in every Wheaties plate. That's why Wheaties can give so much. Whole wheat vitamins and minerals, protein too. Whole wheat energy to help you stride through the morning high, wide, and handsome. Yes, there's a whole kernel of wheat in every Wheaties plate. That's how Wheaties at 7 can help at 11. You try it. Golden plate, crisp plate, Wheaties plate. Have some tomorrow with milk and fruit. And see yourself how Wheaties at 7 can help at 11. Next week, Joel McRae in another authentic reenactment of a case from the files of the Texas Rangers. Joel McRae will soon be seen starring in the Universal International Technicolor production, Saddle Print. Tonight's cast included Tony Barrett, Tom McKee, Tom Holland, Jack Crucian, Byron Kane, and Jay Novello. This story was transcribed and adapted by Joel Murcott, and the program was produced and directed by Stacy Keach. This is Hal Gibney speaking. And this is the Wheaties man, Frank Martin, inviting you to listen Tuesday night to the Benny Singleton Show on the Wheaties Big Parade. See you then. Bampton sings with the Summer Symphony on... It's National Wheaties Week! Yes, it's National Wheaties Week.
and Wheaties present Joel McRae in Tales of the Texas Rangers. On stage tonight, transcribed from Hollywood, another in the Wheaties' big parade of exciting half-hour presentations. the Texas Rangers, starring Joel McRae as Ranger Pearson. Texas, more than 260,000 square miles. And 50 men who make up the oldest and most famous law enforcement body in North America. Come these stories based on facts. Only names, dates, and places are fictitious for obvious reasons. The events themselves are a matter of record. Case for tonight, Quicksilver. on the night of May 22, 1947, the Stockholm Ranch, located in the middle of Carson County, Texas, was darkened for night. And the occupants were awakened by the barking of a dog. Jim? Jim, wake up. Hmm? Uh, what's the matter, Flo? You hear Jeep bark? Well, kind of. Half asleep. It's funny. He barked and then shut up real fast. He might have took off after no, something. He kept on barking then. It sounded like uh, he was... Be quiet a second. See? Don't hear him anymore. Yeah. What are you going to do? Go take a look and see. It ain't like Jeep to bark at nothing and then shut up. Jeep, Jeep. Hmm? What's the matter? Uh, Jeep, somebody came to the house. Oh, you probably just heard the kid tossing in his sleep. No, I... I get a funny feeling. All right, I'll put on a light and have a look. Now, come on. I want to go and see if anything... It's National Wheaties Week. Time to buy Wheaties, eat Wheaties, buy more Wheaties, eat more Wheaties. Time to join America in a brighter morning. Sure, it's National Wheaties Week. Everybody's eating you have some, too. Have them for fun. Have them for flavor. Have them for feeling good and working good and looking good. Have Wheaties for any reason at all, but get them. Whole wheat. Crisp whole wheat. Golden whole wheat. There's a whole kernel of wheat in every Wheaties plate. You try them. See how Wheaties at 7 can help at 11. It's National Wheaties Week. <laughs> May 29, 1947, the bodies of Jim and Flo Stockholm and their 10-year-old son Carl were discovered by a playmate of Carl's. Sheriff Lockins notified the Texas Rangers, and Ranger Jace Pearson was assigned to the case. The place is just like it was, Jace, except one for the bodies. Kind of a mess, isn't it, Sheriff? Yeah. And all three of them in their night clothes, you said. Yeah, yeah. This here is Jim and Flo's bedroom. I see. Dead clothes must up. Whoever did the killing woke him up. Likely the dog woke him. Oh, yeah. Jeep, you said. Found him dead a piece from the house. Clubbed over the head. Uh-huh. Okay, let's say Flo and Jim Stockholm were awakened by the dog. Jim would get up to see what was the matter. Flo went with him probably to see if the kid Carl was okay. He didn't get no further than the, in this room here, right outside the bedroom. Yeah, all no, three of them. Funny Jim Stockton didn't have a gun. Yeah, if he thought somebody was in a house or prowling around outside, he'd have grabbed his gun. Unless something stopped him. What are you thinking about, Chase? Just that the killer might have got in Carl's room. That's right over here. Uh-huh. Maybe Carl spotted the killer, hollered, and that'd make both Jim and Flo jump fast. Yeah. Jim wouldn't think of grabbing his gun. This window here is jimmied up. You see that? Yeah. I guess you're right. Killer coming this way. Kids saw him. Yelled. Tried to get out. Got as far as the room out here. Yeah. There's what they were killed with, Jason. Flat iron. No 
old-fashioned planner. Yeah, used as a doorstop. Till it grabbed it and used it. Wonder why he didn't shoot. How far away is the next ranch, Sheriff? Six miles at least. Why? I'm just figuring maybe the killer didn't want to risk the noise of shots. Must have picked up the flat iron. Why, he killed a little kid, too. Mm, didn't want anybody to be able to identify him. Yeah, likely. Well, what now, Jace? I'd like to find comb this house for fingerprints. Meantime, I got a few things I'd like you to find out in town. <laughs> anywhere, except those we knew were the murdered people. The motive for the crime was robbery. Jim Stockholm kept fairly large sums of money on hand to pay cash for whatever he bought. We didn't find a penny in the house. The whole thing looked hopeless, like the sheriff said when he came back to the Stockholm ranch. Yeah, the coroner can't give us much, Jase. Ain't no way of telling how long they've been dead. If we could find out what day the murders were committed, we'd have something. Not much, but something. Yeah, but how? How are you going to find that out? Nobody saw the Stockholms before they were killed? For sure. Jim went into town on the 22nd week ago. Out here, if nobody sees his neighbor for a week, ain't nothing thought about it. So, murders could have been committed any time between the 22nd and the day the bodies were discovered. That's the way it sizes up, Jase. Killer's got at least a week to make tracks for... Well, Texas is big. Mm -hmm. And Sheriff, that fence there, mm -hmm. near the corral... Well, that's a hog, and it's... Hey, the hogs are gone. Yeah, busted through. Come on. I never noticed it before. I never thought about looking for the hogs. Who would? Look here, Sheriff, where the fence is busted through. Look at these. Yeah. Hog bristles. Lots of them. Caught on the broken part of the rail. Hogs broke out and pushed through here. Yeah, but look at here, Jase. What's it got to do with what we're after? What made these hogs go wild and break out? It's my guess they got awful hungry. Sure. They went looking for something to eat. Come on. We're going to the barn and take a look at the hog feed. Then we're going into town. We found three sacks of hog feed in the barn. Two of them were full, unopened. The third had just about enough mash taken out for one feeding. Sheriff Larkins and I went into town then. The sheriff asked a few questions I wanted answered, and I checked at the feed store. Sure, Jim Stockholm bought all his feed in here, Ranger. You remember when he was in last, man? I bet I do. It's the last time anybody saw him. The 22nd? That's it. What did he buy? Mm, three sacks of hog mash. Got all the information you wanted, Jason. Thanks, Sheriff. Now, ma'am, is there anything else you can remember about that day? Stockholm seemed troubled or anything? No, just stopped in for a minute. All he said was he had to get back with the mash. He was all out. Are you sure of that? As sure as I'm standing here. And you're sure it was the 22nd? I can make it real sure, Ranger. Got all my sales in this book. Let's see. Here. Here it is. 22nd. Three sacks of hog mash to Jim Stockholm. Thank you, ma'am. Let's go, Sheriff. Sure welcome, Ranger. You helped a lot. What have you got, Jase? The Stockholms were killed on the 22nd. How do you know? Jim Stockholm bought these three sacks of feed on the 22nd. He said he was all out at the ranch. He had to get home and feed the hogs. We found two of the bags unopened. Yeah. And the third with only about enough mash out of it to give the hogs one meal. Which means he fed the hogs on the 22nd, but he didn't the next day or the next. Because he was dead. That's it. Now we've got a lot of checking to do, and it's all going to hinge around the 22nd. <laughs> questioned everybody, but it all added up to a big round zero. Everybody knew Jim Stockholm and liked him. He didn't have an enemy. Everyone we questioned could account for his time on the 22nd. Nobody'd seen a stranger in town. So I played a hunch. Sheriff Larkins and I rode over to the Stockholm ranch trying to pick up anything. Then about eight miles north of the ranch, we got a break. Hey, Jay! Hey, hey. Yeah, Sheriff. Hey, hey. 
What do you got, Sheriff? I don't know. Looks like ashes. Empty bean can there, too. Mm -hmm. Looks like somebody cooked himself a meal here. Horses' tracks around here, too. One horse. Yeah. Like they might be about a week old. Might not mean a thing, Chase. Could be anybody's horse. Sure could, but nobody in town saw a stranger. A little town like that, people notice a stranger right away. But if a man came riding from this direction, chances are nobody'd see him. Still could be anybody. I know. Now I'm gonna take a real close look. Okay, I'll cover this part. Good. Sheriff, come here. Get something? I think so. Look. Tied his horse to this mesquite. See? The horse stood here. He's a mesquite broken off. Now, here's something else. Take a look. Dirt. Just ordinary earth. Take a good look. Ooh, different from the earth around here. It sure is. Different color and different texture. Sheriff, I got a hunch this dirt scraped off a boot when he got back in the sand. Scraped off by a stirrup. Yeah, here's a bigger hunk of it. Yeah, reddish color. You ever see dirt like this around here? No. Well, the hunk's got a funny shade. Back in against the instep of a boot, it would take this shape. You had any rain around here lately? The flies are full. Only one way earth packs up in an instep if it's wet. The man who left this couldn't have come far. Come on. Let's see if we can find a couple of his footprints. <laughs> picked up a few prints. I took their measurements. Then we went back into town. I asked some more questions. Meantime, I sent the earth samples to the lab for analysis. And by the time I got back to my headquarters, Captain Stinson had the report. Looks like this earth came from southwest Wheeler County, Jace. At least the lab thinks so. Wheeler County southwest, well, kind of fits, Captain. Fits what? That part of Wheeler County is not far from the Stockholm Range. No, it isn't. Just about as far as it would take wet earth to dry out and get hard enough to scrape off a man's boot. Yeah, I see. What else you got? Uh, a few horse hairs I picked off from the skeet bush. Looks like the fellow was riding a sorrow. And something else. Plastic cast of his boot prints. Mm-hmm. It's a pretty big boot. Big man. Maybe six, two, or three. You're right. But there are no fingerprints. There's no real evidence. This fellow whose boot prints you got, he might have been anybody. Might never have gone near the Stockholm ranch. Yeah, I know that, Captain. You didn't pick up any of his boot prints around the house, did you? No, the place was pretty messed up. A lot of people got there before I did. Yeah, that's one break a criminal always gets. If only people would stay away. If only they'd have enough sense to realize. Sure, but they don't. They don't mean any harm, though. Okay, what's next? Look for a man six feet two or three riding a sorrel? I'd like to, Captain. Starting where? Well, Texas, I guess. It's National Wheaties Week. Yup, 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 and in celebration of National Wheaties Week, when everybody eats Wheaties, even trombone players, here's that well-known radio musician, Abe Lincoln. Honest, his name really is Abe Lincoln. And here he is, stepping out from behind the scenes to say, Get your Wheaties. Oh, come on, Abe. You didn't come out from your trombone to say just that. No, but that's the idea. Folks, the Wheaties Big Parade has been bringing you some pretty solid entertainment this summer. I can say it because I've worked along with all the other fellas helping put this entertainment on the air. And now it's National Wheaties Week. And we hope that every one of you who's enjoyed these programs will go out and get your Wheaties. The backstage folks like me, the people whose voices you usually never hear, we'd sure like it if we thought you'd enjoy our programs enough to go out and get some Wheaties. If you like the Texas Rangers, buy a box of Wheaties on Monday, will you? Thanks and good night, Abe. Remember, it's National Wheaties Week. <laughs> I kicked around for a few days, covering all the ground I could between the Stockholm Ranch and Wheeler County, and then I reported back to Captain Stinson. Kind of picked up something interesting, Captain. Like what, Jace? Weather reports. Here's a map 
of Wheeler County. The places I've marked in red had rain within the last three weeks. Oh? Well, what about it? Well, this place. Right here. The only spot of the marked places that will show the same kind of earth we had analyzed. I checked. Mm-hmm. So it's narrowed down to there. But you can't arrest a man just because he happened to be in a place where it rained. I know I'm working on a shoestring, but there's no other lead, nothing. Might be I'll hit a stone wall or pick up some folk who just happened to pass through the spot where we found the Prince of Earth, but it's a chance, Cap, the only one. Well, suppose you chase down that lead in Wheeler County and your man's gone. I don't expect to find him there. He left there and landed at Stockholm Ranch, maybe. And left no fingerprints. There's not a single piece of evidence. It's still the only lead. You want to stick to Wheeler County, huh? That's about it, Captain. Maybe pick up a description of a possible suspect. Well, where are you stop? Well, here's what I think. The man we're looking for is a drift. Maybe a poke that picks up work here and there where he can get it. The fact that he ate a can of beans and cooked it himself means he didn't have a nickel to buy a decent meal, even though he was near a town. That kind's usually a drifter. He made a buck here and a nickel there, and you see what I mean? All right, Jace. Play the hunt. But if the lead peters out... I'm hoping it won't. See you later. Are you keeping touch? Yeah. Radio or phone. So long. <laughs> Southwest. I checked one ranch after another, some big, some small. What I wanted to know was, had anyone seen a man about six, two, or three, a man who owned a sorrow and didn't have steady work? <laughs> I once read where a man found a needle in a haystack, did it on a bet. <laughs> well, my needle could be in any haystack. Then on the Claude Edwards ranch near Ramstow, I ran into something. Sure, I remember a folk buck like that, Ranger. Big had himself a sorrow. Did he work for you, Mr. Edwards? A couple of days. Drifted in looking for something to do. I don't usually have work for more than my own hand, but this fella come in just about when I needed somebody else. And... What was his name? Or or Yeah, that was it. Or Now, when was he here? Oh, let me see now. That'd be around the 19th, wasn't it? And when did he leave? Do something, Ranger? I don't know, Mr. Edwards, but I'd sure like to hear everything you know about him. Well, uh, he worked for a couple of days, then come in asking for his pay. That was uh, maybe the 22nd. Are you sure? What are you darn sure? It's awful important. All right, I'm sure. He had a spell of rain about him. I had him mend the roof. He didn't like it, none. Did he say where he was going, anything at all? Didn't say, and I didn't ask. Just handed him his pay. Saw him in town later, dropping him in a card game. Then he lit out. All right. Now I want the best description of him you can possibly give me. Everything you can remember. What he looked like, how he talked, acted. I'll try, Ranger. But how are you going about finding him? By now, he might be clear in New Mexico. Anyway. I'm going to do my best, Mr. Edwards. And I'm not sure that's going to be enough. <laughs> Lip, not too easy to get along with. Black mustache. <laughs> Funny how little that people notice things unless it's something they really want to see. What description we had was sent out. Fifty false leads came through. A hundred. But every once in a while, one came through that matched something else. Captain Stinson and I talked it over. Well, maybe it is something, Jace. Look. A mm. hundred different leads, but there's one that shows up every so often. This one. Same description. Drifter, gambles a lot, had a dozen different jobs. There was something else, Chase. Now look at the pattern here. Yeah, I am. This one keeps moving southwest, always away. The others jump around. The last report came from San Carlo two days ago. Mm hmm. I can mosey into San Carlo and see if I can pick up anything from there. I figure this always moving slow. He's counting on being safe by now. Well, what if you find him? There's still not much evidence. We'd have to get a confession out of him. Nothing we've got will stick in a court. I got an idea about that. Let me try it, Cap. In San Carlo, I picked up a few more scraps about Orville. From what I'd learned, I tried to think like the man I was trailing. 
tried to figure out his next move. He gambled a lot, so every town I hit, I asked questions, went to ranches, and asked about poker games and crap games. Orwell was like Quicksilver. Yeah, he was here, left. Uh-huh, he was there, left after picking up a few dollars. But the pattern stayed the same, always moving southwest. Then on the McMillan Ranch near the New Mexico border... Orwell? Uh, you say Orwell, Randy? That's the name. He's riding a sorrel horse. Well, I don't like to say for sure, but I took on a fella name of Orwell, and he did come in riding a sorrel. As soon as he hit the bunkhouse, he'd try to shake up the poker game. Where is he now? Well, I sent him out this morning to ride fence. The stock was getting through. How long ago did he leave? Oh, three or four hours. Maybe a little more. Tell me something else. Sure. Uh, did he have any money when he left this morning? Funny you ask about that, Rain. Matter of fact, he touched me for a five against any pay he had coming. Yeah. Uh, ought to be coming back soon now. Huh? Almost time to check. He touched you for five. He won't be back for a child. I'm going after him. I followed the fence rider's trail. It was well into the afternoon when I spotted a rider up ahead. I took off my badge and stuck it in my pocket, put my guns in my waistband under my jacket, and caught up with him. Who are you? Name is Pearson. You're Orwell, huh? Yeah, why? Boss sent me out to look for you. Boss? Oh, oh. Yeah, foreman back at Mellet's Ranch. Boss, sir. We've got to get back to the north fence. Who wasn't working there when I left? <laughs> Just got took on. I guess we'd better get back to the north fence. Boss says it's important. That's so. Say, come to think of it, you're, you're not even on the ranch anymore. I hit the boundary fence a piece back. All right, I got news for you, mister. I ain't riding the fence. Now you take off. You see about that north fence. Huh? You mean you're quitting? Right the first time, mister. Now, so long. Hey. Hey, hold it a minute. You're downright unsociable. Hold on, hold on. You're downright nosy. Me? <laughs> I didn't mean to be. I tell you, mind if I ride a piece with you? Yeah, I do. Oh, I kind of like company. I thought you was just took on at the Mellet's place. Seems to me you're riding wrong, mister. No, oh, I got no hankering for work either. Not with 500 in my jeans. 500? A poke like you with 500? <laughs> you got lucky in a crap game night for last. Then why'd you take the job? Oh, a man can always use a couple more bucks. Well, I guess I'll be riding on. Hey, hey, wait. Huh? Okay. <laughs> I kind of like company myself. You want to ride a piece with me? It's okay. We rode on the rest of the day, and I found out Orwell was planning to head into Mexico. We bedded down early. And along toward midnight, when Orwell thought I was asleep, he raised up and moved toward me. Saddlebag, Orwell? I thought you were asleep. No. Don't reach for it, Orwell. I'll blow your head off. What? What are you getting this uh, head up about? The man starts to go through my saddlebags when I'm sleeping. I get touchy. I'm just like a cigarette. No need for that gun. Yeah? Sure. I wasn't looking for 500, were you? You call me a crook? You name it, Orwell. <laughs> You, you are touchy. Oh, okay, okay. Put that gun away, Pierce. Don't act like a kid. I tell you, I was just looking for cigarettes. Sure. Yes, I did maybe bust the strap. Okay, bring that saddlebag. Cigarettes are in it. Yeah, sure. Uh, left or right one? Right. There you go. <laughs> you open it this time. Hey, what's got in there? 
Mm, stuff. Okay. The cigarettes are wrapped up in that piece of blanket. Help yourself. Thanks. Hey, cigarettes in here? Feels like a ton of iron. Could be. Wait! Anything wrong, Oliver? It's flat iron. Uh-huh. What do you think we carried around? Why? I knew a man once carried around a cow skull tied to his saddle. Why are you carrying this? No. Why are you asking? Who? Who are you? I told you. Name's Pearson. Jace Pearson. Cigarettes are there. Help yourself. I don't want any. Suit yourself. Mind handing me that flat iron oil? Why? I just want it. Go on. Go on, hand it. No. Hey. Hey, you're looking real pale, Oliver. You're not scared of coyotes, are you? Shut up. There makes a good nutcracker. Maybe I carry it for them. Shut up, I said. Hand me the flat iron. Pick it up. It's not so heavy. It's heavy enough. Man could pick it up like this, lift it up over his head, and bring it down. Why not? Why are you? No. Hold it. Stand still. Go run. Hold it, Oliver. I'm warning you. Hold it. son Carl. On July 15, 1947, Orwell was convicted. His sentence, death in the electric chair. Joel McRae, your Texas Ranger, has asked me to ask you to have some Wheaties. Yes, have some Wheaties because it's National Wheaties Week. The week when everybody goes out and buys a box and enjoys a dish of America's famous whole wheat flakes. Start early in National Wheaties Week so you'll have time to buy them and eat them and buy some more and eat some more. Wheaties, that is. And while you're enjoying them, partner, you're getting wide awake energy, whole wheat energy. There's a whole kernel of wheat in every Wheaties flake. Begin a better breakfast with Wheaties and see if you don't find yourself striding high, wide, and handsome right through the morning. Rangers can ride better, salesmen can sell better, plumbers can plumb better with a better breakfast. Milk and fruit and wheat. Get your breakfast of champions. It's National Wheaties Week. Next week, Joel McRae in another authentic reenactment of a case from the files of the Texas Rangers. Joel McRae will soon be seen starring in the MGM production Stars in My Crown. Tonight's cast included Tony Barrett, D.J. Thompson, Byron Kane, Lou Krugman, and Russell Simpson. This story was transcribed and adapted by Russell Hughes, and the program was produced and directed by Stacey Keith. Hal Gibney speaking. And this is the Wheaties man, Frank Martin, inviting you to listen on Tuesday night to the Penny Singleton Show on the Wheaties Big Parade. See you then. Remember, it's National Wheaties Week. Come on, everybody, to the Wheaties party. Eat a lot of Wheaties like the champions do. Dance together, cheek to cheek. This is National Wheaties Week. Eat a lot of Wheaties like the champions do. Wheaties, a breakfast of champions. Tomorrow, Sigmund Romberg conducts the Summer Symphony on NBC. <laughs> Wheaties presents Joel McRae in Tales of the Texas Rangers. On stage tonight, transcribed from Hollywood, another in the Wheaties big parade of exciting half-hour presentations. Tales of the Texas Rangers, starring Joel McRae as Ranger Pearson. 
Texas more than 260,000 square miles. And 50 men who make up the most famous and oldest law enforcement body in North America. of the Texas Rangers come these stories based on fact. Only names, dates, and places are fictitious for obvious reasons. The events themselves are a matter of record. Tonight's case, The Broken Spur. Saturday night, June 5th, 1948. Time, 10 p.m. On a small ranch 10 miles south of Cranston, Irwin County, Texas, Milton Thomas was counting a large sum of money, preparatory to locking it up for the night. As he was counting, his dog Rags appeared to be nervous. Thomas tried to quiet him. Rags, stop that. You're making me count wrong. Where did Sam kill the president? Now stop it. Quiet, Rags. Stop. Who's there? Yes. What do you want, Casey? Oh, seems to me it's awfully nice to be knocking at people's doors. Not if it's about that long. That's that. Well, what are you trying to do? Get your dog back, girl. Get back or you get the same thing. Get away from that dog. Give me that money. No, no, I won't. Oh, you asked for it. <laughs> of the Texas Rangers will continue in just a moment. If you've got a job to do tomorrow, partner, get your Wheaties. Sure, a breakfast of champions is for you. Just like it's for Ralph Kiner, pride of the Pittsburgh Pirates. You may not play ball for a living, but whatever your job is tomorrow, you can do it better on a better breakfast. And it's a better breakfast you're starting with Wheaties. There's a whole kernel of wheat in every Wheaties flake. Yes, whole wheat. Good, sound, whole wheat. Pump and ripe and bursting with vitamins and minerals and protein for your vitality, your energy, your working power. So tumble the Wheaties out of the package, pour on the milk, put on the fruit, pick up the spoon, and smile. You're eating good to be feeling good. Breakfast of champions for people who are going places. Are you ready? Try them. See how Wheaties at 7 can help at 11. At 10.30 the same night, Milton Thomas's house was discovered on fire. The Cranston Fire Department was called. Next morning, the local sheriff, making a routine investigation, discovered the burnt remains of a broken chair next to Thomas's body. He ordered an autopsy. The results prompted him to call the Texas Rangers. Ranger Chase Pearson was assigned to the case and arrived at the scene of the fire early that afternoon. Well, howdy, Ranger. I'm Sheriff Tex. Howdy. My name's Chase Pearson. Come on, I'll show you the house. Or what's left of it. All right, folks, step back, please. Shouldn't have all these people walking around here, Sheriff, ruin any footprints there might be. I had my deputy here just a few minutes ago, Pearson. I sent him down to get some coffee. Mm -hmm. All right, folks, step back away from the house, all of you. Now get back to the fence, please. All burned out except for the wall, but you may find something. You said when you called you didn't think it was an accident. I've been sheriff here for 18 years, and I'll stake my reputation it wasn't. It was arson to cover murder. Based that on the autopsy? Yep. The coroner couldn't find any trace of the carbon granules in the bronchial patches or lungs, and only the normal amount of carbon monoxide in the lungs. Indicate Milk Thomas wasn't breathing when the fire started. Right. This was the front door. It burned off the hinges and fell out. That's funny. What? A lock on this door. A special kind. It takes a key on both sides. When the door is shut, you have to have a key to get out of the house as well as in. Oh, that, yeah. Milk was a funny old glue. 
Have them put on both doors. The windows had pick locks, too. Why? Well, folks, they kept a lot of money in the house. Maybe just a story. This lock's still working. Let's look at the back door. Oh, here's what's left of Mill's old iron safe. Open like that when you found it? Yep. Empty, too. This lock's not forced or broken. Kind of hard to tell much about anything after the roof fell in. Yeah, it's a mess, all right. Same kind of lock here on the back door. Working, too. Meaning whoever started the fire was locked in? Well, look here. Whoever it was, here's where he went out. See that window glass outside on the ground? Climb out and look. See? The heat didn't break it. It's not crazed. It was knocked out from inside. And do you think the killer was trapped inside? Could have been, after he set fire to the place. How about footprints, Sheriff? Oh, there's thousands of them. Volunteer firemen prance around all during the fire. Wait. Wait, here's something. Hmm. Looks like a spur round. That's exactly what it is. Broken off a spur. Right below where the window was. Maybe busted off by a man jumping out the window with his tail feathers on fire? Maybe. I don't envy an unpiercing. How come? Well, as a clue, the spur round probably mighty important. But... But what, Sheriff? I was just thinking. There probably ain't over 10 million spurs in the state of Texas with rowels just like the one you got there in your hand. <laughs> well, your figure may be a little high, Sheriff, but I get your point. <laughs> hey, Jack. Hey. Yeah, what do you think you're doing, Jack? Well, what's the matter, Sheriff? You know darn well what's the matter. I told you to keep back. I was just looking around. Well, stop kicking around those ashes. And the rest of you. That's evidence you're tramping on. We didn't mean no harm. Now listen, all of you. It's the last time I'm going to tell you. How'd you like it if we thought one of you was the criminal coming back to the scene of the crime and deliberately trying to destroy evidence? Oh. Okay, then. Get back or get off the property altogether. Now, books say that's generally not true, Sheriff. Huh? About the criminal in the scene of the crime. It happens only once in a thousand times. Oh, I know it. I just want to throw a scare into him. Let's see. Oh, by the way, who was that fellow you were talking to? Him? His name's Casey. Jack Casey. The sheriff and I went over the yard thoroughly, but any footprints the murderer might have left were trampled out by the firemen and the onlookers. Finally, some distance from the house, I found the place I was looking for. Sheriff? Huh? Come over here. What is it? Look, here's where he took off from. Footprint. Dug out in an awful hurry, too. And his horse tethered to this tree. Seems to me any man who had legitimate business at the house would have tied up closer. Yeah, yes, I'm too. Look here. Horse chewed on the tree. This might be a cribber. If we find our man, we'll likely find a horse that chews on his feet then. See, these tracks head west. Toward Snake Creek. You got a horse, Sheriff? I can get one. Good. I'll get mine out of the trailer. We're going to follow those footprints. Hold it, Sheriff. Keep your horse off that bank. Why? Why? What's the matter? Good fresh ones. Oh, I thought for a minute you'd seen a moccasin. This stream's full of cotton, huh? I'll take my kit and make some plaster molds of these prints. And he dismounted here and led his horse across. Yeah, probably afraid of slipping on those flat, mossy rocks. Mm. Small foot, about size seven or eight, I'd say. Odd track pattern, too. Not likely he was toting a heavy load. Probably a fat man. Fat? Yeah, look at his tracks. Deep. Even in the dry places. I make tracks as deep as those, way over 200, but I ain't exactly fat. No, you're not fat, Sheriff. But what size boot do you wear? Eleven and a half? Do you ever see a man your height make a footprint this small? Hmm. Come to think of it, I don't suppose they ever did. Oh, wait a minute. That man who was poking around the ashes back at the house. Casey, was it? Yeah, Jack Casey. 
What about him? He's fast. Sheriff, was he driving a car or riding? In case he was riding his old paint mare. Say, she's a quiver. Then I'm going to need a warrant. As soon as I get this mold, I'm heading for town. Sheriff, either the books are wrong, or this Casey is one in a thousand. Operator. Operator, this is Jack Casey again. What about that call I've been trying to get through for the last hour and a half? Yeah, Moni Tex, the Delta Sawmill Company. I know it's Sunday, but somebody's bound to. Oh, Jack! What are you doing with that gun? Oh, it's you. Operator. Hello, operator. Now, you said you'd call me back every 20 minutes. It was over a half hour last time. Well, keep trying. Jack, who are you trying to call? Uh, what are you doing with your shotgun? Leave me alone, Martha. Where you been since noon? You were supposed to meet me at the Tate's for dinner. I know it, I know it. Who's that? Who is it? Texas Ranger. Whoa. Jack, what have you done? Put that gun away. Get in the back room. You ain't fixing to shoot him, are you? If I have to. Oh, Jack, don't do it. Please, uh, Jack, don't be... Oh. Hold it, Ranger. Stay where you are. Put that gun down. You're not coming here. I got a warrant here says I can. And I am. Jack, put it down. Let right go that barrel. Oh, no. Give me that. Oh. Oh. Are you all right, ma'am? Yeah. Yeah, I'm all right. That kind of a nasty thing to carry around the cock. I'll just oh. take this. I want to look around a little. Yeah. That's your bedroom? Yeah. Come on. Outside yours? Yes, it is. Are these your boots? Mm-hmm. How'd you break this spur? Huh? Didn't know it was broken. I'll take these boots along. You want me to get it, Chen? No. Is somebody gonna answer it? Yeah, sure. Never mind, Casey. You better come along with me, Casey. What's this all about, Ranger? Where are you taking Jack? He thinks somebody killed Milk Thomas. Big Zack, he thinks I did. No. You seem to know some of the answers. Some of them. Before we go, Ranger, I'd like to ask you one question. Sure. What time did this so-called murder take place? About 10 o'clock last night. 10 o'clock? What well, that's... I'll handle this now. Suppose I can prove her was last night. I'm just as anxious to prove a man innocent as guilty cases. Do you have any witnesses? About 300 of them. At 10 o'clock last night, I was sitting in the Cranston High School Auditorium watching my niece graduate. In just a moment, we continue with Tales of the Texas Ranger, starring Joel McRae as Ranger Jace Pearson. If a man rides herd on a hundred head of cattle all day, first he needs his weedy. Yes, if a man sits behind a big desk and pushes buttons on his job, first he needs his weedy. And listen, Mama, you too. If you keep track of a couple of growing up kids and wash dishes and make beds on your job, first you need your weedy. Jump whatever your job, wherever you work. Weedies can help. Whether you run a machine or pound a typewriter or play baseball for a living, first you need your Wheaties. Because here is whole wheat with the rich, full-bodied energy of whole wheat. There's a whole kernel of wheat in every Wheaties plate. That's why Wheaties give so much. Vitamins, minerals, protein. Wheaties have them, and they're for you. Pour the Wheaties into the cereal bowl, add the milk, add the fruit, and dig right in. Do that at 7. See how much better you're working when 11 a.m. rolls around. Yes, try them every morning, crisp and tempted. See if I'm not right. See if a better breakfast with the whole wheat nourishment of Wheaties doesn't make a pleasant difference in your morning's work. See if milk, fruit, Wheaties isn't honest and truly breakfast of champions. 
See yourself how Wheaties at 7 can help at 11. Casey stuck to the alibi that he'd been at the graduation the night before, and I already had enough evidence to take him in. While the sheriff was out asking questions around town, I tried to break down Casey's story. I tell you, I was there. All right, take it easy, Casey. Let's assume for a minute you were. And how do you count for the boot prints made by your boots and found near the scene of the crime? Lots of people wear boots. Could have been anybody. I'm afraid not. You see, I made plaster casts of those prints, and the boots, the ones you admitted were yours, matched the prints to the last nail mark. I... Well, I've tramped around this part of the country a lot of times. They could have been old prints. Uh-uh. These were fresh prints. Well, what about them? I don't know. All right, then. What about the row we found just outside Thomas' house? One broken off your spur. I don't know anything about that either. There's no point in withholding information, Casey. You know we'll find out about it sooner or later. Well, how are you doing, Pearson? Casey decided to come clean? Aren't you? What about the niece, Sheriff? The neighbors say she and her family left on a vacation early this morning. You know anything about that, Casey? No. Too bad. Because I've had several interesting chats. Casey, I've just talked to four people who were at the graduation exercises last night. Four people who know you. And not one of them remembers seeing you there. I was at the high school last night, I tell you. Casey, the sheriff's talked to four people who didn't see you. Well, who did? I don't know. The dark in the auditorium. Didn't you speak to anybody? No. I think it already started. Oh, wait a minute. Yeah. I talked to one of the ushers. What was his name? Wasn't it him, it was a her. One of the high school girls. Wearing a long pink dress. Uh, Sheriff, who's the principal of the high school? Mr. Shot. Warren Shot. All right, lock Casey up. I'm going to find out who the ushers were, and especially the little girl with a long pink dress. Why, why, yes, sir. I, I remember Mr. Casey being there with Mrs. Casey. Are you sure, Ella May? This is very important. Well, sure, I'm sure. They came in late and had to wait until the invocation was over. And then he asked for an I'll see. He said he couldn't climb over people. He so... <laughs> well, you know. Yeah, I know. And he didn't leave at any time during the exercises. Mm, not until near the end. They left just before the recessional while everybody was standing and singing the class song. What time was that? Oh, a few minutes before 11. All right. Thank you very much. Bye. Was I any help, Ranger? Yes, Eleanor. You were a big... I was stuck. It looked like I was going to have to release Casey. Then I remembered something. The phone call that came in while I was out at Casey's place. The one he'd been reluctant to answer. I dropped by the Cranston telephone office. This is the call you wanted, Ranger. What was it? Mr. Jack Casey placed a call to the Delta Sawmill Company in Moni, Texas at 2.22 p.m. today. There was no answer, and when the Moni operator did get through, she called back at 3.40. But Mr. Casey had canceled it. Do you know who the call was for? Oh, yes, sir. It was person to person to Mr. Ben Casey. Ben Casey? Mr. Jack Casey's son. Son? But well, do you know him? I used to. When? Well, we went to high school together. Some of my girlfriends and I used to go places with Ben's bunch, but my mother made me stop. She said he wasn't the kind of boy that girls should run around with. I see. And he finally left home. Couldn't get along with his stepmother. Oh, then Mrs. Casey's not his mother. Oh, no, Ranger. They used to fight old. Go on. This may be very important. Well, I heard that she and Ben fought all the time, and then one day after they had a big fight, Ben packed up and left. Well, when was this? I reckon it was a couple of years ago. He went down to Monee then and got a job at that sawmill there. What does this Ben look like? He's a spitting image of his father and just as fat, too. Have you seen him lately? I saw him at the bus station. His father came and picked him up. When? Let's see, um, the day before yesterday. Friday. <laughs> 
There was no doubt now why Jack Casey wasn't talking. He was protecting his own son. I put a call through to Mrs. Casey and met her at the sheriff's office. I ain't saying this because he ain't my flesh and blood, Ranger, but Ben's bad through and through. I might have known he was the one killed Milk Thomas. Uh, Mrs. Casey, tell me about Ben. He came in Friday, didn't he? Yeah. Come in on the bus and stayed over Saturday. He wanted to borrow money. He's always broke. Gambles. That's right, Pearson. Picked him up a couple of times for gambling. Go on, Miss Casey. Well, like I say, he wanted to borrow $50 from Jack, but Jack didn't have it. He just paid off a note to Milk Thomas, and he was kind of strapped. So your husband owed Thomas money? Yes, but it was the last thing. Jack was joking about how Thomas always wanted cash money. Didn't trust Jack. Did Ben hear him say this? He sure did, Sheriff. And then he sucked around all day Saturday until we was getting ready to go to the commencement that night. And just before we left, he said he was going to use Jack's horse to go for a ride. At night? Yeah, seems strange to me, too. And then he asked, could he borrow a pair of Jack's boots? He was wearing flat heel shoes. Uh, they wear the same size? Oh, have, ever since I can remember. Well, anyway, we went on to the graduation. And when we got home, the mare was in the barn, still saddled, all sweaty. Looked like she'd been run almost to death. And Jack's boots were tossed on the floor, and Ben was gone. All right, Miss Casey. That's all for now, and thanks. You're welcome. Come on, Sheriff. We're going on a little trip. <laughs> Sheriff Taxon and I piled into my car and headed for Moni. As soon as we got out on the highway, I put in a call to my headquarters. Unit 10 to KTXA. Unit 10 to KTXA. KTXA to Unit 10. Go ahead, Unit 10. Unit 10 leaving Cranston State Highway 22 en route to Moni. Investigating murder suspect believed in vicinity of Delta Sawmill. Will keep KTXA informed. Unit 10, 10 4. Okay. KTXA, Austin. KTXA, Sheriff. Austin, Austin. You know young Casey by sight, don't you? Yeah, I watched him grow up. Good. If he's gone and we have to comb for him, I don't want to turn up the wrong fat man again. Oh, you'd know him now, after seeing his father. Except for age, they're the same. You mean except for age and the fact that the young one's a murderer. When we reached the sawmill, the moon was up. A full moon. There was a light burning through the window of one shack at the edge of the camp. We pulled up there and got out of the car and went in. Yeah. All right. We're looking for a man named Casey. Ben Casey? Yeah, you're right. I don't know for sure. Sleeps in a big bunkhouse down the line. Which bunk? I'll show you if you like. Fine. Sheriff, maybe you better take a look through the mess hall. That boy like him might be fixing a late snack. If you don't find him, come up and meet me. And if you do find him, call me before you try and take him. Right. Bunkhouse is this one. No, no light in the place. Well, some of the boys was going into town for a moonlight dance. Don't know if Ben went with them or not. Has he been packing any money that you know of? Well, oh yeah, come to think of it, he had quite a bit. Said he hit it lucky in a dice game that... Well, we did get it in a dice game, didn't he? If he did, the other fellow never got a chance to roll him. Oh? He will. I'll light this lamp for you. Uh, ben sleeps in that third bunk on the left. Thanks. I'll wait for him. All right, I'll get back to my books and just enter the shipment that's being hauled out tonight. That's why you found me working. Go ahead. But uh, if you see Casey, don't mention I'm here. The foreman went back to his shack and I ripped Ben Casey's bunk apart nothing in the bunk of the covering. I dragged the footlocker out from underneath and was bending over it. All right, Ranger. Up with him. Don't turn around. They're up. What are you doing here? If you're Ben Casey, you know what I'm doing. This is the end of the road, boy. I'll take that lantern. I think 
careful with that pin. Remember what happened the last time you dropped a lantern? I'm pretty smart, ain't you, mister? But I'm smart, too. Here's a present for you. <laughs> edge of the bunk and the flaming kerosene splashed over me. I beat the flames out with my hands and dove for the door. He rammed something against the outside of it. When I forced it open, I stumbled over a heavy log bench he used as a barricade. Hey, Ranger, what is it? Casey, you see him, Sheriff? Well, somebody went off that way. Heard the rail sightings. Let's go. spotted him swinging up the side of a flat car as the train hit the main line and started to roll. We grabbed onto one of the last cars and scrambled to the top and started to work our way forward. There he is. About five cars ahead. I can't see him. Kerosene scorched my eyes. He can see us all right and shoot. Drop flat. We'll crawl up on him. He can't go any farther than the length of the train. There it goes. He's jumping. I see him. I'm going after him. Well, I'm coming with you. He's grabbing the wheel. See? Nobody's close. About ten yards in, not moving. Keep low. We're silhouetted good against this clearing. What you doing, Pearson? Taking off my jacket. See if you can find a stick about five feet long. Oh, here's a dead branch. This dude? Fine. Give it to me. What are you fixing to do? I'll put this branch through my coat sleeves like this. Here. When I tell you, hold it up. I get it. Something to shoot at. Right. I fired his gun flash. All right, Casey, come out with your hands up. This is your last chance, Casey. Okay, Sheriff, lift the coat. You got it! Come on! Don't shoot me! Don't kill me! Oh, please, please, give me a chance. Like you gave Milt Thomas? It was a short train ride, Casey, but I got a hunch you'll get a longer one soon. Come on. Ben Casey confessed to the murder of Milt Thomas. On August 2nd, 1948, he entered Huntsville Penitentiary. His sentence, life imprisonment. Joe McRae, that was a great show tonight. Wheaties and I are proud of it. Thank you, Frank. I can please the customers. Well, now, so do I. Big Wheaties, for instance. Frank. Are you going to say that Wheaties taste good? Well, yes, I was going to touch on that. And are you going to say that Wheaties are good for people? Yes, yes, I was going to say just that. Anything else? Well, no, I guess that just about covers it, Joe. Except to... Except telling people to get... That's it, how'd you know? Well, that's easy, Frank. I'm a Wheaties eater myself. You hear that, folks? You too can be a Wheaties eater. As early as tomorrow morning. Breakfast is champions, you know. Get some. Next week, Joel McRae in another authentic reenactment of a case from the files of the Texas Rangers. This story was transcribed and adapted by David Bruce and was produced and directed by Stacy Keith. Al Gibney speaking. And this is the Wheaties man, Frank Martin, inviting you to listen Monday night to Frank Lovejoy and Nightbeat on the Wheaties Big Parade. See you then. There's good listening with the Summer Symphony on NBC. It's National Wheaties Week. It's National Wheaties Week, and Wheaties present Joel McRae in Tales of the Texas Rangers. 
On stage tonight, transcribed from Hollywood, another in the Wheaties' big parade of exciting half-hour presentations. Tales of the Texas Rangers, starring Joel McRae as Ranger Pearson. Texas, more than 260,000 square miles. And 50 men who make up the most famous and oldest law enforcement body in North America. of the Texas Rangers come these stories based on fact. Only names, dates, and places are fictitious for obvious reasons. The events themselves are a matter of record. Tonight's case, Fool's Gold. after 9 a.m. on the Tuesday after Labor Day, 1946. Two men in a late model black sedan cruise slowly along the main street of the town of Live Oak in West Texas. All right. Let's go over it once more. We've been over it 20 times, boy. Let's get it done. I ain't taking a chance on you making any mistakes. I ain't making mistakes. Think I want to go back to Huntsville again? Haven't done anything but case this bank since I got out of the pen a month ago. You sure there's no guard? No, I told you. Town like this. <laughs> Ain't got but two tellers in the cage. Got an alarm system, though. One of them moves for an alarm, start blasting. How are we gonna hide out afterwards? You leave that to me. We'll beat our way back to where I've been working. Roundup will be starting tomorrow. I'll get the old man to take you on until things cool off. That's good. Yeah. Ain't nobody gonna suspect a poor working cow folk. Here we are. You keep me covered while I cash the check. Yeah. Good thing he never cashed a check like that before. Shut up. Howdy, gentlemen. What can I do for you? Cash this. Sure thing. What? Pass over five thousand dollars. Come on, don't move funny or I'll blast you. Robbers! They're robbers! You crazy old! Let's get out of here! We'll drop anybody who gets in the way! Come on, commissary! Get in! And they're pouring out of that place back there. They'll have to roll fast to get us. Look out! Car coming out of that side street. Let them look out! They're gonna hit! Poor John, there's blood all over him. Look at 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 him. Partner, it's National Wheaties Week. It's celebrating time, and I'll tell you why. There's a whole kernel of wheat in every Wheaties flake. Think what that means. There's a whole kernel of wheat in every Wheaties flake. Now, doesn't that say vitamins and minerals and energy, energy worth talking about? Sure, first thing in the morning, Wheaties and milk and fruit. Join me tomorrow. See how Wheaties at 7 can help at 11. <laughs> Texas Highway Patrol threw a guard around the wrecked cars and notified the Texas Rangers of the attempted bank holdup and the fatal crash. Ranger Jace Pearson was assigned to the case. Howdy, Jace. Glad to see you. Howdy, Rhodes. Pretty bad. Who got here first? I did. Patrolling near Landmark when the call came through. Which one was the bandit car? It's a black sedan. Who was in the coop? man and his kid. They took away. You didn't miss anything by not seeing it, Jase. 
Where are the bodies? The doctor had him taken to the hospital basement. How about the bank, Miller? He's alive, but he's unconscious. Deputy sheriff's with him. One of the stick-up men got killed in the crash. Yeah. Been able to find the driver? No, no not yet. Cut down that street and into the hills, according to witnesses. Sheriff has the dogs and posse after him. Who owns the sedan? Don't know yet, Chase. We're checking on it. Let's have a look at it. Okay. Hmm. Blood on both sides during the too. Means the driver must have been shot on his head or his hand. Had a gash in his scalp. Yeah. Hit the windshield on this side. And a couple of hairs stuck to the jagged edge. A dark brown. Yeah. The druggist got a good look at him. Saw the whole thing from his store. Came out to help and almost got shot. Was he around? Yeah, he's right over there. Mr. Rebo. Yeah. The ranger wants to talk to you. Let him, sir, will you, boys? Yes, sir. You see the man who was driving the sedan? Yeah, saw him up close. A oh, call coming in on our car radios, Jason. Excuse me. Sure, Rhodes. What do you look like? Six feet, maybe. Built solid. Boots, jeans, and work shirt. Of course, that could fit a thousand men, but this one had a couple of gold teeth right in the middle of his mouth. Gold teeth, huh? Anything else? No, except for a bad cut on his head. Bad enough to need stitching? Sure was. Uh, got a flash on the sedan, Jason. It was stolen during the night or early this morning over in Rankin. I thought so. We better get over to the hospital. I'll call headquarters and have a lab man sent down to go for the car for fingerprints. Not easy to lift him from that car. Get pretty smeared with all the blood around. Yeah. And even if you do get him, you still got to find the man that goes with him. There's a body, gentlemen. Lift the sheet if you want. Anything on him, Doctor? Nothing at all. Not even a mark that might identify him. Go on to see the father and the child, do you? No, that wouldn't help. Rhodes, we can fingerprint this one. It would help us find his pal, I think. Yeah. You can do me a favor, Doc. Sure. The killer who got away cut himself on this glass. Before I send it to Austin, I'd like to get his blood type from him. Can you do it now? Sure. Come upstairs to the lab in 15 minutes. Have it for you. Then. Thanks. What blood type will give you something to go on, Chase? I hope we don't need it. I wish there was some word from the sheriff's posse. If they had, I'm afraid we'd have heard them now. Yeah. We might as well walk over to the sheriff's office while we're waiting for the doc. Mm. We can go through the next room and up the front stairs. Okay. <laughs> That's the kid's mother. Did you come to see my boy and my husband? Did you know him? I didn't. <laughs> Maybe you ought to go home. Yeah. Why should I go home? There's nobody there now. He wanted his daddy to be the one to take him to school. He was just being registered. For his death. Take it easy, man. We were so proud of him. All last night he slept with his little red pencil box in his head. I just bought it for Saturday. Never even learned to write his name. <laughs> Nothing we can do to help her, Chase. Not here. No. Should be my wife and kid. Or yours. Any more on the bank teller? A uh, deputy reported he's still unconscious. We can look in the room when we get back to the hospital at... Hey, look, it's part of the sheriff's posse. Hey, did you find him? No, Follow the blood trail cross country, but it made the river and we lost him. No chance of getting him now. Oh, 
Excuse me, Ranger. Go ahead. Hello? Yeah, I'll be right in. What? VA is here now. I'll tell him. Goodbye. That was the deputy from the bank teller's room. The teller just died. Unconscious all the way? Nope. Came through for just a second before he passed on. Did he say anything? Nothing you don't already know, Ranger. The man who shot him had gold teeth. It was night before the fingerprint crew found him. I unloaded my horse charcoal from the car trailer and was watering and feeding the delivery stable and highway patrolman Rhodes brought over the reports. Come on. Well, Chase, I know who the dead one is. Let's see. John Collins served four years in Huntsville armed robber. No family, no known associates since leaving penitentiary. That's no help for finding the other one. Well, could have known him before he went to prison or after. Anything on the car? Yeah, here. Hmm. Looks like things for no clearance, except a cold tongue impression on the cap of the gas tank. Haven't got anything on that print yet, though. Whoever it is, he has no record in Texas. He will have. The FBI may have some on it. I'm not going to wait around here, though. I don't like it either. Well, which way can you go? Both ways. The car was stolen in Rankin. That's west. I'll head back that way. You take the highway east. You got a plan? Something will keep us busy while we're waiting for a report on that thumbprint. Check every doctor along the way and see if any of them have stitched a head wound for a man with gold teeth. For a good part of the night and half the next day, I covered the towns and the back roads between towns. Country doctors and emergency hospitals. None of them had seen the man I was after. Then finally, KTXI in San Angelo came through. KTXI calling Unit 10. KTXI calling Unit 10. Unit 10 to KTXI. Go ahead, KTXI. That report for Unit 10 on thumbprint found on gas cap of stolen car. Subject known as Robert Trummer. Believed to be in or near Santa Rita. Maybe working there. Occupation, automobile mechanic. Unit 10 presently located Regan County, 40 miles from Santa Rita. We'll continue investigation. Unit 10, 10-4. Yesterday morning at 9 o'clock. Uh, I was right here working once. You sure you weren't in the Drover's Bank at Live Oak? Of course I was. Wasn't I? Move over here under the light. All right, now smile. What? I said smile. Say you weren't at Live Oak yesterday morning, huh? You heard me. Those gold teeth say you were. Look, Ranger, right? I... The bank teller's dead from her, so is a five year old kid and his father. And your pal comes. I don't know what you're talking about, Ranger. Try remembering, Cromer. You got a cut on your head. Take your hat off and let's have a look at that. Sure, I'll take my hat off. Well, if you're looking, Ranger. You see any cut? No. No, Cromer. I don't see any. So if the guy you're looking for has a cut on his head, Ranger, it ain't me. National Wheaties Week, everybody. From the Wheaties people, from me, and right now from the man stepping up to our microphone from backstage, the hardworking director of Tales of the Texas Rangers, Mr. Stacy Keach. Well, how's it seem, Stacy? Gosh, Frank, this doesn't seem like work. Now imagine getting paid for this. It seems like fun to be able to get up here and talk about Wheaties. Well, it is fun, you know, and particularly on National Wheaties Week. It certainly is. And folks, Backstage, we're celebrating just like we hope you are. Nothing dramatic, you know, just Wheaties with milk and fruit first thing in the morning. An all-star cast if I ever saw one. Try Wheaties yourself, so we'll know you're listening. They're great. 
Sure are, Stacy. Thanks for talking for us on National Wheaties Week. I took Cromer with me and drove back to Live Oak. There was no cut on his head, but he fitted everything else. His print matched the one in the gas can. I stopped at the hospital and Cromer consented to have his blood type taken. When the doc gets through testing that, he'll only tell you what I told you before. My blood type is O. Come in. You sent for me, Ranger? Yeah, Mr. Raver. You ever see this man before? Hmm. He looks like the fellow. Why, you... Hold it, hold it. Not sit down. Well, Mr. Raver, is he or isn't he? I've seen him before. Where? Was he the man who climbed out of that wreck? Look, mister, maybe you did see me before. I run a gas station 30 miles down the highway. You might have seen me there. But you didn't see me here yesterday. How about it, Mr. Ray? Ranger, I'm not sure. After all, the fellow that got out of the car had a gun in his hand and blood all over his face. All I remember is them gold teeth. I ain't the only man in the world with gold teeth. You may be telling the truth, Ranger. You're after a blood type AB. This man's blood is pretty common. Type O, like he said. The case against Tromo was falling apart in my hands. I only had one thing left, his fingerprint, tying him with the stolen sedan. I took him over to the local garage. Recognize this car, Tromo? thumbprint was right on this tank there. So I guess the car up to the station, maybe. That's how my thumb... Hey, let me see that cat. Well? I sold a tank cap like this yesterday morning. Had to pry his old cap off with a chisel. Look. Hey, you can see the marks. The car wasn't hit on this side. Keep talking. Oh, the guy came in for gas early, 6 a.m. I was just opening up. His tank cap was the kind of locks, and he didn't have the key. Said he lost his key. Even had to jump the switch to get the car started. Here. A few wires have jumped on this. I know that. That's how it was stolen. Didn't you think of that when he didn't have the keys? Oh, Ranger, it happens all the time. People are always losing keys. I've done it myself. Oh, I should have known there was something fishy about that guy. Why? Well, oh, because he didn't have any money to pay for the gas. Didn't tell me till I filled it up, either. Why'd you let him leave? He took 10 gallons in the gas cap. Bill came to, uh, two, 293. Left me a hunting knife and a sheet for security. Worth maybe eight or nine bucks. Did he come back for it? No, I got it locked in my tool chest back at the station. Would you know the man if you saw him at me? I think so. It's just getting daylight. Oh, one customer's face looks like another. But I'd remember him. He had gold teeth like you. Uh, that's something I can't tell you. He was chewing a cut of tobacco and talking through it. Come on, I'll drive you back to your station and have a look at that knife. Chase, saw your car outside. Hi there, Rhodes. I checked a lot of doctors on the East Highway. One of them did the kind of stitch job we're looking for. I may have a lead. Get in your car and tag up. <laughs> Here's the knife, just like he left it. Fresh one and clean as a whistle. No prints on that knife. Rhodes, take a look at the sheet. Design burned in leather. Oh, yeah. Engraving pretty fancy sometimes. And this isn't an electric engraving job. It's not good enough. Owner burned this in himself. Probably used a hot wire. Oh. That drawing looks like a buffalo head, Chase. But it isn't. Mm -hmm. Smaller drawings around it look like trees, like some scene he was burning out. Yeah. Yeah, Jesus, something like that you see way off from the highway. State 23, west of Rankin. That's it, Rhodes. Buffalo Mesa. Let's get up that way and see if we can find a doc who stitched a head. It was mid-morning when we reached the area. There were three doctors in the 20-mile radius. The first one had nothing for us, but the second one... Yes, I stitched a head wound like that before yesterday. Cowboy, uh, Joe Coy, fell off his horse. Matter of fact, he was in here this morning, about three hours ago, to have the dressing chain. If you put on a fresh dress, the one you changed is in that trash container, isn't it, Doc? Why, yes. Any blood on it? 
course. Cut was deep, hasn't healed yet. Can you get that dressing out and check it for blood type? Take a few minutes. I waited a couple of days for this, Doc. I can wait a few more minutes. <laughs> Hey, y'all, Ranger. Unusual classification type AB. That's it, Jason. Yeah. You know where this Joe Foy works, Doc? Why, Ben Kinney's place. Left crossroads and six miles out. Right near Buffalo Mission. Thanks, Doc. Come on, Rhodes. All right. Oh, Doc. Yeah. Foy has a couple of gold teeth, doesn't he? Gold teeth? Why, no, Ranger. He doesn't have gold teeth. <laughs> but he didn't have gold teeth. Rhodes and I drove out to the Kinney Ranch. The one around was no woman. They don't need to cook here. Mr. Kinney and the men who work for him are out on the pounder. Where does the boy bump? Over there in the barn. It's a small room. You want to show us? Come with me. This is bunk? Yeah. Hey, Chase, look. Found on the edge of the bunk. Buffalo Mesa. It looks just like the one in the sheet. Better have a look through this footlocker. Likely he'd have his gun with him, isn't it, Chase? Just making sure. Hey, what is it? Oh, cut and a chew on the back of it. Hey, that fits. Fellow at the service station said our man was chewing when he stopped there. Yeah, and I've seen this brand of chew before. My memory isn't lying. There's something else that fits. You shouldn't tear open Mr. Foy's things. I just want to see one of these plugs. Here's the answer, Rhodes. Yeah. The plugs are wrapped in gold foil. Yeah. If I tear off a square of the foil and put it over my front teeth like this, I look like I have gold teeth. I never witness who saw Foy was throwing us off the train instead of having it. I wonder how he thought of it. Probably got the idea on his way to Live Oak when he saw Trummer at the gas station. I'm going to take charcoal out of the trailer and ride out to the rain. And I'll get a horse from the corral. And... No, thanks, Rose. But you better stick here. If boy spots me coming, he might make a run for the ranch and grab a car or a pickup truck. You stay here and see if he doesn't get to him. Boy? No, I'm Kenny, Ranger. Boy in some kind of trouble? I'd call murder plenty of trouble. Murder? Yeah. Where is he? Down the road here, surrounded up strays. Glad to show you. All right, let's go. You know where Boy was Monday? Took the day off to fix his gear up and get ready for the roundup. You see him during the day? Nope. Went over to his bunk that night, though, to see why he didn't show for supper. Had a cut on his head. Said he fell. Doc hit and passed up. I know about that. Hey, there he comes now, around the mason. Man, he spotted us. He's turning back for cover. Get up, Doc! Get up! Hey, turn behind, here! Oh! Oh, oh boy! Ranger! You're hit! I got to get him. You hit him, but he's up. He's running for the river. I got to get him. Come here, Doc. Come here. Left shoulder looks mighty bad, Ranger. You can't chase him like that. I hit him. Come here, boy. <coughs> if he can move with a bullet in him, so can I. Get up, Charcoal. Ain't far ahead, Richard. Not as far as he'd like to be. 
Joseph Foy was definitely identified as that of the killer and hidden rum driver. The ballistic check showed that his gun was the weapon used in the murder of the bank clerk. Ranger Jace Pearson was taken to the nearest hospital where, after a blood transfusion, he was pronounced out of danger. Are you with us out there? Are you celebrating? Well, it's National Wheaties Week, you know. And here's our star, Mr. Joel McRae, following up another great performance tonight with a few words meant for you personally. Joel? I'm enjoying being a Texas Ranger, and I hope you're enjoying it, too. As a matter of fact, I sincerely hope you've enjoyed it enough to go out and buy a box of Wheaties on Monday. If you do, that's the way we'll know. Your purchase of one box of Wheaties. Will you do that? I think you'll like them. Good night. Thank you, Joel McRae. And how is that for a sporting proposition, folks? If you like our show, there's a way to let us know. Just see your grocer about those Wheaties tomorrow. Remember, there's a whole kernel of wheat in every Wheaties flake. Goodness knows how many flakes there are in a box. Yes, there's a whole kernel of wheat in every Wheaties flake. You know the value of whole wheat. Necessary vitamins, minerals, too and whole wheat energy worth talking about. Go ahead. Have Wheaties to start breakfast tomorrow. Wheaties with milk and the fruit you like. Breakfast of champions? Well, I should say so. Try them and see how Wheaties at 7 can help at 11. Come on, it's National Wheaties Week. Come on, everybody, to the Wheaties party. Eat a lot of Wheaties like the champions do. Dance together, cheek to cheek. This is National Wheaties Week. Eat a lot of Wheaties like the champions do. Wheaties are breakfast of champions. Next week, Joel McRae in another authentic reenactment of a case from the files of the Texas Rangers. Joel McRae will soon be seen in the Universal International Technicolor production, Saddle Trend. Tonight's cast included Tony Barrett, Ty Aberback, Paul Fries, Herb Butterfield, Dave Ellis, and Lillian Baez. This story was transcribed and adapted by Joel Murcott, and the program was produced and directed by Stacy Keach. Hal Gibney speaking. And this is the Wheaties man, Frank Martin, inviting you to listen on Wednesday night to Brian Donlevy in Dangerous Assignment on the Wheaties Big Parade. See you then. This is Joel McRae. A small boy is hungry in Italy tonight. You can feed him, comfort him, make him believe again with a package from Care. No profit to Care, just food for hungry kids. 550 dozen to Care, New York. Care, New York, 550. Do you do it? Listen for Dennis Day and Judy Canova returning October 7th on NBC. It's National Wheaties Week. Yes, 
Yes, it's National Wheaties Week, and Wheaties present Joel McRae in Tales of the Texas Rangers. <laughs> On stage tonight, transcribed from Hollywood, another in the Wheaties big parade of exciting half-hour presentations. Texas Rangers, starring Joel McRae as Ranger Pearson. Texas, more than 260,000 square miles. And 50 men who make up the most famous and oldest law enforcement body in North America. of the Texas Rangers come these stories based on fact. Only names, dates, and places are fictitious for obvious reasons. The events themselves are a matter of record. Tonight's case, the open range. August 4th, 1948. Maury Buckler and his son Dave are driving across their ranch in a jeep, dropping off salt cakes for their cattle. How's the last stop, Pa? Here. Well, drop this one here. What's the matter, Pa? The last salt cake we dropped here is hardly touched. Look at it. Huh? Why, yeah. No point in leaving another one. Usually quite a few head around here. Wonder why they're not touching it. Oh, somebody could be running them off. <laughs> Rustler's paw. That's kind of out of date, I'd say. <laughs> hey, uh, maybe there's a break in the fence down by the old road. Yeah. yeah. Well, you better drive around the cottonwoods and have a look. There's a break. We can fix her right now. I have to go back and get horses, though, if we're going to pick up the strays. Yeah. We'll be able to see the fence now as soon as we get over this rise. Hey, Paul. Hmm? Paul, a big truck down there and a bunch of men in some of our stock. So that's what's been happening to him. Speed it up. I'll get my rifle in the back here. The sea is coming. You fellas better stay right where you are. Oh, 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 oh me. Damn. I'll get you for this. Oh, oh, come back, Paul. Oh. 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 <laughs> Tales of the Texas Rangers will continue in just a moment. It's National Wheaties Week, all right, and it couldn't happen to a nicer flake. Because look, there's a whole kernel of wheat in every Wheaties flake. And you know whole wheat. Of course, the naturally sweet whole wheat flavor of Wheaties is important, too. And good? My, my, come on, help celebrate National Wheaties Week. Just buy them, that's all. Buy them and see how Wheaties at 7 can help at 11. <laughs> Dave Buckler managed to drag his father to the jeep and drive to the nearest hospital, but the father was dead on arrival. Sheriff Clyde Johnson immediately called the Texas Rangers, and Ranger Jace Pearson was assigned to the case. What are you looking for, Ranger? I mm, thought we'd find some truck tire markings here, Sheriff. The ground's plenty hard, except for the dust settled on the top. That'd hold a track, but... Hey, look. Mm, just a big, wide mark. Yeah. Probably some brush hung from the tailgate of the truck. Wipe the tread right out behind him. Let's go through the fence. Yeah. Must have been operating right about here. Yeah. Plenty of cattle tracks, but no boot prints. He wiped out their tracks like they did with the truck. Smart. Probably dragged branches behind him. 
can see where they were here, though. Tobacco crumbs and paper where they ground out their cigarettes. Yeah. Looks like 15 or 20 head they run off from the marks. Mm -hmm. All right, let's go back to the car for a second. Now, how do the Bucklers brand their herd? Ooh, just a simple letter L. Buckler's wife's name was Lou. Do you know if their brand has been registered? I don't believe it ever was, Ranger. Why? I've got to make a radio call to KTXA in Austin. Unit 10 to KTXA. Unit 10 to KTXA. KTXA to Unit 10. Go ahead, Unit 10. Unit 10 requests headquarters to ask all commission houses to be on lookout for marketing of any cattle carrying letter L brand or any altered brand that might have been made to cover letter L. Will do, Unit 10. May be part of stock stolen from Buckler Ranch on 8-4. Notify Unit 10 if any lead turns up. Unit 10, 10-4. We'll keep Unit 10 informed. KDXA Good idea, that poll. Might get a lead. Yeah. When we get through here, I want to go into the hospital and see Dave Butler. He might just be able to describe it. Hey, wait. Hmm? What do you got? A whole cigarette lying right here near this bush. And scorched. Somebody started to light it but didn't finish. Hmm. That's the matchbook lying in the bush. Whatever happened, it made a fella forget about his cigarette. Must have been when the bucklers came over the hill. Feller saw him, threw the cigarette and matches down just as he was getting ready to light up. Yeah, that could be all right. Half the matches are still in the book. Ones that are missing are all torn off from the left side of the book. So? So the man who had this book of matches is left-handed. Let's get into the hospital. <laughs> Right-handed, so was Clark. That just couldn't have been ours. Just making sure. Can you describe any of the stock they made off with, Buckler? Well, yeah. Most of them white-faced. There was one of the calves that had a mottled face. Mottled, huh? Yeah. Good. That helps. My pa was such a good guy, Ranger. I wish I could climb out of here and help you find those dirty... Can you give me any kind of a description of the men? No. You never got a good look at A couple of days went by, then a week. There was no sign of the buckler cattle with the L brand. I went back to headquarters to see Captain Stinson. Uh, no sign of those cattle, huh? Not a head, Captain. Well, they might be afraid to unload them so soon after a killing. That means they'd have to bend or alter the brands and put them out to graze. I think they'd want to be too close to them for fear of being spotted. Neither do I, Jace. That's why I've got an idea. You ever think of trying Camp Hood? No, but I should have. It's a perfect spot for them. 35 square miles of free grazing. Yeah, ever since the Army deactivated the camp, a lot of ranchers have been using it. Our last check showed 15,000 head there, all kinds of brands. Fattening up until the owners cut them out for marketing. Sure. Buckler's cattle with altered brands covering that L could be waiting there for the thief to come back and get him whenever he wants. Yeah, that's what I thought. That's a lot of territory and a lot of cattle for one man to cover. I'm going to have Bud Kurtz come in and go with you. Kurtz? Fine. The commission houses are still on the alert. We got them stopped on the selling end. Now it's up to you to find those cattle. They're the only key to the killer. <laughs> and started to check the open range. In three days, we ran across more than 50 brands, all legitimate. But on the fourth day... Our folks are pretty busy, Kurtz. Yeah, cutting out a few calves over there. There's a branding fire and two men. You see us coming. Keep your eyes peeled. They may be all right, but if they aren't, one of them may throw a gun. Oh, oh boy. Howdy, Ranger. Howdy. You can let that one go, Pete. No. Hold him for a minute. What's the matter, Ranger? Let me frisk you. I'll get this fella. Why? What's wrong, Ranger? I ain't got no gun. Just checking out. What's your brand? Nothing on this fella. Jay. Well, there's the iron right there. Jay in the center of a box, huh? Yeah. My name's Jack Stern. Got a ranch up in Box Canyon. Brand's supposed to be Jack in the Box. What are you doing with this stock? 
Hmm, changing over to my brand. From what? An L brand? No, square you. Like that one over there. He added my brand on him yet. Hmm, take a look at it. See? Yeah, I see. It's a square U now, but it was an L. The brand's been altered. Okay, let him go. Find something, Chase? Yeah. Where'd you get this stock? I bought them last night. Anything wrong? They were stolen a week ago. I got a bill of sale for them, Ranger. The fellow who had them was cutting them out yesterday. Said he was taking the steers to market, but he wanted to sell the cash for $60 a head. So he wouldn't have to keep coming all the way back from Rollo to get him. Came from Rollo, huh? That's what he said. But here's the bill of sale. Name was Vic Moran. Angel, you must be making a mistake. Maybe. How many cabs did he sell you? Eight of them. Boyd brought these two in here, and they're getting the others now. Good. Is there a model face in the bunch, Stern? Yeah, there is. Guess that settles it, Chase. This is Buckler's stock. Yeah. You better drive him out and have a van pick him up. The lab can examine the brands. Now, what about my money? Your claims against the man who sold them to you, Vic Morad from Rollo. If that was his right name. If he moves steers out too, Jace, they should be turning up at a commission house in a day or so. Yeah. In the meantime, Stern, I'll have to hold you and your boys in custody for possession of stolen property. Ain't it enough that I lost $480? Maybe it'll teach you not to pay cash for cattle until you've checked on them. I didn't pay cash. I gave him a rather check. A check? You mean he took a check from you? Yeah. Hey, maybe I can stop payment. You won't have to. We'll do it for you. Where's your bank? Ranchers and Merchants Trust in Abilene. The president knows me. His name's Chalmers. All right, Stern. Kurt, you bring him and his boys into town with a stock. I'll meet you there. I gotta get to a phone and call that bank. I rode charcoal hard into town, found a phone, and put a call through for Mr. Chalmers, president of the bank in Abilene. But I was too late. I'm sorry, Ranger Pearson, but Mr. Morath cashed that check shortly after we opened this morning. Did you ask Morath for identification? Yes, but he didn't have any on him. And you cashed the check anyhow? Well, he asked us to call his bank in Rollo for a reference to save him time. He even paid for the call. You mean he actually comes from Rollo and they've heard of him there? The Rollo State Bank said he had an account there. But you don't actually know whether the man was Morath. Well, after all, Ranger, when the man paid for the call to his own bank in Rollo... Did Morath endorse the check? Yes, it was endorsed in my presence. Will you rush that endorsed check to my headquarters? I want to look at that signature. When the check came through, Kurtz and I left for Rollo, Texas. For Rollo, we went directly to Morath's bank. Uh, Vic Moran? Well, yeah, I know him. This his signature? I have to compare it with a signature card just a minute. M A M A S M A U. Ah, yeah, here we are. Uh, now he takes both signatures and C. They're not the same, Jace. No. Thank you. Any time, Ray. Come on. What now, Jace? Ralph's ranch is only about a mile out. We better drive out there and see him. <laughs> Drink, Rangers? No, thanks. So somebody's been using my name, huh? Looks that way. I know who it might be. No, but it's a cinch it wouldn't be a friend. Forgery's a mighty low trick. I figure it may have happened a hundred times before, Mr. Moran, but this is the first time we caught it. I'm mighty glad you did. I don't like my name being mixed up with eating and killing. Of course, you'd never see the checks. They'd go right back to the man who made them out after they were cashed. Anybody ever forged your name to a check that went through your own bank? I know. If anybody had and I knew it, I'd have taken a bullwhip to him. No help here, Chase. No. Well, thanks for your cooperation, Mr. Morath. We can find our way out. So long, Mr. Morath. You sure you won't take one of these before you go? I'm having another. No, thanks. That certainly led us into a blind pass. Huh? I said Marath was no help. What's the matter with you, Chase? I was just thinking of that book of matches I found on the range out of Buckler's. Ones that were dropped by somebody left-handed? Yeah. 
I watched Morath pouring that drink for himself. He's left-handed, Kurtz. Well, that's mighty thin and circumstantial, Chase. Sure, I know it is. Just a passing thought. I better call KTXA. Unit 10 to KTXA. Unit 10 back in service. KTXA to Unit 10. Have message for you. Go ahead, KTXA. Cattle with L brand offered for sale this afternoon at Tully Commission House, Fort Wood. Cattle inspector reports brand might have been L brand from Buckler Ranch. Did Commissioner get name and address of seller? Seller refused to have check mailed. Said he would pick it up tomorrow after stock was weighed and priced. Gave his name is Vic Morath, Rollo, Texas. Just left Morath at home in Rollo. Unit 10 and Unit 6 proceeding to Fort Worth. We'll be there when Commission House opens in morning. Unit 10, 10 4. Got a long drive ahead of us, Jace. Yeah. This is the break we've waited for. <laughs> Not so important now, is it, that Morath happened to be left handed? No. Not now, it isn't. just a moment, we continue with Tales of the Texas Rangers, starring Joel McRae as Ranger Chase Pearson. It's National Wheaties Week everywhere, even backstage in our studio here tonight. Sure it is, we're all buying and eating Wheaties this week. And here's living proof, the man who dramatizes Tales of the Texas Rangers, Mr. Joel Murcott. All right, Joel, are you getting your Wheaties? I sure am, Frank. And not only that, I've got Wheaties written for the breakfast strip for Mrs. Murcott and our four kids, too. Seems like eating Wheaties is little enough to do for them when they do so much for us. Folks, I hope you feel that way, but even if you don't, try Wheaties once. Just to show us you like our shows, what do you say? After all, National Wheaties Week only comes once a year. Thank you, Joel Murcott. <laughs> Fort Worth during the night and examined the cattle in the Commission House stock pens. Part of the Buckler L. Brands, all right. All next day, Bud Kurtz and I were staked out in the Commission House office. The man impersonating Morath never showed to pick up his check. Well, I have to wait again tomorrow, Chase. I don't think so. He won't be coming. What do you mean? Our man didn't show because somebody tipped him not to show. You think somebody in the Commission House slipped up? Maybe not, Kurtz. Maybe we slipped up. Maybe we did. What do you mean, Chase? I'll tell you as soon as we find a photograph of Vic Morath, the real one from Rollo. It took almost two days to find a picture. We went through newspaper files, readers' publications, cattlemen and ranchers' journals, county fair souvenir books. Captain Stinson found what I was after. Chase, look. Is Morath one of these? Yeah. Yeah, that's it, Captain. That's Morath in the center. Group picture. Who are the others? Picture comes from a breeder's journal. Caption says it's the Morath Ranch Rodeo Team. Had the highest group score at the Rollo Rodeo in 1946. Two years ago. I want to see if Stern or Chalmers, the banker, can identify Morath as the man who sold those calves. Well, we know it wasn't Morath, Chase. The signatures didn't match. Captain, Morath is left-handed. He might have endorsed the check with his right hand just to cover up. Hey, your Jace may have something there. It's worth trying. Stern has been released. Oh. Call him at his ranch and have him meet us at his bank in Abilene. How about it, Stern? Is this the man, the bareheaded one in the center? Mm, no. No, Ranger. I never saw him before. How about you, Chalmers? Is this the man who presented the check? No, no, it isn't. Another washout, Chase. And let me see that picture again. Sure, here. I am uh, not sure, but uh, this fellow on the end, right here. Uh, you look at it, Jones. Why, yes. Yes, I believe that is the man. One of the cowpokes, huh? Come on, Kurtz. We're going to visit the sheriff at Rollo. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I know that feller. 
working for Morath about a year ago. Bought himself a little ranch not far from Morath, uh, over near Comanche Gulch. Now, folk has to be pretty thrifty to buy a ranch. What's his name? Uh, Buzz Black. Better get over to Comanche Gulch, Jace. Yeah. Thanks, Sheriff. Sure, glad to be of service. Well, we're going to be able to tell Morath who's been using his name. We don't have to tell him. I got a hunch he already knows. What makes you say that? Black didn't go back to pick up that check. Somebody warned him those cattle were getting hot. That means Morath. But if he's in on it, why would he let Black use his name? Because he's smart. False signature makes him look like an innocent victim. His reputation is good. And as soon as we went to him, he knew we were on the trail, and he told Black and the others to lay low. Right. Let's get Black for a start. to death while you were running off some of his cattle with an elbow. Me? Are you crazy? I don't you got three people who can identify you. man who bought the calves, banker who cashed a check, and the commissioner who bought the steers in Fort Worth. All right. So what? I, I found the cattle out of the camp foot. You I, don't I... find cattle with a brand on them. They weren't mavericks. You better talk to them. I'll talk when I see a lawyer. You wait that long and the wrath will run out and you'll be facing it alone. That old rancher was murdered. I didn't shoot him. I, I swear, Ranger. No jury's going to believe you. Unless you tell us who did it. We find the gun he used. Well, all right. All right. It was Moran. He started the whole thing. It was his idea. Who rode with you? One folks from here. Six from Moran's place. What's that? Why are they taking off in a brush, Chase? Stop! No! Too late. He made cover. Isn't the Morath Ranch over that way, Black? Yeah, yeah, that was my rider. Must have sneaked up and hurt us. I'm going to handcuff you to this wagon. Well, now, wait a minute. I... We'll be back for you later. Come on, Kurtz. They'll know we're coming on. They'll scatter, Chase. Better call headquarters for more units. We put through the call and headed for Morath's Ranch in a car, hoping to beat the rider. They must have stopped on the way and phoned the ranch because the ranch was clear when we got there. Ah, uh, they cleared out, Chase. Better get the horses out of the trailer and start tracking. Wait a minute, Fritz. Look at this driver. Funny marks. Yeah. Brush trailing behind a truck to wipe out the tracks. I've seen that before. And this is fresh. The branch caught in the edge of that mesquite when they turned into the road. It snapped it. The brake is new. That means they're heading for the highway. Probably all riding together in the truck, moving an arsenal on wheels. Come on. Units we called for can set up roadblocks and converge. Unit 10 to KTXA. Unit 10 to KTXA. KTXA to Unit 10. Go ahead. Subjects wanted for killing of Maury Buckler making getaway in cattle truck from Morath Ranch at Rollo. Check license numbers of vehicles registered to Morath. We'll do, Unit 10. Subjects headed for Main Highway will probably turn south toward closest border point. Unit 10 and Unit 6 headed that way. Have other units converge on area and set up roadblocks with highway patrol. Units 3 and 8 nearby. We'll notify them. We'll make direct contacts with units as we close in. Unit 10, 10 4. Hertz, you can commandeer the sheriff's radio car in town. Give us a chance to spread out. It's going to be like tackling a tank, Jace. Yeah. Break out a Tommy gun and put it on the seat. in from all points. There were no side roads that weren't covered by our units. Or and his were locked in our ring. I kept my foot heavy on the gas pedal. Then far ahead as I approached the intersection of State 12, I saw the truck dip over a rise. Unit 10 to Unit 3. Unit 10 to Unit 3. Unit 3, go ahead, Unit 10. Subject's truck less than a mile ahead of Unit 10, nearing intersection point your area. Ready for them, Unit 10. Unit 6 to Unit 10. Go ahead, Unit 6. Unit 6 now on Main Highway, south of intersection. Block Highway at that point, Unit 6. Subjects are between Unit 6 and Unit 10 now, unless they turn off. Unit 3 has reached intersection point of State 12. We'll block off intersection. Good, Unit 3. 
Unit 8 has blocked still further south and subject to break through. I drew close at the speeding truck as the helicopter rides and headed down toward the intersection of the state highway. I can see the sheriff's car, Kurtz had borrowed, blocking the road. Unit 3's car in the center of the turnoff. The truck skidded and started to make a turn and come back for us. I swung my car across the road, grabbed the Tommy gun and jumped out. can tell if it's the one that killed Buckler. He'll be the one, all right. Or he wouldn't have tried so hard to keep us from getting him. Big Morath's rifle was positively identified as the one used in the slaying of Rancho Mori Buckler. Buzz Black and the other men who had assisted Murad were given penitentiary sentences ranging from 20 to 99 years. And now, here's the Wheaties man, Frank Martin. Another triumph for the Rangers, and another grand performance by our distinguished star, Mr. Joe McRae. And here he is with a few words for you personally about National Wheaties Week. I hope you're enjoying Tales of the Texas Rangers. And it would give me a whole lot of pleasure, partner, if I thought you'd go out and get a box of Wheaties tomorrow because of our program. Since it's National Wheaties Week, it's a pretty good time to get those Wheaties. Will you do that? Good night. Good night, Joel. No, Wheaties and I were going to send you a free case of Wheaties. But uh, then we thought, oh, that's silly. Joel McRae eats Wheaties, so chances are his kitchen shelf is loaded. And what National Wheaties Week is really for is to get other people to eat Wheaties. Frankly, folks, it's to get you to know and appreciate the fact that there's a whole kernel of wheat in every Wheaties plate. That's right, a whole kernel of wheat in every Wheaties plate. National Wheaties Week is for you to find Wheaties and try them and see for yourself. Now, Wheaties at 7 can help at 11. So, no free Wheaties to you, Joel. No, you can buy them just like all the rest of them. Right, folks? Don't forget, breakfast of champions. Come on, everybody, to the Wheaties party. Eat a lot of Wheaties like the champions do. Dance together cheek to cheek. This is National Wheaties Week. Eat a lot of Wheaties like the champions do. Wheaties at breakfast the champions. Next week, Joel McRae in another authentic reenactment of a case from the files of the Texas Rangers. Joel McRae will soon be seen starring in the Universal International Technicolor production, Saddle Trend. Tonight's cast included Tony Barrett, Tom Sully, Bert Holland, Joe Duval, Byron Kane, Paul Dubuff, and Bob Cole. This story was transcribed and adapted by Joel Murcott, and the program was produced and directed by Stacy Keach. Hal Gibney speaking. And this is the Wheaties man, Frank Martin, inviting you to listen on Wednesday night to Brian Donlevy in Dangerous Assignment on the Wheaties Big Parade. See you then. And remember, it's National Wheaties Week. Tomorrow, Sam Spade cuts a caper and Robert Merrill sings on NBC.
The Dennis Day Show returns to the air at this hour of the first week in October. Remember the Dennis Day Show beginning here October 7th. Presenting Joel McRae in Tales of the Texas Rangers. On stage tonight, transcribed from Hollywood, another in NBC's parade of exciting half-hour presentations. Tales of the Texas Rangers, starring Joel McRae as Ranger Pearson. Texas, more than 260,000 square miles. And 50 men who make up the most famous and oldest law enforcement body in North America. the Texas Rangers come these stories based on fact. Only names, dates, and places are fictitious for obvious reasons. The events themselves are a matter of record. Tonight's case, play for Keats. past midnight on December 12th, several years ago, Sheriff Bob Smithers of Bradshaw County, Texas, staged a raid on a gambling establishment located on the country road. But there were no patrons in the house, and the sheriff's face grew dark red as he and the local constable failed to find any evidence. Nothing in the upstairs room either, Sheriff. You're sure of that, huh, Jim? Not even a deck of cards. See, Sheriff, like I told you, I quit the racket. Yet this is the fourth time this year you rousted me out of bed. I know you're operating, Walton. And I'm going to get you for it. You're not going to milk the citizens of this county. Not while I'm sheriff. Look, sheriff, this happens to be my house. Warrant or no warrant, you finished your business here. How about getting out? I guess we might as well go, sheriff. No, Jim. We're going to stay a minute. I want to talk to Walton. And you. About what? I was sure of this raid tonight, Jim. Dead sure. Just like I've been sure the last three times, because only you and me ever knew about him. I didn't tell nobody but you, Jim. You, the constable. <laughs> Sounds like he's accusing you of tipping me off, Dunn. I know he tipped you, Walton. You better watch what you're saying, Pop. All that talk about law and order and wanting to uphold him. Let me see your wallet, Jim. Take it out and let me see it. Now, wait a minute, Sheriff. You shut up. Come on, Jim. I want to see if you're carrying the kind of money an honest man gets for being a peace officer. What I carry on me is my own business. Why, you cheap two-bit snake. Nothing cheap about a few hundred once in a while. Be smart, Sheriff. Get a few for yourself. Why don't you listen to him, Sheriff? He's talking sense. Come on, both of you. I'm taking you. You can't make anything stick. Maybe not. But I'm going to make this county too hot for both of you. I'm going to run you out of it. Take your hands off me, Sheriff. You're up for a race. Get out of here. Killed him. No, 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 you killed him. You grabbed his gun and killed him. He was after you, Walter. I got a gun of my own, and I'm the constable. Are you set me up for a frame? Not necessarily, Walton. It's up to you. His body could be moved out of here. What's your play? What do you want? No more chicken mash. Fifty percent of your take, and you can go right on operating. With him dead, you crazy fool? You're forgetting something, Walton. I'm top dog now. And investigating this murder will be my job until a new sheriff is appointed. <laughs> but I don't think I'm going to be able to solve it. The body of Sheriff Smithers was found the next morning, dumped in a ditch by the side of an old wagon road. During the next few days, Constable Jim Dunn conducted a seemingly honest but fruitless investigation, even following the efficient peace officer's routine of making use of the state lab facilities at Austin. But citizens of Bradshaw were not satisfied, nor was the editor of the Bradshaw Times. Clippings of his editorials were on file with Captain Stinson of the Texas Rangers, and the captain sent for Ranger Jace Pearson. Want to see me, Captain? Yeah, Jace, sit down. There's no acting sheriff appointed by the court of Bradshaw County here, Jace. 
I think you better take over. About the killing of Sheriff Smithers? Mm -hmm. I'd like to. I knew Smithers. See, that's right. You worked with him about five years ago. When he first took office. Cleaned that county up in three months and cleaned it good. Well, it doesn't look like it stayed clean, Jace. Not according to this editorial clipping from the Bradshaw Times. Yeah, I've read it. It's going to be a tough one, Jace. No clue to the killer, and the trail has had a couple of days to cool off. <laughs> well, then I'd better get going before it gets any cooler. You'll hear from me. Oh, uh, Jace. Yeah, Captain. I just want to remind you, whoever did it doesn't hesitate to kill a man wearing a badge. <laughs> Bradshaw in the early morning. The town was waking up where Bradshaw Times was turning out its bi-weekly edition. I went in to see the editor, Frank Carlin. So you read my editorials, huh? Well, I'm glad no somebody's reading. <laughs> you got readers all right. People been clipping them out and mailing them into our headquarters. Yeah, I guess there's always a handful of people who uh, wonder what the world would do without them. Everybody was so burned the day of the killing. Then in 48 hours, they won't forget it. Mm -hmm. It's always that one. How about the constable, Jim Dunn? Oh, he's all right, I guess. But he's only been constable for a year. He just doesn't have the experience. It'll take the court a couple more days to decide on a new show. I better knock out a story on your rangers coming in. Might wake the people up again. I'd rather you didn't, Mr. Carlin. I'll, I'll be around, and they'll know soon enough. Mm -hmm. See what you mean. You want me to lay off the editorials for a while? If you don't mind. You know, Sheriff and I are on different sides of the fence politically, but he was an honest man and I like him. I got a headline back there all set and gathering dust. It says, Sheriff's Killer Caught. Ranger, give me a chance to use it. <laughs> to park my horse trailer and put charcoal in a pasture. Then I headed to the constable's office and met Constable Jim Dunn. There are all the reports in my investigations, Ranger. You think I haven't done a good job, maybe those have changed your mind. I even checked ballistics with the Austin lab. My being here isn't a criticism of you, Mr. Dunn. I'm here because I was sent until a new sheriff was appointed and to give you help. I've done everything possible. I've questioned almost a hundred people. I've checked alibis on more than a dozen possible suspects. It's all there. Yeah. Everything's here. Everything except the murderer. And that's the only thing I'm interested in seeing, Mr. Dunn. A little cooperation between us might clean it up. I'm... I'm sorry I blew, Ranger. It's been getting under my skin. This murder could have been committed by anybody. Some bum from a hobo jungle, some drunk anybody. We can't arrest anybody. We've got to arrest somebody. Somebody definite. Now, exactly where was the body found? Old wagon road bypasses town about two miles north. Is it good for a car? Yeah, but you've got to go round about to get to it. Almost 11 miles. You won't find nothing there. Though. I'd like to take a look anyhow. Can't we cut cross country on horses? Yeah, shorter if you want. I want to. Horses in a pasture. I'll meet you at the edge of town in five minutes. It was found just a little further on. You can see the road now. Not much of a road left. Uh, no use for it anymore. The sheriff must have had some reason for using it if he came way out here. Hey, here we are. Move. Move. Move, Charco. The sheriff's car was found right over here by the side of the road. Where was he? Lying right beside him. Been dead about seven, eight hours when he was found. Who found him? Cowpoke looking for some strays. It's lucky. Otherwise, the body might have been here for a few days or even weeks before somebody came across it. Yeah. You get pictures of the position of the car and the body? Of course I did. Anything else? Yeah. Any exhibits? Cast the footprints? Anything like that? Uh, no. When I got the call, I brought a bunch of men out with me. I was excited, and I didn't think to stop them from tramping around. I see why you'd be upset. Well, if there was anything to find, it's a cinch it isn't here now. Whether well, would have wiped it out if your men hadn't. You want to go back to town? Yeah. I want to look at the car. 
How about the exhibits from the sheriff's body? I sent the bullets and the gun in. Your lab checked it. Verified it was the sheriff's own gun. I'm talking about the clothes he was wearing. You've got those, haven't you? Sure I got it. I got all the evidence there was. You should have sent it all in. I want to look at that stuff, too. Well, uh, let's step it up. Come on, Chuck. Hey, get up, get up. Sheriff was wearing when he was killed. I see. This the shirt he was wearing? You see the blood and bullet holes, don't you? Yeah. How come your lab didn't find any prints on the gun when I sent it in? Didn't even have the sheriff's own prints. It was wiped clean. Hmm. Well, this is kind of odd. What? Well, the sheriff was shot twice, and they dug one slug out of him. The other one passed clean through. Yeah, according to the coroner's report... One slug hit his collarbone. That stopped it. Yeah, that's what I mean. The course of the bullets. Both shots fired into the left side, just above the kidney. But the one that came through came out the right side of his shirt collar here, right through his neck. What about it? Well, it's a funny course for a bullet to take, unless the man who fired the gun was lying down and fired up at the sheriff. Yeah, 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 that's what I figured, too. They must have had a fight for the gun. He got it, but the sheriff knocked him down and... No, no, that isn't the way it happened. How do you know? Because the sheriff wouldn't half turn his back on a man who'd just taken his gun. Besides, these powder burns show the gun was being held right against the shirt when it was fired. What do you think happened, Bill? Well, the sheriff must have been in some position where he was bent over forward, which he wouldn't be unless somebody was holding him in that position. Here, stand in front of me for a minute. Now you're back toward me. What are you going to do? Slip one hand under your arms and then up behind your head in a half Nelson. Twist your other arm behind you in an arm lock. And bend you over forward like this. The sheriff was held like I'm holding you now. And the bullets were pumped in. See what I mean? Now that That's just a guess. It's a guess I'm going to back up. If the sheriff was held in a half Nelson and an arm lock, it tells us something else. That there were two men in on the murder. Unless the killer had three hands and used the third one to fire the gun. That's a pretty smart figure, Ranger. Only because it's the kind of figure I've been doing for a long time. Okay. Are these the photos that were taken at the scene? Yeah. The sheriff's body and the car. And the car the body moved any before these were taken? Nope. The car was right there. With the sheriff flat on his face beside him. And less than two feet away from him. His right side toward the car. Yeah. The bullet that passed through the sheriff came out on his right side. That means it should have hit the car. But there's no mark. I don't see it. That helps us in. It helps plenty, Dunn. It tells us the sheriff wasn't killed out there. He was killed someplace else and brought out there. Listening to Tales of the Texas Rangers, starring Joel McRae as Ranger Chase Pearson. Now we continue with tonight's case, Play for Keeps, an authentic story from the files of the Texas Rangers. I knew that Sheriff Smithers had been killed by two men, but his body had been moved after the killing. But it wasn't nearly enough. It was evening before I figured out my next move. A move I didn't like to make. Evening, ma'am. Remember me? Why, it's Jace Pearson, isn't it? Yes, ma'am. Been a long time, Mrs. Smithers. Oh, come in, Jace. Come in. I... I, I suppose you know about Bob. Yes, ma'am. And that's why I'm down here came by to pay my respects. Funny thing. First time Bob brought you through that door. I never reckoned you might be back someday. Looking for a man who killed him. I wish it could have been for another reason, man. Bob kept things working so well here, there seldom was any reason for a ranger to come visiting Bradshaw County. 
I know I like it. Fellas, keep working along. Can I offer you a bite to eat? Please, Jace. Well, that'd be real fine, Miss Smithers. I knew it might help her and me if she could keep a little busy with her hands doing human things in the kitchen. And I tried to eat. I kept remembering the man who'd sat across the same table from me five years before. Big, honest, stubborn, and unafraid. It's mighty nice of you to stop by, Jace. Bob would have been happy to see you sitting here again. He always said a man with a good appetite was right with the world. Ma'am, I guess Jim Dunn has already asked you, but do you have any ideas about who might have killed Bob? Well, no. Everything went so well for a few years. All I know is last year or so, Bob was upset about gambling. Yeah, for anybody in particular? A man named Walton, Blue Walton, has a big house on the south road out of town. Bob always says it was a gambling house, but he could never catch Walton. You mean he raided the place? A couple of times. Last time was the night he was killed. Dunn didn't tell me about that. Bob was killed after he left there. Walton did Dunn said they didn't find anything, so Bob started back to town. But he never got home. Mrs. Smithers, hmm? I have to ask a favor. A favor I don't like to ask. I want to help, Jace, every way I can. I want your permission to have Bob's body exhumed for further examination. Is it necessary? I'm not satisfied with the examination that was made here. All right, Jace. I'd like to have a more thorough examination made for headquarters. I'm sending them the clothes Bob was wearing for lab check. I don't want anybody to know about it for now. All right. You're going to get him, aren't you, Jace? I'm going to try off of mine. Well, howdy, Ranger. Been waiting for you. Thought maybe you might have turned in for the night. I'm going to in a few minutes. I just came back to pick up the clothing exhibits. Well, you're not locked away again. I'll dig them out. I want to send them on to Camp Mabry for lab tests. Well, all right. I'll give you a receipt. Okay. Don. Yeah? In those reports of yours, I didn't see any mention of a man named Lou Walton. Why should there be? I understand that Walton's a gambler and that you helped Smithers raid his place the night Smithers was killed. I hear the exhibits. Guess we can weigh out a line on Walton. His alibi is airtight. According to who? According to me. I was with him all night, after Smithers left the place. You didn't come back to town with the sheriff? No, I stayed at Walton. Why? Because the sheriff asked me to stay. We didn't find anything, but the sheriff figured if I hung around, somebody might show up or call up looking for a game. And I'd be able to get him some evidence. Uh, anything else you want to know? No, I guess that lets Walton out. I'll take these things. Sure, go ahead. See you tomorrow, Don. Oak Hill, 243. Hello? Walton? Done. Now get those people out and shut down. Why? What's wrong? That range is too smart. I tried to make things look good for myself, and well, I guess I made them look too good. How much does he know? All he's going to know. You just close down and stand pat until he wears himself out. The sheriff's body was dug up and the examiner's report sent on to Austin. Headquarters also had the exhibits I'd gotten from Dunn. By late afternoon of the next day, Captain Stinson telephoned me long distance. Got a complete report from the lab, Jace. Go ahead, Captain. You were right about the position of the body when the shots were fired. Autopsy report shows the organs were pierced in a manner that would be possible only if the sheriff were bent over forward. Good. Anything else? Yeah. That shirt you set up. Lab thinks Smithers was killed indoors. 
Why? Some lead stuck to the blood and held when it dried. Analysis indicates it comes from a fabric used in expensive carpeting. Violet color. Thanks, Captain. That may be enough to wind this up. Then you're convinced that Walton was running a gambling joint, Mr. Collins. Was and is. I swear to it. And who but have been able to prove it? You know how suckers are. They lose their shirts and keep their mouths shut. Plank they're in on a smart thing and they help the racketeers to cover up. Then Walton must have been tipped off that he was being raided. Part of the racket. They pay off and get tipped off. You ever been in Walton's house? No. You know anybody who has been there? Well, it's no secret the newspaper men gamble no one's good for him. My night type man plays horses, I know. Uh, but pay. Be there in a minute. Howdy, Ranger. Howdy. Uh, Pete, you ever been in Lou Walton's place? Come on, I don't stall. Tell the Ranger it's important. Well, well, yeah, I've been there once or twice. I only want to know one thing. You notice any carpeting in the house? Carpeting? Oh, sure, the house is like a palace. Wall-to-wall carpet all over the place. What color? Well, it's a kind of a purple, I'd say. How about saying violet? Yeah, yeah, I guess that's what it's called. You've got something, Ranger? Yeah, I'm going to wake up the nearest judge and get a search warrant for Walton. You better brush the dust off that headline you told me about. I think you're going to get a chance to use it. I was wondering when you get around to me, Ranger. Seems like everybody who wears a badge just loves to poke his nose into my life. I wouldn't worry about your nose, Walton. If you want to be smart, watch out for your mouth. I didn't mean anything, Ranger. Just that a man ought to, well, ought to have a little privacy. You love the death cells at Huntsville. They're real private. Well, I, I always cooperated. Constable Jim Dunn, he'll tell you that. I bet he will. Nice carpeting you got here. I like the color. Yeah. Yeah, I... Hey, let me get you a drink or something, Ranger. All good stuff. I don't have anything but the best. <laughs> you know the old saying, the best is none too good. Walton, there's been a strong cleaning fluid used on a piece of this rug. One spot faded just a little. Well, I, I spilled some wine. I had a party one night. The night the Sheriff Smithers was here last? No. No, before that. Oh, oh that's right. I forgot. Nobody was here the night Smithers came. No. No, nobody. The, uh, the constable, he stayed. Stayed most of the night after the sheriff left. Yeah, so he told me. Uh, let me show you the rest of the house. Upstairs. No, thanks. I just want to look at the walls in this room. Sure pretty. You know, at Huntsville, they don't have pretty walls like these. Just old concrete and steel bars. What do you keep talking about Huntsville? I'll tell you, since I stand up on this chair... Rip off this new piece of wallpaper. Dogs, they have no right to. Just looking for this small bullet hole, papered over. Of course, you know that one bullet went right through the shell. The hole was repapered because a heavy picture fell. The nail made the hole. Thirty-eight caliber nail. I'm gonna have this rug ripped up and sent to my lab, Walter. No cleaning fluid made will wipe out all of the blood trace. Even a drop is enough to hang you. I didn't do it, I tell you. Dunn shot him. It was done. Dunn shot him. Hold your wrists out. You'll never get those on me. That's wrong this time, gambling. Now get up. I'm taking you in. I took him through town to the county jail. I walked over to the constable's office, but Dunn wasn't there. I had to find him quick before he knew I had walked. I headed back to the jail, and as I turned into the street, I saw something move in the shadows. There was another car, not far from mine, the constable's car, and Dunn was getting into it. Unit 10 to KTXA. Unit 10 to KTXA. 
ATX 80, Unit 10. Go ahead, Unit 10. Unit 10 convinced Constable Jim Dunn is subject sought in killing of Sheriff Smithers, Bradshaw County. Attempting getaway headed north on State Highway 19 from Bradshaw. Alert Highway Patrol and all units for complete roadblock of area. Order no further radio communication. Subject in Constable's marked car, equipped with shortwave receiver. We'll do, Unit 10. Unit 10's car out of commission. We'll attempt to commandeer another car for pursuit. Unit 10, 10-4. ADXA, Austin. Let's hope Dunn heard that call. You'll be partners again at Huntsville. The following week, the headlines of the Bradshaw Times read, Sheriff Killers Caught. Though Jim Dunn protested his innocence, Lou Walton's confession and evidence submitted by the Rangers convinced the court of Dunn's guilt. Both were sentenced to life imprisonment at Huntsville. This is Joel McRae. In the 125 years since their organization was founded, the Texas Rangers have written many new pages into the history of law enforcement. With only a handful of men in a vast territory, they have never failed to live up to their slogan, first to advance, never retreat. That is the creed a Ranger follows. And they have a belief that was impressed on me by one of their officers. A belief that often brings them victory over tremendous odds. In the words of the Texas Rangers, a man who is wrong can't stand up to a man who is right and keep on coming. Next week, we bring you another exciting case taken from the files of the Texas Rangers. Hope you'll be listening. Good night. Next week, Joel McRae in another authentic reenactment of a case from the files of the Texas Rangers. Joel McRae is currently seen starring in the MGM production, Stars in My Crown. This story was transcribed and adapted by Joel Murcott, and the program was produced and directed by Stacy Keach. This is Hal Gibney speaking. Three chimes mean good times on NBC. In just five weeks, Dennis Day and Judy Canova bring back their two delightful programs in an hour of fun for all on Saturday nights.
This weekend, 400 Americans have a holiday date with death. Stay off the list. Be careful. This is NBC, the national broadcasting company. Presenting Joel McRae as Jace Pearson in Tales of the Texas Rangers. Tales of the Texas Rangers, authentic stories from their official files. Texas, more than 260,000 square miles. And 50 men who make up the most famous and oldest law enforcement body in North America. Texas Rangers come these stories based on fact. Only names, dates, and places are fictitious for obvious reasons. The events themselves are a matter of record. Tonight's transcribed case, dead or alive. At exactly 9.13 a.m. on Wednesday, April 16, 1947, the French freighter Grand Camp, carrying a highly explosive cargo of ammonium nitrate fertilizer, blew up in the harbor of Texas City, Texas. It was the first in a chain of explosions as chemical plants, tin smelters, and oil refineries disappeared in blasts and flame. Shortly after 1 a.m. the next morning, the major chain reaction was set off. The explosions rocking the city of Galveston, 10 miles across the bay, where excited crowds gathered in the streets watching the raging, flame pierced sky. X-ray, X-ray, Texas City death toll, 300, hundreds more missing, scores of bodies unidentified. Paper, mister? Yeah, give me one. Here. Read about it, unidentified dead toll, still bothered, give me one. Where are the names, Vance? Where's the list of the dead? Well, they only got a few of them identified. Well, is Ralph's name there? Wait a minute. No, no, he's probably all right. Oh. A working square like him would be. But he worked in one of the refineries that burned him. Stop blubbering. Want to attract attention to me? No. No, Vance, no, but... He is my brother. i got to worry about him, too, don't I? Yeah, yeah. Come on, over here into this doorway. Look at that blaze over there across the bay. What a spot to clean up. Money, jewelry must be laying around the streets. Just but wait. Vance, aren't you crazy? There'll be police there. Rangers, you're in enough trouble now. Yeah. Yeah, Lily, you're right. But I'm getting out of it now, for good. And that place over there is going to do it. Maybe your brother Ralph is one of the dead they haven't identified. You got to go there, baby. If he is, you'll have to identify him. If he is there, in with the ones they don't know. There's nothing you can do to help him. But you can help me. That's what you mean. Well, if you find him there, baby, you can identify the body and say it's mine. Thanks. You want me in the clear, don't you, baby? Chasing after me if they think I'm dead, don't you see? But my own brother, what are you asking me to do? I'm asking you to do as you're told. If you want to walk out of me, go ahead. But if you don't, you don't want me to keep on running for the rest of my life. Or let them get me and send me to Huntsville for 10 to 20. Oh, I don't want anything to happen to you, man. You know that. Well, then show me, baby. Show me. You can't help out with over there, but you can't help me, don't you see? I'll get out of here tonight. And I'll let you know when to meet me. Maybe at that resort place we passed near Lake Blue Water. It'll be free, baby. You and me, free from there on. But how? What'll we do for money? Uh, that'll be taken care of, too. There's a safe in Land's home. I've been itching to get it for a long time. One last box shot, baby, and enough to see us through. Now go ahead, right now. And remember, if you find your brother, he ain't Ralph Brenner, he's me, Vance Young. And come back, pack up, and stay put till you hear from me. From then on, it's gravy. Nobody ever arrests a dead man. By Friday morning, April 18th, more than 200 bodies, many still unidentified, were laid out in the Texas City High School gymnasium. Texas Rangers, including Ranger Jace Pearson, were on hand to help distraught relatives make identification. sure your husband isn't in any of the other places where bodies are being killed? No. No, Ranger. He, he may be all right. Lots of men have been so busy helping others, he, he may be one of those. Oh, if only he isn't here. Let's hope he isn't. Here. 
bombers are still working on more bodies over at McGar's garage. It's the only place handy. Keep your hopes up. Don't hope too much for a while. I'll be all right. Might as well start looking through this next row now. They're pretty bad cases. Recognize anything on this one? No. This? No. Check the body for prints and marks. Oh, you got it too badly. She identified him by a ring. Unidentified bodies give a knob knocker like Young a big chance to disappear. I thought of that too. Except for one thing. That woman's grief was real. She wasn't faking it. A week passed. A week of horror and nightmares. Till the fires in Texas City were controlled and stopped. And men with tight lips and grim courage started to rebuild the ruins. Most of us rangers went back to regular duty in our regular areas. Then one day, when Bud Kurtz and I had just finished a routine job and were driving back to headquarters, a call came through by a short wave. KTXA to Unit 10. KTXA to Unit 10. Unit 10 to KTXA. Go ahead, KTXA. Unit 10, proceed immediately to Landstone, Texas, Arthur County. Safe of Mercantile Store burglarized there at 4 a.m. today. Crime reported by owner when store opened at 9.30 a.m. to state. Any lead on responsible subject? Subject unidentified, but known to be one man working alone, according to information given by Watchman. Watchman was overpowered, being treated by Landstone Emergency Hospital. Units 10 and 6 proceeding to Landstone. Keep KTXA informed. Unit 10, 10-4. Assignment authority, Captain Stinson. KTXA Austin. Landstone, about 40 miles, Chase. Yeah. Knob knocking job, huh? Yeah. At least, though, there's one safe specialist we can eliminate right from scratch on this one. Who? Vance Young. Oh, yeah, I almost forgot about him. Dead men don't rob safes, do they? We reached the Landstone Mercantile store at 11.15, and Sheriff Joe Pastroni showed us through. Well, these back rooms are used for storage. He came in through the back, went through that door over there to the general office. That's where the safe is. How'd he get into the building? Of course, the watchman alone. The watchman patrols this whole area, door shape. He has keys to get into all the stores if he sees anything that looks funny. Well, then he must have met the safe cracker outside. Yeah, I guess so. The watchman was pretty dazed this morning. The doctor's patching him up in the hospital. The deputy will drive him back here as soon as his head's fixed. Well, as you can see, 
Looking over everything for fingerprints. You find any? Sure, hundreds. They probably all belong to employees of the store. The best bet is to check the prints on the safe first. Already did that. Only two sets. Owner of the store and the book. Well, that won't tell us anything, Jase, unless one of them robbed the store. It isn't likely. Better have a look at the safe now, Sheriff. Sure thing. I will just talk back. What make is the safe, Sheriff? It's uh, Will's Atlas. Hmm. It's a tough box, Jase. Steel and wrought iron plates and more alarm wires and a marionette show. Yeah, but a good safe cracker could divert the alarm circuit without tripping it. And the box is a cinch because he's got the wire hose to start working on it. Yeah, yeah. You figured it, Jace. Back plate blown clean out. Yeah, didn't even have to drill. Small nitro charges and the wire hose, and it was as good as having the combination. Here's where he jumped the alarm circuit. Neat hookup, all right. You take the pictures of all this, Sheriff? Yeah, I can pick up a set of my office if you like. Thanks. Oh, wait. Howdy, Sheriff. Rangers. Oh, wait, boy. Now, this is a watchman. How's your hit it? Well, Ashman ain't gonna help it any, I'll tell you that. You gonna get the frog? I'll be able to answer that better when the fingerprints are checked. Fingerprints? He ain't gonna find any he left. He's wearing gloves. The figure, Chase. Yeah. Tell me, Winky. Would you recognize the man if you saw him again? Could you pick out his picture? Yeah. If had his picture took with a sack over his head, I could. That ain't likely. You mean his face was covered? If a sack over his head, like I told you. Holes for the eyes. You ain't gonna catch him by no fingerprints or pictures. Hey, if you ain't gonna catch him at all. Oh, I wouldn't say that, Winky. Uh, Sheriff, would you mind going down to your office for prints of the pictures of the scene here? I'd like them sent on to my headquarters for an M.O. check. I right, sure. Take care of it right away. Uh, uh, what kind of check is it, M.O. check, Ranger? It means modus operandi, Winky. All criminals have definite methods and habits. They're repeated on each job they do. Forms a pattern. Well, there's sure a pattern here, all right, Jace. Method of entry, where that circuit was jumped, sack mask, nitro charge, and a wire hole. Mm -hmm. And it fits three men. Three safe crackers we followed before. Yeah, just Bird Larkin. He's still doing time in Folsom for a job he pulled on the coast. Yeah. And the other two are Jack Fontaine and Vance Young. Yeah, but Young is dead. That leaves us Fontaine. You, you mean you know who did it? Well, without nothing to tell you? Mm, plenty to tell. The modus operandi can be almost as good as a fingerprint or a signature. Big wind. Maybe that fellow's gonna pay off for slugging me after all. And for hurting my arm when he grabbed me in the alley there. How'd he grab me? Show me. Go ahead, show me. It, on you? Huh? Uh, let's see. He whipped my arm up behind me like this. Then he jabbed a thumb up behind my ear like this. <laughs> sure hurts, don't it? Sure does. Now you can let go now. Judo still fits Fontaine, Jason. Yeah. Or Vance Young. He used the two on other jobs. When did he slug you? Uh, uh, after he, he made me open up the back door and let him in. He sneaked up on you before you could draw your gun? Sneaked nothing. That's why I didn't get on to him at first. I heard him come walking through the alley toward me like he's taking a shortcut. You heard him? Yeah, it was dark. So I didn't see the mask until I lit a match. He asked for a light, see? Then he grabbed me. Inside here and, and beat on me and kick me. Chase, that doesn't sound like Fontaine. It wasn't Fontaine. He always sneaked a watchman from behind and they never heard him. He always wore sneakers. Oh, who? Vance Young. That match trick is Vance Young's. But Young is dead. Maybe yes, maybe no. But I know one thing. I'm going to find out. <laughs> You are listening to Tales of the Texas Rangers, starring Joel McRae as Ranger Jace Pearson. And now, we continue with tonight's case, Dead or Alive, an authentic story from the files of the Texas Rangers. I headed for Texas City in Galveston. Kurtz and I had no way to move until we knew for certain whether Vance Young was dead or alive. As we drove, I put through a request for headquarters to dig up some information. We were still on the road when KTXA came up with the answers. KTXA, unit 
check on place where body identified as Vance Young was originally found. Body was among those recovered from debris of amalgamated refinery plant 7. Unit 10 believes identification may have been falsified. Possibility Vance Young still alive. Units 10 and 6 continuing investigation. May be tied in with robbery in Landstone, Texas. Proceed. Keep KDXA informed. Authority, Captain Stinson. Unit 10, 10-4. You get that address, Kurtz? Yeah. 410 Harbor Lane, Galveston. If we're right, she may have cleared out by now. We've got to try it. What do you want me to do? I'll drop you at Texas City. Get that ring and check every living person who worked at Amalgamated. See if any of them remember that ring and the man who wore it. Right. You better call KTXA again and have that marriage record traced. Find out when and where that woman married young. What her maiden name was, everything we can get. We'll be in Texas City in a couple of minutes. I can start the check from there and bring the information to you where we meet. The Harbor Lane address in Galveston. I found the rooming house Lillian and Vance Young had lived in, but I was too late. Lillian Young had checked out the day before. The landlord showed me the room. They, uh, they lived here. Five, six months, all told. You get to know the husband very well? I'll tell you the truth, Ranger. I hardly ever saw him. Only time he ever left the place was at night. The wife said his eyes got hurt in the war or something. The, the sunlight bothered him. When did you see him last? When they moved out? No, no. He, he wasn't with her then. Last I saw him was, uh... Oh, he went out about a week ago. Night of the big blast over at Texas City. Crack the wall plaster here. Are you sure you didn't see him after that? Oh, I'm positive. I, I don't think he ever did come back. Didn't even hear no talking from the room. Just, just her. Crying an awful lot. I see. Did she decide to leave kind of sudden? Oh, like a jackrabbit here and a hound dog. Left for work yesterday morning. Came steaming back about an hour later. Give me the keys. Pack up and left. Came back from work. You know where she went? Yeah, yeah, she was a waitress. The uh, uh, Bayshore Diner. Bayshore Diner. Thanks. Throw she up and quit on it just like that yesterday morning. Right smack in the middle of a breakfast rush, too. Because the postman come in and give her a special delivered letter. Who is it from? Who is it from? With 20 orders of ham man in the fire, I got time to read a mail? All I know is she leaves me the serving, the dishes, and the cleaning. Oh, everything. stop beefing, Chuck. That little old gal had trouble. Yeah, yeah, you should talk. All you've got to do is drive one cab. You won't have the serving and the dishes and the cleaning and everything. you find yourself a little old chaplain to hear your troubles and give me some coffee? Come on. Okay, okay. Maybe you can tell a ranger more about Lil than I can. Hanging around her, making eyes at her all day. You took her out when she left. All right, driver. Did she leave here with you? Well, she hired my cab, but that's what you mean. Where'd you take her? Well, I took her home. Waited while she packed some things, then rushed her to the bus depot. She said somebody in her family was sick, and she had to go help them right away. I guess that's what the letter was about. <laughs> I was sitting here having my breakfast like I always do, and I... Yeah, I, yeah, I understand. What about the bus depot? You know what bus she caught? The northbound toward San Antonio. Cut it mighty fine, too. Got there just about a minute before the bus pulled out. Would have made it a lot easier if she didn't make me come dashing back about a mile after we left here. Back here to the diner? No, back to the laundry down the street. Guess she had some stuff in there. Although, she didn't bring a bundle out with her. And then on top of that, she says she can't pee. Not that I'd mind, except for the ten extra blocks back to the laundry. I could have put the flag back up as she told me beforehand. You say the laundry's right down the street? Yeah, about half a block. Thanks. I'll walk now. Hey, Jake! Hi, Kurtz. Fellow at the rooming house told me you came down here. Find out anything on that ring? 
Plenty. A couple of men who worked at Amalgamator recognized it. A local plant man named Ralph Brenner. And it wasn't Young. No. I got that rundown on Young's wife. Her maiden name was Lillian Brenner. The guy she identified was her brother, not her husband. And that's why she was broken up. I knew that part wasn't an act. Come on. Where are we going? We're going into the laundry business. Yeah, she was real upset because the things wasn't ready, but you know how it was, Ranger. We was almost ten days behind because of Texas City. They was even using our delivery trucks for emergency over there. Some of our men left the job to help out. Yeah, yeah, sure, but uh, what did she leave here? Waitress uniforms? Oh, land, no. Diner up there has a regular uniform service. All she ever left here was men's shirts. Probably Vance's shirts, Chase. Yeah. Uh, real good shirts, too, Ranger. The kind you don't have to starch at all. And real fancy colors, too. Dude wouldn't want to be found dead in some of them. Did she say she'd be back to pick them up? Oh, no. She, she asked me to send them to her, COD. Said she needed the money she had on her for traveling. Shit's like that, you think her and a man was living off the top of the hog, but... Sure, she... sure, but uh, did she give you an address? Oh, yeah, I got it right here in this book. Mm. Oh, right here. She, she wrote it down herself. General delivery... Lake Blue Water. Uh, the shirts are ready now. I'm going to mail them out tonight when I leave. We'll save you the trouble. Wrap them up. And we'll deliver them for you. Kurtz and I headed for Lake Blue Water, towing our horses in a trailer, ready to follow Vance Young no matter which way he moved. It was dark as we drove into the town. The clock on the courthouse was just striking nine. Not many people on the streets, Jace. Looks like everything's closed up for the night except for moving the drugstore. Better find a place to turn in. I think we ought to drive out of town and camp someplace off the lake shore. Walk the horses out for a while. I thought we were going to plant that laundry bundle at the post office in the morning and watch for a pickup. We are. Well, why not pasture the horses at the edge of town and find accommodations right here? If we stay in town for the night, it may start some talk. Talk drifts. We don't want to tip our hand. I guess you're right. Well, let's get out to the lake and plant a campsite. Uh, funny thing about Young's wife remembering his shirts. There's his force of habit for women. Strong thing, habit. His safe-cracking habits told us he was still alive. And now maybe her habits are going to make him wish he was dead again. skirting the shore on one side of it. Then as we rounded a curve and passed a house in a group of resort cabins, I spotted something. Hey, 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 Chase, what's the matter? I saw something. Wait till I back up. I'd like to pick it up as we came around this curve. There. Look at those. All I see is the back of a few cabins and wash on the line. Look at those two shirts on the end of the line. <laughs> <laughs> Look like a couple of rainbows, even in this light. Hey. That's the kind of color scheme Vance Young goes in for. Shirts we have in the laundry bundle are just like those. Lights on in a few of the cabinets. Yeah, I'm going to leave the car here while we have a look at those shirts. Horse chair will make too much of a racket if we drive in. Yeah, no chance of being taken for tourists with that on the back. Better cut the motor and douse the headlights. Yeah. What's the laundry mark on those shirts we've got? 410 mark. That was the number of their house in Galveston. Come on, See if we can find it on that line. Close the car doors easy. Right, right. Take one of them down so we can get a better look at it. What's the matter? Closed pin stuck. There, I got it done. Hold it under the ground. I'll cut my hand with a flashlight. Good. There it is. 410. He's belong to our boy, all right. Quite a few cabins, James. He's in one of them. That's all we have to know. Come on. Stop with this end cabin and we'll go right on down the line. We better be ready for anything. That's the first stop. Dark, Chase. Yeah, to feel your way around. Uh, don't seem to be anybody living here. Uh, this one's empty. All right, you. What? Hey, uh, put that flash out before I fire. No, no, no. Oh, Rangers, I'll put it on. That's better. 
Who are you? My name's uh, Ed Bullock. I own these cabins. Just walking back from the boat dock with a couple of guests. I saw you sneaking in the dark. You, uh, you looking for a place to stay? No. I'm looking for a couple named Young. Oh, well, that's funny. It was Mr. Young who spotted your shadows. Hey, Mr. Young. Was that Young just with you? Yeah. Oh. Him and his wife was right behind me when I flashed light in up here. They spotted us, Jace. Yeah. Come on. Hey, hit him, my boat. Somebody started my boat. Is that the only boat you got down there? Only one with a motor. There's a canoe. We're not going to reach him, Jace. They'll head across the lake. How far is it, fellas? A mile and a half. Kurtz, grab your horse from the trailer. You can beat him around to the far side if you ride hard. And when you get there, flash your light. That'll keep him from trying the shore over there. Right. What about you? I'm taking the canoe. And hurry. We'll get him. <laughs> Uh, Ranger, I'm going to go up and back to the office. My wife... You can right? think later, Mr. Bullock. Right now, I need you. Yeah. I'm going out with the canoe. Flash your light from this shore. They'll think I'm here, and they won't dare land on either side. But make sure you don't turn the light on me in this canoe. All right, Bullock. Turn your light on as soon as I get out the open water. We gotta get out of Will here. Will you shut up and let me think? This little wind will drift to the far end of the lake. But that's so slow. Well, what do you want me to do? I can't swim like you can. Why can't you use the oars? Because the oar locks sweet, stupid. They hear them. There is only two of them. They can't cover the whole shore. Jesus. So dark. And I... Hey, I hear something. What? Something in the water. You're crazy. Can't you see the lights on the shore? Well, thanks. I do hear something. I see it. It's a canoe. What? Don't move, Young. I'm coming into your boat. What, you? I'll train you with this oar. Help! Help! Let go of me. Let go! Oh. Have, you, have you got me? He can't swim. Where he's going, it won't matter. Grab on the canoe and kick for shore. I got a nice dry shirt waiting for him. Convicted of robbing a safe in the mercantile store, Vance Young, on the basis of his previous record, was sentenced to life imprisonment at Huntsville. This is Joel McRae. Many of our listeners, particularly in Texas, recall these cases we've been dramatizing, and some listeners have sent in questions about the Rangers. Yes, it's true. There are only 50 Texas Rangers. And to show you how busy these Rangers are, from 1946 to 1948, the Rangers handled nearly 17,000 cases. With Texas as big as it is, that means they cover about four times greater area per man than any other police officer in the world. Next week, we'll have another authentic story I believe you'll enjoy very much. Like the others, it's based on their official files, adding further glory to the Rangers. Hope you'll be listening. Good night. Next week, Joel McRae in another authentic reenactment of a case from the files of the Texas Rangers. Joel McRae is currently seen starring in the MGM production Stars in My Crown. This story was transcribed and adapted by Joel Murcott, and the program was produced and directed by Stacy Keith. This is Hal Gibney speaking. Three chimes mean good times on NBC. Your Saturday hour of fun begins in four weeks. You will hear Judy Canova and this young man. Hello, everybody. This is Dennis Day. On October 7th, I'll be starting a new season on the air. It'll be fun for all, lots of music and laughs. So join us for our opening show October 7th, over your favorite NBC station. Yes, beginning October 7th, hear Dennis Day, then Judy Canova in an hour of fun on NBC. Three chimes mean good times on NBC.
The Dennis Day Show returns to the air at this time in just three weeks. Remember the Dennis Day Show returning over most of these stations in just three weeks. Presenting Joel McRae as Jace Pearson in Tales of the Texas Rangers. Tales of the Texas Rangers, authentic stories from their official files. Texas, more than 260,000 square miles. And 50 men who make up the most famous and oldest law enforcement body in North America. case, Candyman. It is 4 p.m. April 14, 1947. A prisoner at the jail in Pentland County, Texas, is being returned to a cell as the visiting hour comes to an end. His name is Paul Abbott, serving out a six-month sentence for petty larceny. His cellmate, John Saygood, has not had a visit. Well, Sagut is being held without bail, awaiting trial for murder. All right, Abbott. In. Your wife bring what I told you to get for me? Yeah. Yeah, I got it, Johnny. Candy and, and the razor blades. You know we're not supposed to have razor blades. Yeah. If they find them on me, they might put me in jail. What are you so nervous about with your lousy six-month flat bit? I'm facing the chair. My nerves are still better than yours. Look, Sacred, I only got a month and a half to go. I don't want to get in no trouble. Lay off. Will are you, you tell me what I should do, you cheap <laughs> heister? Oh, Johnny, let go of my arm. You're hurting me. No kidding. Really? <laughs> Gee, kid, I'm sorry. Maybe I play too rough and you're my pal. Model prisoner like you with only a few weeks to go never get searched after a visit. And you're so good to me. Have a piece of candy, pal. I don't want any. Okay. You know, while you've been out visiting, I've been thinking. I'm going to let you and your wife do me another favor. Big favor. Look, i got to be careful what I ask her. I can't upset her now. You know that? Oh, that's right. Babies do so, ain't it, Papa? Wouldn't want the kid to start out without an old man, would you? What do you mean, Johnny? I wanted to see if your wife could get these razor blades in. Next time she comes, tell her to bring me a hacksaw and a gun. No, no, Johnny. You don't want to see me go to the chair, do you? If you do, I could take one of these blades to your throat. No, no, Johnny. Keep your voice down. All right, Johnny. All right. I'll do it. I'll do it. Do it. Now, don't kid me. I can hear the wheels turning in that square head of yours. Next time the screw takes you out of here, you'll spill your guts. I won't, Johnny. I swear. I know you won't. And I'll tell you why. Because if you rat on me, somebody will slip a shiv into you. In jail or out. Now, remember that. Remember it if you ever want to see that kid. I don't realize what you're asking me to do. I ain't asking. I'm telling. If you decide to get brave with your own neck... Remember, I can have your wife taken care of, too. You would. wouldn't do that. You would. Shut up. Here comes the screw. What's the up on, Bell? What's going on in here? We was just arguing, that's all. Bell what? Baseball. How many games Garrick played for the Yanks? Is that right, Abbott? Ain't that right, Abbott? Yeah. That's right. Baseball. With fear, Paul Abbott yielded to Sigurd and, through his wife, obtained the gun and hacksaw. The blow-off came a week later when the Penton County jailer was killed and Sigurd and Abbott escaped. While roadblocks were being quickly set up by Ranger and Highway Patrol units, 
Ranger Jace Pearson contacted Sheriff Leonard Ginn at the county jail. Well, they were in this cell, Ranger. Yeah, some of the lock has been hacksawed, Sheriff. Yeah, they must have waited in the passage until the jailer turned the corner here. Then shot him through the stomach and took his keys. Any idea where they got the gun? No, no, but Abbott's wife was allowed to visit. She could have slipped it in, too. You got a pickup out for her? Mm-hmm. Deputy's out after her now. Abbott made a big jump when they gunned the jailer. Petty larceny to jailbreak and murder. I don't know. A murderer like Saygood, he had a reason to crash out. But a first-timer like Abbott with only four weeks to go, he doesn't figure to make a break. Mm, just the same. Abbott's gone with Saygood. You may find out why when we bring in his wife. Sometimes a man goes places he doesn't want to go with a gun in his back. What could I do, Sheriff? What else could I do? That man would have killed him. Mm -hmm. Did you arrange anything else for them, Mrs. Abbott? Get clothing or an automobile? No, how could I? I even had to lie to my mother to get money. To buy the gun. Paul was in jail and I wasn't working. I was always borrowing money to bring them things. I understand. The one behind the bars doesn't do all the suffering. I'd have done anything for I had to take the food out of my mouth to buy things for that other man. They never me alone. I was having my baby. Why did Paul go with him? Why? I don't think he went willingly, Mrs. Abbott. Brady went at the point of that gun you brought in. Oh. I begin to agree with that, Ranger. You told us you brought Saygood a lot of candy. Yeah. More than a dollar's worth every week. There's a real sweet too, Jase. Always sitting up a yam for sugar at meal times. Yeah. Mrs. Abbott, will you excuse us for a moment? Sheriff, I want to see you for a second. Oh, sure, sure. Anybody watching our house in case Abbott and Sagan show up there? Yeah, it's covered. Good. Your office hasn't any report of a stolen car, huh? No, nope, nothing yet. And they're probably on foot. Could be out of the county by now, though. We have other ranger units in the area. I'm going to call my headquarters and have one of them come with me so we can beat the countryside. Okay. Anything else you want me to handle? Yeah. They'll have to eat wherever they are. Even if they have money, they won't take a chance on being spotted buying anything for a while. Mm, that figures. I want you to make a careful check on any robbery report you get from food stores. Uh -huh. I'd like an itemized account of everything that's taken. I got a hunch Sagan will make a special effort to get his hands on some candy. All that day, nothing turned up in the roadblock. While Ranger Jim Leeds and I rode through the countryside without finding a trace of the man we were after... But on the following morning... Maybe we've been heading the wrong way, Chase. I don't think so, Leeds. Coming this way would have been the fastest trail out of the county. Other ways, all wilderness for more than 80 miles. Too much of them. Foot without supplies. Still figuring they cut through toward U.S. 280, eh? They must have. They'll have to get to a car someplace unless they got a spot to hold up in real close. I don't think they're going to take that chance. He'll want distance. Yeah. Farmhouse head. Hmm. Rider coming, too. He's really pounding leather. And he sees us. Coming right this way. Let's meet him. Uh, howdy, strangers. Ooh, oh, on. Yes. Ooh, ooh, sharp. Ooh. Hey, I didn't expect anybody so soon. Well, what do you mean? Well, I just called the sheriff less than half an hour ago. He did while you're here. We didn't know about your call. What happened? My dog pushed a couple of prowlers during the night. I went out all night hunting them, or I'd have put in a call before. Maybe you're a boy. You know what they look like? No, all I saw was two shadows. Dogs woke me up like I told you. Men was prowling around. You better have a look at this place, Leeds. Yeah. We'll ride back with you. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. How long ago did it happen? Oh, reckon it was 2 a.m., about six hours ago. You say you chased them? Yeah. But I couldn't spot him in the dark. Just rode around all night. If I'd have had any sense, I'd have called right away, but he threw a couple of shots at me when I saw him, and I got hot and went for my gun and lit out. I see. 
They get anything? So when I went back to the house this morning, my missus had a couple of shirts and jeans for me. Peace, they good and have it all right. Getting rid of their jail clothes. They have horses? No, I didn't hear any. Maybe they were going to take a couple of yours and didn't have time to get them. How come your dogs didn't stay after them? Dogs? Pinned up. Should have turned them loose, but like I said, I, I was too hot to do any thinking after they shot at me. If you had done any thinking, you'd have stayed home. One of the men you were chasing is a killer, and about as cold as they come. We picked up their trail near the farmhouse, and about four miles out, we found the ashes of a fire and chicken bones and feathers, and in the brush near the same spot, a bundle of prison clothes. From there, the trail led straight to the U.S. Highway. See the road through the brush now, Chase? Yeah. Let's hope we spot a highway patrol car before we... Now, what's the matter? Something off the road in that patch of Douglas fir. Looks like the front of a truck pulled pretty far back. Come on. Get up, Chuck. Go, boy. Come on. Oh, whoa, whoa, boy. Whoa. with new cars. Uh-huh. That's what they are. Well screened from the road, all right. Yeah. Well, the driver doesn't seem to be around. Unloading ramps down, Jase. Tire tracks on the ground. They've got a car now, all right. Wonder what happened to the driver of the truck. Blood on the cab seat. More on the running board in the room. Go this way. There he is. Dead, jeez. Probably tried to go for help and couldn't make it. Yeah. Mm, looks like Sagood's trademark. Shot through the stomach. <laughs> Listening to Tales of the Texas Rangers, starring Joel McRae as Ranger Jace Pearson. Now we continue with tonight's case, Candyman, an authentic story from the files of the Texas Rangers. I left the horses with leads at the nearest town. We did some checking while I got a lift back to town to pick up the car and horse trailer, and I drove back to meet leads where I'd left him. Come on, boy. Get them started. Ooh, ready to roll, Jace. We'll roll as soon as we can figure out which way. You check on those gas stations. Highway patrol went all the way down the line. No station service to car we're looking for. No pump locks were broken during the night. They must have driven as far as they wanted to go and ditched the car. Somewhere within about 100 miles from here. How do you figure that? Well, new cars coming off the assembly line only get a few gallons of gas put in them. They didn't take on more gas. They got as far as they could on what was in the bank. That makes sense. We'll head west. Liggins had trouble in Oklahoma, Louisiana, according to his record, so he goes to Mexico where he's clean. He left the state. Yeah? Guess it's our best shot. Send to KTXA. Go ahead, KTXA. Have report for Unit 10 on subject John Saygood. Only known associate of Saygood's was woman known as Marcella Roberts. Present whereabouts unknown. Last location was place of business, beauty salon in Abilene, Texas. Left there two months ago. Unit 10 request check of cosmetic distributors and supply houses. Check recent orders as possible source of new address on subject Marcella Roberts. We'll do, Unitan. Uh, moment, Unitan. Got another message coming in for Unitan, stand by. Unitan, standing by. Maybe they found the car, Chief. Big help if they have. Here it is, Unitan. General store, Pike Hill, entered during early morning. Situated 30 miles west, your present location. Check of stolen merchandise includes candy. And fifth subject, sacred. 
Proceeding to Pike Hill immediately, Unit 10, 10-4. Austin. No, no, I opened the door into the store, and then the dang cat popped into my room and started purring and rubbing against my leg. So I just figured she knocked something over, so I went on back to bed. I see. No, anybody broke in until I got up this morning and found the dog last busted. Must have slept through that, though. <laughs> I sleep real sound. Guess I woke up when they knocked this stack of canned goods over. Got them up and got them all stacked again now. Call the sheriff right away? Yep, yep. Soon as I found a few dollars from the cash draw missing. Didn't think about the candy counter. Don't keep much, you know. So a couple of kids come in later on wanting some peppermint lifesavers. And I saw a whole box of them was gone and some chocolate bars. I guess that's when the sheriff got in touch with us then. And we'll rope off this showcase and have somebody from our lab come in to check it for fingerprints so we can be sure it was the man we were after. Not much doubt about it, Jake. Nothing like being sure. We drove further west from Pike Hill past Virgo while we waited for the fingerprint check. Combed the brush along the highway looking for the car Sagwood and had stolen. There was no sign of it. If it was abandoned, it might stay hidden for weeks. Nothing in here, Jace. No. Would have been a good spot to ditch a car, though. Couldn't have driven much further than this. We may find it further on. Well, maybe. Maybe we've already passed it. Call on your car radio, Jake. Yeah. I heard it. KTXA to Unit 10. Come in, Unit 10. Unit 10 to KTXA. Go ahead, KTXA. Report on subject Marcella Roberts. Cosmetic distributor check shows nail enamel ordered in subject's name two weeks ago. Delivery made to adorable beauty salon. Virgo, Texas. Units 10 and 7 continuing investigation. Unit 10, 10-4. KDXA, Austin. Pile in, Lee. Virgo's about 50 miles back, Jay. And a hunch we came too far. The bigger the woman helped him hide out. Vega didn't head in this direction without a reason. If she isn't hiding him, she'll know where he's headed. <laughs> she at her home when we got there, but she came home about an hour later. We left her car out of sight. She didn't see us until she came up the steps to the private entrance on the porch. Miss Roberts? What? Oh. Oh, Ranger. I didn't see you. But you might be able to help us. You know a man named John Sager? I used to know him a long time ago. You seen him lately? Well, how could I? I heard that he was in jail. Paper boy, Mr. Bean. He's been neglecting you lately. He's out. We're looking for him. All right, Major. I'll tell you what I know. He, uh, probably headed for Oklahoma City. He told me once that he could always hide out there if he got into trouble. He should have carried a compass because he headed the wrong way. He broke into a store at Pike Hill before sunup this morning, and he was still moving in this direction when he left there. Well, I haven't seen him. Good. And you won't mind if we take a look through your apartment. If you've got any objection, one of us can wait here while the other gets the one. Oh, why should it come in? I only hesitated because the place is a mess. Sure, but we won't tell the neighbors. Let's go. Well, here you are. Couldn't hide a mouse in here. Please check the bathroom and closet. I'll look in the kitchen. Bye, Candy wrappers on the floor. Is there a law against eating candy? I eat it all the time. So does Sagan. 
And you happen to have a 30-day diet backed up on your kitchen wall. And your figure says you've been following it pretty close. You can't prove anything with that. Maybe not. There's something else. Two different brands of cigarettes in this ashtray. One brand doesn't have any lipstick on it. I had a boyfriend visit me. I'll check every store in this town and find out if you bought a load of groceries today. And if you did, well, you better be able to show them or prove where they went. Ranger, you You're concealing and aiding a murderer. You can serve a lot of time for that, Marcella. <laughs> Enough to rub off those good looks before you get out. I don't want to go to jail. But you don't know Johnny. He killed me. Where is he? Well, I took him and the other fellow up the back road to the Sierra Diablo Foothills. He did hide out there and come back in the week. After I raised some money for him to get out of the country. You need us out for where you left him. Don't bother about raising that money. He isn't going to be needing it. I followed her to the place where Sagut and Abbott had been dropped. The base of the wild Sierra Diablo country, catching the last rays of the sun. Leeds and I took our horses out of the trailer and started after them. Getting pretty dark, Jase. Yeah. We'll have to leave the horses and go on foot soon or we'll lose this trail. I can hardly see anything now. Now, hold up a minute. Ooh, ooh, Charlie. Oh, what? Mm, moist patch here. One of them slipped and fell. The one making the heaviest tracks. Probably Sagut. No, Abbott. Sagut's bigger, but he's using Abbott for a pack mule to carry supplies. Look how the tracks straddle out. Yeah. Sure must be carrying weight, all right. Headed right to that rocky ground ahead. We won't find any more prints as clear as these. Want to tie the horses off here? No. I think we better lead them. We can walk this ground, and we may need them coming out. Now, let's keep going. Now, we've lost them, Jace. Keep flashing your light around. Keep it cut. All right. Don't spread out. No. No, wait a minute. Come back. Put your pot. The earth is soft at the base of this rock. Man, yeah, but no prints in it, eh? No, but look at those marks. Mm. Rattlesnake track. Yeah, he's moving away from here, though. Then probably in under the rock. Even back in the fort. Rattler only does that when it's disturbed. You mean they scared it past the barn? I mean, something scared it. Some loose rock fell around here not long ago, either. You can see where it chipped as it fell. Chips are fresh. Haven't been weathered over. And they must have knocked it loose climbing up around the rock. Yeah. Let's find out. And if they did come this way, they must have moved along this ledge. Yeah. Use your light again. Light, Chase. Look at this. Yeah. It's a broken shoe on this While they were climbing. He sat there and tried the rest of it. Where his back rubbed dirt up the rock behind him. Yeah. Straight for that plateau. It's safe with a clear view of anything coming up by day. Gonna leave the horses here and go on? No. Climb down and get them. We'll circle the rocks and take the long way up. Give Sega a chance to fall asleep. They may be able to take him alive. Fired again. Let him up, Ranger. Let me get a good shot. I'll put one right. 
fight for your fellow. You didn't expect to get away, did you say, good? Do it, Tommy, We can wait. You'll never get out of here unless we take you out. We got four guns, you're one, say, good. Don't forget the extra joker I dealt myself. Fuck up, Evan. Oh, sorry, my arm. I still got Evan, little papa. And if one of you got a bullet mark for me, remember, it's got to go through him first. Maybe I can call around. No, no. No, no, he's triggered. If he heard a sound, he put a bullet in Abbott's back. What do you say, Rangers? Want to see this punk die? Now remember, I got nothing to lose by gunning. What do you want, Sagan? I'll make you a deal. We don't make deals. You'll make this one out of Abbott's dead. He's not calling, Rangers. He'll kill me. I got a wife for the kid town. Ain't that touching, Rangers? How are you going to play ball with me? What's your deal? Back off. Wait off so I can see you go. And leave us your horses. Remember, that will be in front of me when we come out to get him. Jeez, we can let him come out and then we can shoot him. All right, Taggart. You got a deal. <laughs> with me, Ranger. Once I get out, you won't see me there again. Good, Abbott. No place for a wife and kid to go to. All right, stay good. Get going. John Saygood was brought to trial and found guilty on three counts of murder. His sentence, death in the electric chair. This is Joel McRae. Many tales about the Texas Rangers have been repeated until they are legend. And here's one of my favorites. Many years ago, rioting broke out in a Texas town and the mayor appealed for aid from the Rangers. He was at the railroad depot to meet the expected help when a stranger got off the train and approached him. Are you the mayor, the stranger asked. The mayor, looking anxiously for the ranger force, said, Yeah, but I have no time to talk to you now. I'm waiting for the Texas Rangers to stop this riot. The stranger said, I'm the ranger. I was sent down to help you. The mayor's mouth dropped open in dismay. They only send one ranger? Puzzled by the question, the ranger said, Yeah, you only got one riot, haven't you? Don't forget our date, same time next week, folks. See you then. Next week, Joel McRae in another authentic reenactment of a case from the files of the Texas Rangers. Ray is currently seen starring in the Universal International Technicolor production, Saddle Tramp. Tonight's cast included Tony Barrett, Frank Martin, Reed Hadley, Wilm Herbert, Dick Ryan, and Lorene Tuttle. This story was transcribed and adapted by Joel Murcott, and the program was produced and directed by Stacey Keach. This is Hal Gibney speaking. Three chimes mean good times on NBC. The secret of Dennis Day's comedy is that he always appears perplexed and bewildered. Dennis will be back on the network of the Times Saturday, October 7th. That's three weeks from tonight, with more delightful mix-ups and popular music in the thrilling day manner. And that same Saturday, October 7th, also marks the return of Judy Canova 
with more of her mountain-style music and mayhem. This is NBC, the National Broadcasting Company. The National Broadcasting Company presents Joel McRae in Tales of the Texas Rangers. From Hollywood, another authentic reenactment of a case transcribed from the files of the Texas Rangers. Tales of the Texas Rangers, starring Joel McRae as Ranger Jace Pearson. Texas, more than 260,000 square miles, and 50 men who make up the most famous and oldest law enforcement body in North America. of the Texas Rangers come these stories based on facts. Only names, dates, and places are fictitious for obvious reasons. The events themselves are a matter of record. Case for tonight, open and shut. It is 1.37 a.m. September 9, 1945. John Meston, a wealthy rancher, is awakened by the sound of a speeding car screeching to a stop on the driveway outside his house. Seconds later, he jumps out of bed and reaches for a robe as the downstairs door opens. His daughter, Connie, comes up the stairs screaming hysterically. Connie! Connie, baby! What is it? What's the matter? Oh, Daddy Bob! He's dead! He's dead! condition to be questioned, and Sheriff Sykes had only an incoherent story to follow. He called the Texas Rangers. Ranger Jace Pearson was assigned to the case. He arrived at the Meston Ranch shortly before dawn. Might as well wait here in the library, Ranger. The doctor's still in with the girl. He's had a mighty bad shock. Does he tell you where it happened, Sheriff? Yeah, the old cattle road east of the ranch. I got some men riding out there now. They'll call us as soon as they find the body. That girl isn't going to be able to talk real soon. We'd better get out with your men. Here's your girl's father. Sorry to keep you waiting, Sheriff. All right, Mr. Meston. Glad you got here, Ranger. Can we talk to your daughter now, Mr. Meston? Uh, I'm afraid not. The doctor's put her to sleep. Says she must have absolute rest for a few hours. There's no point in our waiting then, Sheriff. We can come back later. I'm sorry, but that would be best. I'll walk out with you. What's the best way to get to that cattle road? Drive into town, then round the highway. Be shorter to cut across the ranch on horses. You got yours in your trailer. Maybe Mr. Meston will lend me one. Take your pick of the stable shed. Couldn't we drive across the range? No, you've got a ravine to cross and a stream to flood. What time did your daughter get home, Mr. Meston? Just a minute before I called the shed. It'll have for one third. I'd only been in bed about an hour. Locked up about 12.30 and turned in. Is this the car she came home in? Yeah, Bob Brady's car. I heard her drive up, then I heard her crying. Came in and tore up the stairs to my bedroom. I'm afraid it's going to take a long time to get over this. Don't let anybody touch this car until I can get a fingerprint man to go over it. 
Killer may have left his mark someplace. I'll see if they touch you. Well, I'll go get me a horse and stable, Ranger. How well did your daughter know Brady? Well, they went around together for a spell, but this date last night was the first they'd had in a long time. Uh, Brady worked for me. Doing what? Uh, accountant. Handled all the ranch business. Got an office in one uh, wing of the house. I see. I'll radio for a fingerprint man to come down from our lab while the sheriff's getting his horse. Want me to ride with you for any reason? No. Better do whatever you can to bring your daughter around so we can talk to her. We'll be back later. I made my radio call, and then Sheriff Sykes and I cut across the ranch to the old road. The riders had just found Bob Brady's body. Nothing had been touched. The riders waited while the sheriff and I went over the ground. Standing right beside the car when he was killed. The car tracks are heaviest here where it was parked. Yeah. Brady and the girl have been walking around, though. Prince go over that way and then turn around and come back here to the body. And the third set of prints mixed in with theirs. Yeah, it must be the killers. Yeah. Came up the road here and stopped beside the car and, and walked on again. The powder burns on Brady's coat. He shot from close up. I only saw the girl for a minute. Couldn't make much out of what she was saying, but I think Brady was killed with his own gun. How come? Carried an automatic in the glove compartment of his car. He toted quite a bit of the ranch's cash on it sometimes. It's funny the killer didn't use his own gun, unless he didn't have one. Well, the girl said Brady tried to get his gun from the car. The fellow took the gun away from Brady and killed him. So I guess he couldn't have had a gun of his own. Oh, that doesn't make sense. He was taking a mighty big chance to page him a holdup if he wasn't armed. Although I guess it was robbery, all right. Brady doesn't seem to have a scent on him. No wallet, no wristwatch, nothing. Yeah, no doubt about the motive. Well, I guess I better have the body moved into town. Deputy can notify Brady's mother. Yeah. Better order an autopsy report. Isn't going to tell us anything we don't know, though. Uh, keep a couple of your riders here. Sure thing, but what do you want them to do? Beat the brush and look for Brady's gun. While they're looking, we can follow this extra set of tracks and see where they lead. I expected to follow the marks of a man who didn't want to be followed. The usual erratic trail a killer leaves when he's trying to throw off pursuit. But this trail led straight as an arrow. Hey, whoever he is, he sure didn't cover his tracks very well. No, unless he's headed for some spot where he knows his trail will be lost. Right. Wait a minute. Oh, oh boy. Oh, 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 oh. What is it? Trouble may start here. Yeah, turned off the road into the fields. Ground's going that way, though. It's a path that's been used before. Come on. Use. Anybody live out here you know of? Nope. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, an old shack about a mile and a half across. Used to be a line house. Owner rented to a Mexican. We better have a talk with him. We can move a little faster, but keep your eye out for those tracks as we go. Yeah. Yeah. We reached the shack, and the earth around it were the boot prints of a man. That's the ones we've been following. He's in that old eye ranger. Yeah. He still have that gun with him. He was up late. Could still be asleep. Come on. We'll sleep. There he is. Still in bed. We've been following, all right. He's our boy. All right, you. Wake up. Hey, who's that? Come on, get up. Hey, hey. Chris, what have I done? Why'd you come here? What's your name? Hey, Jose Morales. Where were you last night? I... What? 
I, I, I walk into town. Anybody see you there? Uh, yes, yes, um, the, the man in the package store. I stopped there to buy a bottle of wine. Uh, there's the bottle on the table. What time did you leave town, Morales? Uh, it was uh, almost midnight, I think. And you walked home, too? Yes, yes, I must why are you asking all these questions? Uh, I don't know. It's... How long does it take you to walk back here? Mm, hour, maybe more. I don't have a w watch, senor. Are you sure you don't have a watch now? Yes, yes I, I never own one. How about a gun? I don't have a gun. How did you come when you came here? Well, I... No, I, I don't remember, senor. I, I, I just walked. Well, you better remember. We came up the cattle road. We followed your boot track. Were you alone all the time? Si, sí, si, sí, alone. You didn't see a car parked on the cattle road? Oh, oh si, sí, si, sí, senor, si. Sí. Uh, there is man and girl there. They, uh, they will remember that they see me there. What's that? Hold it, Sheriff. Go ahead, Morales. When did they see you? Uh, on the way home, I, I passed by the car. And I, I think maybe the car is, it, it broke down. So I took a look inside, but there is nobody there. Uh -huh. And then I walk a little further and meet a man and girl. I asked them, is something wrong with the car? Go ahead. Well, they told me no. So I just come away. Hey, senor, if you can find them, they will remember. They can tell you I was there. The man walking in so right into the electric chair, Jason. Yeah, too easy. You better get dressed, Morales. You're coming with us. But why, senor? What have I done? You'll find out later. Just get dressed. Let's come to the shack, Sheriff. See if we can find that gun. <laughs> didn't find the gun or anything else that might have been taken from Brady. And the sheriff's riders drew a blank, too. But we had enough to hold Morales at the jail. We locked him up and went back to the master ranch. Um, before you speak to my daughter, gentlemen, I want to ask you to try to take it easy. Uh, in here. Connie, it's Sheriff Sykes and the ranger. Howdy. Miss Connie. Hello. Miss Meston. Would you mind telling us just what happened last night? Well, Bob called me, Bob Brady. He wanted to see me. We hadn't seen each other for some time. I thought he worked here at the ranch. Well, he did. I meant we hadn't been out together for a long time. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Well, he, he picked me up here. We drove. Then we parked up the cattle road. That's young folks parked there on an off range here. Turn of a lover's lane. We, we've been there quite a while talking. See, Bob is going to be married next month to a girl named Nilda Peterson. She's a school teacher, ain't right? I see. Go ahead, Miss Neston. Well, he asked me if I wouldn't change my mind and make up with him. Before he got married, it was too late. Mm-hmm. I, I, I told him we weren't right for each other. He, he'd be happier with somebody else. And then, well... All of a sudden, a man came up to the car. It, it was dark, and he had a bandana over his face. Go on. We, he yelled something and made us get out of the car. He have a gun? Oh, I'm not sure. I was frightened. He had something in his hand. He, he took Bob's wallet and his watch, and then, then he told us to stay right where we were. Didn't he take anything from you? Well, yes. Yes, he, he took my purse. And then what happened? So all of a sudden, Bob made a dash for the car. He, he, he got his gun from the glove compartment, but the man was right after him. They, they fought. The, the man got the gun away from him. And he shot Bob and ran off. Please, Jim. Please, Jim. Please, Jim. Please, Jim. What were you wearing? What? Just a plain blue cap with a dress right there on the chair. After that, you took Brady's car and drove back here. Your father called the sheriff, is that right? Yes. Driving back from there, you had to come through town. Why didn't you stop and get to a phone? I was frightened. I couldn't think. I, I wanted to get home. You should be able to understand that, Ranger. After all, the sure. Well, check. Sure, Mr. Matt. Just check. You said you were in bed and heard your daughter drive up. Is that right? Yes. I, I told you before. I blocked up and turned in about 12.30. Trying to come home about an hour later. Came in and right up to your bedroom. Is that right? Yes. Why? Just get in the picture. All right, Sheriff. We can go now. All right. Oh, we can find our own way out, Mr. Meston. 
Miss Connie can come in a time dictator statement in a day or so. Yes, well, Ranger, this looks like a quick one to me. Case against the Mexican Morales is open and shut. I don't know, Sheriff. Somebody's lying. Nesson said he locked up and went to bed. His daughter came in and went tearing up to his bedroom. Well, what's wrong with that? How'd she get into the house if Morales took her purse? Her keys would be in it. Well, she might have had her key in the pocket of her dress. Might have. Except for one thing. That dress has no pocket. In just a moment, we will continue with Tales of the Texas Rangers, starring Joe McClay as Ranger Jake Pearson. This month, the National Broadcasting Company celebrates 25 years of bringing you the best radio programs. Seven days a week, you can depend upon NBC for music, drama, comedy, entertainment of every kind, as well as the latest up-to-the-minute news from every corner of the world. When you tune when you hear the familiar NBC chimes, you know you're tuned for the finest in radio listening. We continue now with Tales of the Texas Rangers and tonight's case, Open and Shut, an authentic story from the files of the Texas Rangers. I checked on Morales' story as best I could. He had been in town, and he had bought a bottle of wine to take home with him the night of the murder. But when I got back to the jail, the sheriff had evidence piling up against the Mexican. Your fingerprints include that lost copy of prints were found on Brady's car. Mm-hmm. These prints were found on me on the door of the car. Now, compare it with these. Mm-hmm. Same man, all right. Matching said of the prints I rolled off Morales when we brought him in. He must have done it. Maybe, but I'm not convinced. I'll see you later. Here, where are you going, Ranger? To see Brady's mother and the girl he was drawn to marry. <laughs> the only boy I had left. His brother was killed in the war. Oh, please, Mother Brady. We've got to help the Ranger. Oh, I'm sorry, Ranger. It's all right, ma'am. How long had it been since your son had been out with Connie Meston before last night? Six months. I thought he was all with I thought you'd leave him alone when she was in the middle Did he brood about her much during the time he wasn't seeing her? No. She knew it was dead. She was far. She never really wanted it. That first time out, she couldn't stand him. Uh, Miss Peterson, yes. you and Brady ever quarrel about Connie Meston? Oh, no. He was over it. He knew what she was. He's a cruel, heartless little chief. He made his life miserable. Have you got any idea of why he called her and asked her to see him that night? The ranger, he didn't call her. She called him. You're sure of that? They didn't answer the phone. He didn't want to go, but she must have been insisting because after a while he said, all right, I'll meet her just now. For the last time. Thanks. Ranger, is it true what we heard? You've got the killer in jail. I wouldn't count on that. Yes. I went back to the jail and questioned Morales again. He was frightened, but his story never moved an inch from what he told us the first time. Then I saw the sheriff. I spoke to District Attorney Jay. He thinks we got enough to take the grand jury for an indictment. Give me one of the mug shots you took of Morales when you brought him in. Sure. Here's the picture. Thanks. I want Connie Minson to look at it and see if she can identify Morales. So she said the man who stuck him up had a bandana over his face. She said a lot of things, Sheriff. Brady struggled with the man who killed him. Morales carried a bottle of wine from town to his shack. We checked that. If he had a struggle with anyone, how come he didn't drop the bottle and break it? Well, it seems like it would have broke, don't it? You got a bandana here? Yeah, the one we took from Morales. Why? No, not that one. I want one with a different color and pattern. Maybe one of my deputies ought to get it. I want to see how many lies Connie Messon can tell. I won't be satisfied with a case against Morales until we find Brady's gun and the things that were supposed to be stolen. I went back to the mess. 
Nutson Ranch the next morning. Tony Nutson was taking Brady's death hard. As hard as a rock. She wasn't at the ranch house. She was near the corral, training a jumper to take a fence. All right, come on, boy, now. Let's go. Come on. Hey. Hey. Oh. Hey. Hey. You've recovered from your shock. Well, I had to find something to occupy my mind. <sighs> Thought I'd work my horses. Got a minute in the show at El Paso next Sunday. It'd be nice if the horse lives that long the way you use that whip. It happens to be my horse. Now, well, what do you want, anyway? A little information. We may have the man who killed Brady. Oh, yeah, I heard. The Mexican Morales? He was just around. Here's a picture of him. You see the man? Well, it could be. He looks like the one. What do you recognize? A scar on his chin? Yeah. Well, no. I mean, no. His, his face is covered. Yeah. I almost forgot about that. Is this the bandana you saw? Well, it, it was dark, but it, it was just like that one. Uh, well, thanks. Uh, is that all you want to know, Ranger? Yeah, that's all. For now... I saw Tony Nutson's father as I was leaving the ranch. He seemed pale and shaky seeing me there. I was certain that Tony Nutson was lying all the way. The sheriff dropped a bombshell in my lap when I got back to the jail. He was running for his... Hey, Sheriff! Sheriff, where are you going? Oh, I'm glad you got here. I was just heading for Morales' place. You want to come along, I reckon. Why? What's out there? I think we're going to find the gun and the stuff he stole. Look, sit here. Just got this in the mail. Was posted last night in the Mexican section. The note was printed in Spanish on yellow paper. It said, "Look in cattle tank near Morales' house." That was all. You reckon Morales trusted a friend who decided to double cross him? We better get out there. Well, there's no doubt about this case now, Ranger. We find that gun and Morales is headed for the electric chair for sure. Hey, here. Here's something else. What'd you find? The watch. Maybe you just watch? Good. Well, this is all of it. Come on, let's get out of this water. Sure. Nice haul. The gun, the girl's purse, Brady's wallet, and this watch, right on Morales' doorstep. At the end of this case. No, it isn't. Oh, now, Jay. Look at these things, Sheriff. Look at the muzzle of this gun. It's clogged solid with dirt, packed tight. Well, always some mud in the bottom of a cattle tank. But this is mud. It's packed earth. And it's packed so tight it didn't dissolve in the water. Yeah. Say, that is funny. Sheriff, this gun was buried someplace after it was fired. Buried and then dug up again and thrown into this cattle tank. Say, you're all right. Traces of dirt packed into the holes of the wash band, too. And in the wall. Sure. But look at this purse. The purse wasn't buried. Now, the same dirt had be jammed in the metal frame. Connie missed keys. She had them when she ran home after Brady was shot. She brought the purse with her to plant with the stuff she dug up after she knew Morales was under suspicion. You mean she killed Brady, buried the evidence before she went home to make it look like Robert? Yeah, because the real motive was jealousy. You hold Morales another 24 hours. That'll be long enough to get what we need. Then Connie Neston can take his place. Oh, but you've got no proof on her. I'll send that anonymous note to the handwriting division at our lab. They can get a sample of Connie Neston's writing from the horse show registration blank at El Paso for comparison. Yes, but will that help, Ranger? After all, the note is printed, and it's in Spanish. There'll still be similarity in letter formation. Besides, registration blanks usually ask for printed information on breeding and identification. If Connie Neston wrote that note, Lab will know it. <laughs> Get checked. 
County Netson's printing on registration blanks for the horse show matched the printing on the anonymous note. It was almost enough, but I wanted one more thing. A trace of dirt on something she owned. A trace that would match the dirt that had been packed in the muzzle of Brady's gun when it was buried. I drove out to the Netson ranch and found Connie in the stables. Mind if I come in? Oh, you here again? What do you want this time? Thought you might like to know we found Brady's gun. Anonymous note told us where it was. Cattle tank out at Morales' place. Hmm. You got a good case then. No. Morales didn't put the gun in the tank. How do you know? Because the gun and the other things had been buried. They were dug up again and thrown in the tank. Well, maybe he decided to, to change the hiding place. While we were holding him in jail? No, not likely. Morales didn't kill Brady. Do you know who did? Not for sure, but we'll find out. Whoever dug those things up must have carried them in something while they were taking them to the cattle tank. Some dirt was jammed in the muzzle of the gun. We find out what it was carried in, the clothing maybe, somebody's pocket. We can match the dirt in our lab. I see. That's very interesting. I thought you'd think so. Well, guess I'd better be getting back to town. away from the ranch and parked behind some trees that gave me a view of the stable. A minute after I left her, Connie Nesson came out riding like the wind. I unloaded charcoal from the trailer and followed her, always keeping cover between us. She didn't seem to be carrying anything to dispose of, but all of a sudden she came to a stop by a stream. She took the saddlebags and decided to shake them all over the water. Oh, oh boy. All right, charcoal, let's go. Get up! Go! Stay right where you are, Miss Nesson. I'll take those saddlebags. Sure. Any law against emptying into a stream? None that I know of. Well, take them then, Ranger, because they're empty. Not as empty as you wish they were. And a few grains of dirt stuck in the seam. That's all we're going to need. You can't make anything out of that. Oh, I got a few other things. An anonymous note in Spanish matched the registration blanks you sent into El Paso. I don't think you'll be showing your horses Sunday. Are you? Give me that quick. You won't be using this again either. Now get on your horse and ride for the house. I'm taking her in, Mr. Nesson. I've got an idea you started to suspect she was lying the same time I did. She's not lying, Ranger. She, she didn't know nothing about it. I just... I shot Brady. Sorry, but that won't work either. I got to pin down all the way. Daddy, help. Oh, you need some money. Well, what kind of a father are you if you can't help brother? I... You were shit me. Yes. I should have started 20 years ago. Before I let you get to be what you are. Maybe I'm not legally guilty, Ranger. But I'm guilty of raising the way I did. Too bad you didn't think of it sooner. All right, Connie. Let's get into town. Connie Metzen's trial was spotted with hysterics that failed to convince the court although she maintained she was innocent in the face of overwhelming evidence against her. Then, as the trial near the close, she changed her plea to guilty, and in an effort to avoid a death sentence, she confessed. She was sentenced to the women's prison at Huntsville for 50 years. Next week, Joel McRae in another authentic reenactment of a case from the files of The Texas Rangers. Joel McRae is currently seen starring in the Universal International Technicolor production, Chattel Drive. The cast included Tony Barrett, Joan Banks, Francis X. Bushman, Farley Bear, and Debbie Jenner. Technical advisor was Captain N.T. Lone Wolf Gonzalez of the Texas Rangers. This story was transcribed and adapted by Joel Murcott, and the program was produced and directed by Stacey Keith. Hal Gipney speaking. It's the Silver Jubilee on NBC. Next, it's the big show with stars including Sophie Tucker, June Dolly, Jerry Lester, Ann Sheridan, Morton Dolly, and your charming hostess, Selena Bankhead. 
Then enjoy mirth and music with Phil Harris and Alice Faye. Later, Theater Guild on the Air presents Age of Innocence, co-starring Claudette Colbert and McDonald Kelly. And for pictures of your favorite NBC stars, buy the current NBC Silver Jubilee issue of Radio TV Mirror Magazine. Next, it's The Big Show. All this and Tamula too on NBC. <laughs> Presenting Joel McRae as Jace Pearson in Tales of the Texas Rangers. <laughs> Tales of the Texas Rangers, authentic stories from their official files. Texas, more than 260,000 square miles. 50 men who make up the most famous and oldest law enforcement body in North America. Now, from the files of the Texas Rangers come these stories based on fact. Only names, dates, and places are fictitious for obvious reasons. The events themselves are a matter of record. Case for tonight, clean up. Several years ago, the town of Kilman, Texas, boasted a population of slightly under 3,000 inhabitants. Until a wildcat gusher started a fabulous new oil boom. In a matter of months, the population rose to 12,000 as drillers, roughnecks, and other field personnel poured in. And behind them, like vultures, came the horde of racketeers, gamblers, and grifters. But even organized vice was not profitable enough for the boss of the crime syndicate, Frankie Gennaro. Gennaro started to move in on the oil business itself. Sure, Paul is alone, Stutz. Yeah, Frankie. In the shack with a light. What have we been getting from him? Herb's got the figures. Yeah, he's got uh, four wells in production. We've been getting 200 barrels a day. So what's his base? He's still getting plenty. He choked the wells down. Says he won't pay off anymore. Yeah, we'll see about that. You better come in, too, Herb. Yeah, okay, Frankie. Don't knock open it. Hey, what's the idea of busting in here? No idea, Paul. I hear you've had some kind of a misunderstanding with my boys. There's no misunderstanding, Gennaro. You're just not getting any more oil from my wells. I'm not taking any more threats from you or your tin horn friends. Watch what you're saying, Paul. I'll say what I want. I'll not only say it to you, I'll say it to the law. Your mouth's got a loose trigger, Paul. It shoots off to it. Get out. Get out of here before I bend this pipe wrench over your head. Hey, I'm sorry. Let go of me. Oh. Got him, Frankie. Let me go. He's got a knife. Let him have it, huh? Ah. Oh. Oh. He clipped me with that branch. Well, he won't do it again, Stutz. This will teach the other operators not to get smart. Come on, Herb. Let's get out of here. The death of Joe Powell sealed the lips of other frightened oil operators. And they said nothing as Frankie Gennaro continued to exact tribute from the smaller private companies. But Powell's murder aroused special interest of the Texas Rangers. Captain Stinson sent for Ranger Jace Pearson. You know what's been happening in Kilman since the oil boom started, Jace? Yeah, I've heard. I've got Rangers in the town, of course. Good men. But they're too well known. We're being blocked all the way by people who won't talk or who are afraid to talk. The work the Kilman district are not known there. Well, that's why I sent for you. I want Kilman cleaned up, starting with Joe Powell's murder. But a man wearing a badge won't stand a chance. You want me to work without one? That's right, Jace. But not alone. We got a new man just transferred into the company, Steve Clark. You can work together. Good. You better brief me on the Powell murder. And all we've got is in the next room. Come have a look. Ah, uh, here's some photographs taken at the murder scene. Stabbed in the back. 
belt and shirt twisted, though. Powell must have put up a fight before he went down. He fought all right. But look at his wrench. Yeah. yeah and blood stains and a few matted hairs on it. This the same wrench that was next to the body in the photos? The same one. Powell must have hit somebody with it before he was killed then. It looks that way. That means two or more men ganged up on him. He dropped one with a wrench and, and the other one stabbed him. That's the way I see it. Blood on the wrench been typed? Yeah. Here's a report from the lab at Austin. Typo, huh? Brown hair, Caucasian name. Micrometer measurements are there, too. And that's all we've got, Jace. How about a list of undesirables hanging out and killing them? Oh, yeah, I got that, too. Ah, uh, here. Mostly petty crooks, gamblers, and muscle men. Our boys run a few out and new ones come in. There must be one man at the top, though. Usually is, but which one? A few possibilities on your list here. This one, uh, Stutz Tracy? No, no, he's not big enough to be given the orders. Does he know you by sight? No, I just know a few of these names by reputation and photos. Well, here's another bad one. Herb Enfield. Yeah, I've heard about him, too. Plenty. Supposed to be a real vinegar on. Yeah, he's tougher than the back end of a shooting gallery. Yeah, no, he's not smart enough to cover up for himself. The only other possible boss I can see is this one. Frankie Janeiro. Uh-huh. Got lots of arrests and a couple of indictments. No convictions. On the surface, his record's clean. He always has an alibi, and it always stands up. Well, huh? guess I'd better get started. Right. We'll go over to the barracks, and I'll introduce you to Steve Clark. You want to change your clothes, anyhow? Yeah. And the first job is to locate key men. When we find out who's making the wheels turn, we can put our badges on again and move in with a force. Well, the whole company will be standing by. You better warn the rangers in town not to let on they know me. Well, they've been warned. You'll be treated just like a stranger. You have anything to report, contact me directly. But be careful. And you better leave your car outside the town and just meander in on horses. Cow folks? Yeah, just a couple of wandering cow folks. <laughs> Steve Clark. We dressed like a couple of cowpokes and parked our car outside of Kilman. It was almost midnight when we rode in. The town was sprawled all over the map, dotted with trailers and food shacks thrown together from tin and old packing crates. Despite the hour, everything was going full blast. It's plenty of low night. Sure is booming, Jace. Yeah. The hotel down a ways looks especially lively. I bet that isn't legal liquor they're taking on around here. Yeah, I bet there isn't much of anything here that is legal. A bunch of oil trucks coming through. You better get out of the way. Get over, Jarko. Come on, boy. Over, boy. Over. Seems to me that it's kind of late for them to be hauling oil. Ought to be a daytime operation. Might be a shortage of trucks, Jase. Everything has to be hauled. No pipelines to the refineries yet. You think it might be hot oil? Maybe. We don't know why Joe Powell was killed, but if somebody had been stealing his oil and Powell found out about it, we'd have a pretty good motive. Yeah. But if those trucks are hauling stolen oil, they're being pretty open about it. Oh, oh boy. Listen to that racket, man. Being pretty open about everything around here. Boy, you talk too much. Come on, Clark. Let's get us a room. I want to call the captain and find out about these night riding trucks. <laughs> staying at the hotel was cut short by the desk clerk. There wasn't a room available in the town. We hung around for about an hour before we found a rancher who told us we could bunk down in the loft of his barn outside of the town. Cleaning that mess up isn't going to be easy, Jason. It's going to be even tougher than it looks, Clark. Notice what happened when the sheriff and one of the rangers they know walked in? Yeah. All the gambling stopped five minutes before they got there and all the liquor disappeared. Whoever's running that place knew they were coming. No wonder our men haven't been able to get any place. We could have stopped that place from operating, Chase. We saw what was going on. It yeah, wouldn't do any good to show a badge and shut down one spot. We've got to shut them all. But first, we've got to hook them all together. Yeah, I guess you're right. Hey, look over there. Roadside phone booth by that gas station. Are you still going to call Captain Stinson? Yeah, good spot. Station's closed. I'll take the horses back off the road and wait. Yeah. 
I got through to Captain Stinson at his home. What he had to say about the trucks wasn't encouraging. Yes, Chief, we've had reports on the trucks. They run every night. Have our men ever stopped any of them? Yes, but they seem to be all right, Chief. They have receipts for everything they're carrying, and the trucks are properly licensed. I still can't see why they're running at night. Neither can I, but there's no law against it. Hasn't the commission set a limit on the number of barrels each well can pump in a day? Yes, each well is allowed 300 barrels a day, as long as the present pressure holds. Have the operators been accounting for that much oil each day? Yes, the commission keeps a careful check. Operators report production of 300 a day, the trucking company receipts show haulage of 300 a day, and the figures at the refineries tally, too. It's a three-way check, Jase. I don't see how they could beat it. Well, I'm still convinced that Powell's death has something to do with hot oil. Well, I can't help you there, Jase. It's all in your lap. I'm hoping to match the hair the lab found on that wrench Powell used. But I need a motive to narrow down the field. <laughs> 12,000 people in town make a lot of suspects. Well, do the best you can. I will. I'm sending you a list of names. Men we spotted running gambling games and selling liquor at the hotel. We'll have to let them run for a while until we move in with a big broom. We'll raise dust whenever you're ready. Three days, I left Steve Park wandering around town, spotting the rackets, while I rode through the oil field at night, striking up casual conversations with the pumpers wherever I saw when the night riding trucks load up and leave. Howdy. Well, howdy. A little bit off your trail, ain't you, Carpo? Yeah. Ah, <laughs> uh, just riding around, wishing some of this land was mine. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, we all wishing the same thing. They're just going to have a donut, a little coffee. Want to come? <laughs> if your friends on the truck didn't drink it all. Then tell us. They're always in too much of a hurry. Yeah, you can tie a horse to the derrick there, but he'll be all right. Thanks. There you are. Thanks. Yeah, it's a funny hour for making oil pickups. What makes them haul so late? Always take a full load? Uh-huh. Uh, 100 barrels a clip makes a full tank from it. And field storage tanks hold a 1,000 barrels each, don't they? Uh-huh. Uh, want a donut? No, thanks. I checked with a few more pumpers, then rode out to the barn where Clark and I were bunking. I woke him up. <laughs> Oh, oh, morning, Chase. What time is it? Almost six. What'd you find out? Oh, let me stretch here. <laughs> yeah, I've got another flock of names you can send out to the captain. Here you are. Hmm. Yeah. You got just about every small time hood staked out. Everything but the head man. Chase, I'm not so sure there is a head man. There's gotta be. All the racketeers stick to their own game in their own part of town. They're all protected by the same muscle man. Yeah. So? So they belong to an organization. Otherwise, they'd be fighting among themselves, trying to move in on each other. Yeah. Didn't think of that. Oh, dipping a finger in the oil business here, too. I'd swear to it. And that's big. We find the man on top of that, we'll have the kingpin of the entire operation. Well, I'll keep looking around, Chase. No. No, let the town go for a while. From now on, we'll concentrate on the wells. When we get the man responsible for killing Powell, the whole thing will tumble like a house of cards. You are listening to Tales of the Texas Rangers, starring Joel McRae as Ranger Jace Pearson. Beginning one week from tomorrow, that's Sunday, October 8th, Tales of the Texas Rangers will be heard at a new time. Remember, our next show is Sunday, October 8th, one week from tomorrow. Now we continue with tonight's case, Cleanup, an authentic story from the files of the Texas Rangers. We staked ourselves out at Powell's Wells. For two days, we kept check around the clock on every load of oil that was hauled away, watching from a distance. It was a dead-end watch. That yeah, checks it out, Chase. Four wells, 300 barrels each per day, 1,200 barrel total. And that's what they've hauled away. Yeah, but since we've been here, nothing's been hauled from Powell's wells at night. Yeah, you're going to keep watching them? Just for tonight, so we can measure the flow from the wells. 
You can keep the pumper busy for a while at 9 o'clock while I run a tape gauge into the storage tank. Well, you'll have to check him again later. Yeah, I'll wander up and keep the pumper busy around 3 a.m. Then you can make the second check. Compare our figures and we'll know if those wells are really choked for 300 barrels each or if they're pumping more in the legal quota. Okay, Jason. Let's hope it works. We didn't have to do much figuring. The wells were on the nose. 300 barrels a day each, not a drop more. Well, that's it, Chase. And the refinery reports show that it's all going through. There's no hot oil to be accounted for. Well, it was a thought. Let's get the horses and turn in. Yeah. Guess Paul just happened to brush somebody the wrong way. Yeah. That oil angle would have helped plenty. Too bad. Hey, wait a minute. Hmm? It's a car. Hey, yeah, yeah. He's turning up the road toward that rigging over there. The rigging isn't lit. Nobody's working there with a the dry hole. Get it, Paul. Yeah. His lights will sweep this way when he turns. Hey, he stopped the dry hole, all right. Yeah. Howell's well, pumpers walking across the field to meet him. Yeah, they're going up to the knowledge house on the rig. From the place to be holding me this time of night. It's a cinch they don't want to be seen. The pumper knows more than he told us. Come on. What's the plan, Jase? Maybe we can slip under the platform of the rigger without them seeing us. We can get under the knowledge house. We may learn a few things through the floorboards. We crept through the muddy channel and drained into the slush pit. We got under the knowledge house. We were hidden, but we could hear them. Don't you start making pickups again tomorrow night? Do you? Why not? You think you're gonna beg for a team, do it. You know how teams are joke before the before his accident? Yeah. All right, sir. How can I give you any order? Well, it's only pump of regular quarters. Have the jokes changed again. So they pump a little extra. Ah, not without Miss Pal's okay. Look for her now. Maybe you didn't hear me. I said change the jokes. Oh, I'm afraid, Studs. Must be Studs Tracy, Jason. Yeah. Well, don't look at me like that, Studs. Oh, I'm on a spot. Listen, you, we've got the operators in this field lined up. We don't intend to have any trouble with a wise guy. Oh, no, 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 wait a minute, Stutz, wait a minute. Yeah. Oh, what, 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 Just to make you think, that's only a sample. Maybe you'd like what Paul does. Oh, don't talk like that, Stutz. I'll do what you say. Just, just tell me what you want me to do. I've already told you. The trucks will roll tomorrow night. Yeah. Don't disappoint me. Yeah. Come on. He knows what happened to Paul, Jason. He's grabbing him. No, no, stay down. He's not that heavy, man. I wonder why we haven't been seen him around. Man. Wish I could have gotten a look at his face. His voice sounded familiar. You've seen one shots of him in the photos we had. The fellow with the broken nose. That's right. Have you seen him around? Yeah, I think I have. Yeah, only this afternoon at the hotel. He was talking to Frankie Gennaro. Well, that's the first time either of us has seen him since we've been here. I heard him talking to Gennaro. He said he'd been up to Big D. In Dallas? What was he up there for? Well, that wasn't mentioned. They didn't talk much. All I know is that Stutz just got back. He'd been gone two weeks. Uh, come on. We can get out of here. Gone two weeks, huh? In other words, since Powell got killed. Yeah, what do you make out of that, Jason? He doesn't know just something about Powell's murder. I got a hunch he was in on it. Powell clipped one of his attackers with that pipe wrench, remember? Must have left a mark. And if Stutz had that mark, he wouldn't hang around and give people a chance to notice it. Is that it? Two weeks would just to be about long enough for a scar to heal over. We've got to get a sample of Stutz's hair to match with the hair samples Lab got off that wrench. Well, how do we get that? We get our hands on a comb and brush. Anything he's used on his head. First, we've got to find him. Well, he may have headed back to the hotel. That's a favorite hangout. Now yeah, we'll try it. On the way into town, I want to call the captain. Yeah. Come on, Chuck. Come on, boy. What are you going to call the captain for? Find out who owns the trucks hauling the oil and what refinery they're going to. See if we can hook the ownership up with any of the people we've been watching here. Why? Well, because records have been falsified to cover that hot oil. We find out who's changing them, and we'll know who Stutz is working for and who killed Powell. Jay's hot oil won't prove murder. 
No, once we link Stutz as an accomplice in the murder, I got a feeling he'll squeal like a pig caught under a gate. I made my call to Captain Stinson. He arranged to have the trucks followed and the ownership checked. Then Clark and I headed for the hotel where business was going on as usual. There he is, Jace, at the counter. They're using it as a bar. Uh-huh. Herb Enfield and Frankie Janelle. There's the trio the warden of Huntsville would love to have. Well, maybe you'll get him later on. Well, what do we do? Just wait around until Stutz combs his hair? No. Look, on the stool beside him. What? Oh, his hat. Is it his? Uh, it's the one he was wearing when I saw him this afternoon. Good. There'll be enough hair strands in it or little clippings in the band to tell us what we want to know. Chase, how do we get it? Uh, call for a drink and crowd him. You just grab it and pay. You want me to take it back to the barn? No. Well, there's a small airfield near the next town. Get it over there and call the Austin lab and have it picked up. They can report to Captain Stinson. When I call him in the morning, he should have enough for us to start dropping the net. Good. You get a line on the trucking company and the refinery? Yes, you like it. The trucking company is owned under an alias by Herb Enfield and his wife. Good. And the refinery is owned by a woman. We checked on her, Jace. She's Frankie Janeiro's girlfriend. That does it. When are you coming in? The whole company's standing by right now, ready to roll. Then come ahead. And throw up roadblocks on the way. An awful lot of people are going to want to leave here in a hurry. <laughs> Home the town, Jace. You got a section for Clark and me? Take your choice. You know who I am. Good. Go ahead. The rest of the men have their assignments. Names you supplied. Listen, you people. All of you. Now, most of you are decent folks. Go home and stay home. The streets may not be safe for the next couple of hours. But by tonight, you'll have your town back. We use the hotel for a jail. All right, let's go. You men in there, you're surrounded. Come out with your hands up. All right, come on, get moving. That's on your feet. Uh, what do you cow folks want? We're not cow folks. We're Texas Rangers. Rangers? But get up. Get up. You're coming over to the hotel lobby. We'll tell you all about it. Well, that's quite a haul, Jace. Yeah. I can't locate Herb Enfield and Frankie Gennaro. Clark's holding Stutz Tracy in that side room, though. He might know where the others are. You got the photos of the hair samples lab matched? Yeah. Here. Good. I'll show these to Stutz. They should convince him. He say anything yet, Clark? He's not a buzz. I'm not going to say anything either. Stutz, I got something to show you. Ever seen anything like this before? Take a look at this photograph. What is it? Just a couple of hairs. One on the left came from your hat. We borrowed it last night. Uh, what's the idea? And the hair on the right is just like it. Exactly like it. That came from a bloody wrench we found beside the body of Joe Powell. Powell hit you with that wrench, Stutz, and then you killed him. I, I was never even near him. That hair and the scar on your head proved you were. No, but, but I didn't kill him. You were there. You know who did. I was knocked out. I didn't see who was. Come on, Stutz. Who was with you? Uh, ben Peel and... And Frankie Gennaro. Yeah. Oh, he'll kill me. He's gonna kill me. Gennaro's the boss, then. Yeah. He's got a hideout someplace. Where is it? No, he'll kill me. I, I said, where is it? You, you gotta protect me. 
There's, there's a cabin. Up past the Red Sea, this other side of the oil field. That's where he's been living. He'll have a clear view of the road up there, Jace. We won't use the road. Oh. We'll ride up from behind. Is Enfield there, too? Yeah. Yeah, they're always together. Jace, they may not even know we moved in on the town. They'll know soon. <laughs> There's a cabin, Chase. Pretty fancy. It ought to be. They've milked plenty out of this town. Yeah. The cows run them dry for them now, though. Hey, somebody around the side of the cabin there in a the hammock. Gennaro. A nice silk robe. He's in for a change of wardrobe. He isn't gonna lie. He's getting up, Chase. He sees us. You looking for something? Yeah. You're wanted in town. That's the place he sent you for me? Huh? Oh, yeah. Yeah, he did. Enfield, too. Anything wrong in town, huh? I don't think so. You see anything wrong, Clark? No. No, I thought everything was fine. Hey, hey! Yeah, Frankie? Class wants us in town. Sent these fellows out to tell us. Oh? I... Uh, I've seen you two around before, haven't I? Hey, what's that on your shirt, cowpoke? Oh, that's just the Texas Ranger badge? Come on, both of you. You're going into the... You, Shady! You uh, fellas mind telling me what you think you've got on? Well, let's start with the killing of Joe Powell. <laughs> oh, I can prove I was someplace else when Powell was killed. Urban Stutz and I were playing cards with three other men all night long. Not this time, Janelle. What do you mean? We've already proven where Stutz was. He's made a full confession. There'll be no alibis this time. Don't move, Gennaro. Look out for Enfield! We don't want to fight. You around with a gun, Herb. A knife in the back is your specialty. Glad to see you know that I didn't kill Polly. Sure, Gennaro. You're the boy with the brains. You don't do the work. You order it. But something you can't prove. No? You don't think Herb is going to take all the blame, do you? You're not going to set me up to no. Shut up! I can understand that. I never saw a fellow who needed one more. All right. Get moved. Take it. Frankie Gennaro and Herb Enfield were sentenced to light terms at Huntsville. Stutz Tracy was given 50 years, and lesser offenders in the Kilman cleanup were given sentences of from one to five years. Those who were released without being charged left the town of Kilman quickly and quietly. The cleanup was complete. Here again is the star of our show, Joel McRae. Folks, here's a special announcement I think you'll be interested in. You'll next hear Tales of the Texas Rangers beginning Sunday, one week from tomorrow. Yes, we're moving to a brand new time on Sundays, beginning Sunday, October 8th. I hope you'll make it a point to hear us at our new time, beginning in just eight days. Good night, folks. See you next Sunday. A week from Sunday, Joel McRae in another authentic reenactment of a case from the files of the Texas Rangers. Joel McRae is currently seen starring in the MGM production Stars in My Crown. Tonight's cast included Tony Barrett, Lou Krugman, Paul Fries, Tom McKee, Herb Ellis, and Byron Kane. This story was transcribed and adapted by Joel Murcott, and the program was produced and directed by Stacy Keach. This is Hal Gibney speaking and reminding you to be with us again at our new time one week from tomorrow, Sunday, October 8th.
chimes mean good times on NBC. Next Saturday at this time, Dennis Day returns to the air. Dennis Day's comedy is always refreshing because he appears so timid and bewildered. But one thing that doesn't bewilder Dennis is how to sing a popular ballad or rhythmical melody. So for comedy and songs, it's Dennis Day at this time next Saturday. That day also marks the return of the Judy Canova Show. And tomorrow, Phil Harris and Alice Faye return to NBC. Transcribe. Presenting Joel McRae as Jace Pearson in Tales of the Texas Rangers. Tales of the Texas Rangers, authentic stories from their official files. Texas, more than 260,000 square miles. And 50 men who make up the most famous and oldest law enforcement body in North America. of the Texas Rangers come these stories based on facts. Only names, dates, and places are fictitious for obvious reasons. The events themselves are a matter of record. Case for tonight, Living Death. It is 2 a.m. on the morning of October 3rd, 1948. A man stands in the brush on the American side of the Rio Grande, watching another man wading rapidly across the river from the Mexican side. Come on, hurry up. Say your grins. Say your grill, where are you? Over here. Shut up. Oh. I almost fallen. Never in. mind. You crazy wearing a white sombrero with that moon? What is the harm, sir? You bring nobody see it there, go but you. Don't be too sure of that. Somebody followed me down here. I don't know whether I shook him or not. The border patrol? No. Hijack, maybe. You got the package? See, si. right here. Twenty ounces. Here, here's your money. Two hundred an ounce. Four thousand dollars. Oh, gracias. Will be another shipment next week. Yeah, I know. I'll meet you here again on the twelfth, same time. Be a little more. All right, amigo. Someone does follow you. Quiet. Sound came from over there. He's moving this way. You have to crawl through that clearing first, and the moon's right on it. You gonna use a gun? What do you think I got it for? Keep quiet. There he is, coming into the moonlight. Yeah, and he doesn't see us. Just like a sitting duck. You hit him, senor? Yeah. Oh, no. Oh, oh, oh. oh. Looks like I didn't hit him good enough. Yeah, that's better. Grab his leg. Senor, Grab I his don't... leg and get him out of this clearing into the brush. The longer it takes to find him, the better. Uh, see? Uh, Senor Grey, we shouldn't admit this place again. It will not be safe. All right, drop him here. That's it. Uh, no, we can't use this place again. It'll be too hot. I must get back across the river. Where do we meet next time? Next time, use our old crossing. Nearly heat us. I get lost. Fast! <laughs> The body of the slain man was discovered, but for two months there was no clue to point to his killer. And then suddenly another man was shot to death on the streets of a small town in West Texas, and Captain Stinson of the Texas Rangers radioed Ranger Jace Pearson to meet him at the county morgue. Bodies on this slab, Jace. Shot right through the heart, eh, Captain? Yeah. And here's our ballistics report. 45 caliber slug. Look at the markings on this photo of it. Uh-huh. All right. Now, look at this ballistics photo. This is a report on the slug they took out of the man who was killed near the border two months ago. Yeah, I see what you mean. Both slugs came from the same gun. Mm-hmm. Autopsy report on this man completed yet? Being typed up. We'll have it in a minute. Clive Mooney's waiting for it. Mooney? Is he here? Yeah, I sent for both of you. Mooney worked on the border killing. Since it's tied up with his second killing, I thought you'd better tackle it together. Since me fine. You got some special reason for wanting to see the autopsy report, Jace? Yeah. 
Look at the body. Marks on the left forearm. Look like the kind we usually find on drug addicts. Well, we'll know in a second. Hey, here's Clyde now. Howdy, Captain. Hi, Jace. Howdy, Clyde. Good to see you, boy. Heard you talking as I come in, Jace. You hit it, all right. Here's the autopsy report. Man was a drug addict. Yeah, he's probably just as well off dead, then. Bullet ties this one right up with your border case, Clyde. Guess we're both after the same killer. Yeah. I've been hunting wetbacks for two months trying to find the man who was toting the gun no slugs came from. Anything else you boys want to see here? No, Captain. No, Captain. Well, let's get out of here, then. Any identification on this man we just saw, Captain? Not a thing. He was dressed like a hobo. Doesn't fit any of the descriptions on missing persons reports, either. Might help a lot if we knew who he was. I can't see this killing as a job done by a wetback. Why not, Jace? It was somebody sneaking across the border. Tracks weren't clear by the time the body was found down there, but there were tracks. Both your cars in back near mine? Yeah, yeah. All right, Jace, go ahead with your theory. Well, a wetback sneaking into the country to earn a few dollars working is usually too poor to own a gun, unless he's carrying something across with him. You thinking of those hypo marks, Jace? It adds up to me. Narcotics, no doubt. Might be. Man was killed in my territory could have been shot because he spotted somebody crossing with the stuff. Well, that's possible. But how about the dead man we just left? He wasn't shot near the border. Didn't look like he was down and out. Had the habit, but not the price. Might have tried to get some narcotics by threatening to expose the peddler. I'll buy that, Jace. How about you, Clyde? Best bet I've had so far. All right, Jace. Where are you planning on starting? Back along the border. What, my area? No. Killing was made that spot too hot for him. They'll go back to some old crossing that's cooled off. I know a few, and you probably know a few. Well, yeah. Place west of Laredo. Then there's uh, Devil's River. That's been quiet lately. Yeah. And the Castellon area in the Big Bend, up through Lajitas and Redford. It's a big border. Yeah. So the sooner we get started, the more of it we can cover. You're dragging a double trailer, Jay. Suppose I load my horse in with charcoal. We'll use one car. Good. Let's go. <laughs> covered the old smuggler crossings one by one. The weeks passed and we hadn't found anything by the time we reached the big bend. We were riding the river near Lajitas. Getting kind of late, Jace. We ought to make camp turn in. Yeah. We might as well quit this spot tomorrow. Move on toward Redford. There's a good campsite ahead. Clearing near that clump of honey mesquite. <laughs> You've got eyes like a cat. We'll make radio contact when we get back to the car tomorrow. Captain may have something for us. Yeah. What was it he said he'd check on? Narcotic possession cases. Trying to pin down areas where the drug traffic seems to be the heaviest. Man who's smuggling narcotics must be picking up for a central distributor. Could be just a small operator. No, small operators. Business wouldn't warrant the risk of crossing the border. Whoever makes the pickup is working for a boss. Well, why couldn't he be the distributor making his own pickup? No, big boy would play it safe. Stick somebody else's neck out, not his own. Here we are. Ooh, ooh, Charlie. Ooh, boy. Yeah. You want to get the bed rolls off, Jace? I'll strike a fire and get some chuck cooking. No. No, let's skip the fire and eat cold. Well, why? We're moving out of here tomorrow. I'd like to watch one more night. It's too quiet here. There have been reports of any trouble in this section in almost three years. We haven't even spotted a wetback trail. Okay, no fire. Might as well let the horses drink before we hobble them. Come on, Charlie. Come, Come on, boy. I want to rub Charcoal's legs down tonight. Leche Gia's been cutting him up. Yeah, and I got a few nasty scratches myself. Atta boy. Drink up. You looking for something over there, Jace? Yeah. Let the horses go for a second. Come here. Bring a flashlight. What is it? Slight depressions in this mud bank. Just barely saw them. Flash the light. Yeah. They were tracks, all right. Not much left, though. Something else here. A piece of paper half buried. Must have been stepped on. Hmm, brown. Looks like that brown stickum paper they use to seal packaging. No. This is the kind of paper a bank uses to wrap money. Look. There are traces of blue on here from an ink stain. Yeah, can you read it? No. Maybe the lab at Austin can. 
Anybody who tore a band from a packet of money in this spot must have been counting. Yeah, this isn't exactly a business neighborhood. Let's stake out, boy. We found some kind of a crossing, and it may be the one we're looking for. We didn't dare move out of the area. We took turns sleeping and keeping the horses out of sight as much as possible. At night, we crept out along the river, moving slowly under cover. Five nights now, Jace. Maybe they won't cross again in the same spots. I know. A mile above or below us, and we'd never even see them. They found tracks in a couple of places along here. They might... What? Oh. One of our horses. Thought we had something for a minute. Clyde. That isn't one of ours. It's coming from the wrong direction. Put your ear to the ground. I don't have to. I can hear him coming now. It can't be our horses. They're hobbled, and the one we hear is moving free. Come on. Don't show yourself on the riverside. That's where his contact will come from. Coming now, there's something moving in the water out there. A few hundred yards down. Our horses would have to be up the other way. We'll have to try it on foot. We haven't time to go back and get them out. They make a fast pass. We'll never get there in time anyhow. We'll have to risk a little noise. A moving horse will cover our approach until he stops. Step it up. The contact is across to this side. By now, I can't see him out there anymore. Wait. Wait. The horse is stopping. Diego? Well, here, senor. Come on, give me this stuff. Here's the money. They're not wasting any time, Jace. No. Let's go. Stay right there. Hold on. Keep going, Diego. Run. Get it, boy. I'll get the one at the river, Jace. Stop that horse. Get him, Clyde? Yeah. Shot at close range, Jason. I had to kill him. We got to leave and get after that rider. Let's get to the horses. Right. If only we'd been 50 yards closer to him back there, Jace. He went over the ridge up ahead. We can pick up his trail up there. I could swear I hit him when I fired. I hope you did. Narcotic traffic's the filthiest thing on earth. Oh, here's the ridge, Chase. Oh, boy. Oh, oh, Chaco. Yeah. Like where we have to track. Skeet and grease oil. Ground as hard as rock. Won't be much of a trail here, Jace. It'll take us hours to cut back and forth looking for soft spots. No time for that. Get off. Yeah. Uh, it's going to be too bad if I didn't hit him. Blood trail's our only chance. Yeah. They'll find another contact for narcotics across the border. Sure they will. Unless we get to the man we're after. He's the only one who can lead us to the ring on this side of the border. And we've got to get to him before he gets rid of that package. Listening to Tales of the Texas Rangers, starring Joel McRae as Ranger Jace Pearson. Today marks our first Sunday broadcast, and we sincerely hope that all our old friends who listen to us on Saturday night will be with us at this new Sunday time. Also, we extend a cordial welcome to our new listeners and hope that you'll be with us every Sunday at this time. Now we continue with tonight's case, Living Death. An authentic story from the files of the Texas Rangers. We combed the ground for a blood trail, and we found it. Not much, but enough to follow. It led through the mesquite and greasewood. The rider knew the country. He'd been weaving through the roughest spots. He's a smart one, Jace. Yeah, slowing us down all the way. Got a good hour on us by now. And an hour is too long. He's probably just using that horse to get to a car someplace. We can't waste any more time trail cutting them. No. He must have headed for cover someplace to take care of that wound. The general direction seems to be northeast. We'll have to gamble on it. Okay. That's right. Get up, Charlie. Come on. Come on. Come on. After two miles, we reached a road and picked up the trail again. We had horse tracks to follow now, and they led to a dilapidated barn near a rundown ranch house. He was 
here, all right, fine. Blood and the hay in this torn cloth ripped a piece off his shirt to make a bandage. He knew this spot and headed right for it. He must have been here before. Yeah, but we're still way behind him. Main road's only a mile or so from here. He's gotten to his car by now. The ranch house is dark. Yeah, let's wake him up. He might have seen something or heard something. We'll leave the horses here. Okay. This place sure has gone to seed, Jason. Yeah, it's a big house falling apart. Fences sagging, no stock. Must have been a nice ranch once, though. Uh, it isn't anymore. A man gets his living from the earth. You think he'd take better care of? Here's a house. Open up. Hey, wake up in there. Who is it? Texas Rangers, ma'am. We'd like to talk to you. Just a minute. she opened the door, she was carrying a candle. The inside of the house was almost barren. What do you want? We're looking for a rider who came through here tonight. He stopped in your barn. You see or hear anything? No, I didn't. You rent out a horse to anybody? <laughs> a horse? Range, if I had a horse, I'd have sold him for food for my kids. Sorry, we have to bother you, ma'am. It's all right. What difference does it make? You know anybody around who... Would you mind holding your candle over the mantle of this fireplace? Why? Jace. That picture. The picture was a photograph of a man. The face was younger, full and healthier than when we'd seen it last. There was no doubt about who it had been. Jace, that's a picture of the man we saw with the cap. The body in the morgue. No. <laughs> Take it easy, ma'am. Mama, I'm sorry. When? When did you see him? He can't be, Daddy. Can't be. I'm afraid he is, ma'am. He'll help us a lot if you'll tell us who he was. Jack Prentice. My husband. Oh, my poor kid. Why didn't you report him missing? Because he left me two years ago. He'd sold and lost everything we owned. He was sick, half crazy, acting like a madman. I don't know why I didn't do anything. It's never been like that before. You got any idea at all what started it? A friend of his. Jack was all right. He was a good husband and father till he took up with Virgil Green. Then he spent more time with him than he did with us. He must have been gambling or something. We had a good place here. Then it was all gone. This isn't going to be easy to take, ma'am. Your husband wasn't a gambler. He was a drug addict. Oh, oh why did he tell me? I begged him to go to a doctor, but he wouldn't. When did you see him last? I told you two years ago. When Virgil Green left him, Jack left right after him. You seen this Virgil Green since then? No. Do you know where Green went after he left here? No, but it must have been Chino. I got a couple of letters from Jack came from there. And then he stopped writing. Don't even know where it is. Ma'am, I hate to leave you like this, but we'll see if we can get you some help later on. Nothing can help anymore. Not for me. But I beg from you, kid. You won't have to. You'll hear from us. Come on, Clyde. We gotta get the boy who gunned her husband, Jason. We gotta get more than one. We gotta get them all. The whole ring. There'll be a hundred more like her husband, dying slower and worse than he did. You think this Virgil Green's link? It must be. Fits the cards we've been playing. Jack Prentice couldn't raise money to buy from Green, threatened to expose him, and Green killed him. Then he killed a man near the border, too. Gotta try to pick up Green and Chino. But he knew this place. It's a fair bet he's the man we've been chasing. Get up, Charlie. Oh, Taking him is going to be a pleasure. We can't take him. Not until we find out if he still has that package. We better knock on these ponies until we get to our car. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, oh. We got to the car. Before we headed for Chino, I put in a phone call to Captain Stinson. 
All right, Jace. They'll have a Ranger plane pick up that bank wrapper and send it to the lab. It may be a bank in Cheetah. Well, that fits with a few other things. My checkup shows a heavy drug traffic in and around the Cheeto area. And the town where Prentice was killed is only 60 miles from Cheeto. Good. That narrows it down. Uh, see if you can dig up a Chino address on Virgil Green while we're driving up there. He's only two hours ahead of us. If we can burn up road, we may reach there almost as soon as he does. Let you know by radio, Jeez. I'll head for Chino myself. Thanks, Captain. We'll see you there. Less than an hour out of Chino when our short wave came through with Green's address. KTXA to Unit 10. Unit 10 to KTXA. Go ahead. Address of subject Virgil Green is Greendale Ranch, State Highway 39, 14 miles west of Chino. Got it. Any report from lab on bank money wrapper? Stamp on money wrapper restored by Austin Lab. Money and packet came from Chino State Bank, corner Main and Crockett in Chino. 10-4, unit 10, clear. KDXA, Austin. That's all we need, Jace. Yeah, we can get Green in sight before he unloads that package. It was dark when we reached the Greendale Ranch outside of Chino. We made up time on Green's head start because we saw a car and horse trailer pull into the ranch just ahead of us. A man got out of the car and limped up to the house, and he was carrying a package. Walks like a man's been shot in the leg, Jace. Yeah. Don't turn in after him. Go on past the ranch. Okay. Where do you want to stop? Where we can watch the house and keep the car shielded. Well, there was some heavy brush on the other side of the road just across from Green's place. All right. Turn around and go back. And keep an eye on him from there. on Green's house all night, but nobody showed to pick up the package. The next morning, Green came out and got into his car. We followed him into Chino. He's pulling into a parking space up near the next corner, Jace. Yeah, slow down. He's getting out. He's got the package, all right, sticking out of his pocket. Park here, quick. He's going into that building on the corner. Come on, before we lose him. Hey. Street sign, Main and Crockett. And he went in there, Jace. Chino State Bank. That's where the money wrapper came from. Don't go in. Just walk around the corner. We can look through the bank windows. There he is, Jace. Last counter, the rear of the bank. Safe deposit boxes. Going through the rail into the vault. Must have a box he's going to plant the stuff in. We're going to grab him? No. Wait till he comes out. But he won't have it on him then. We've got enough on him. We can pick him up any time. We've got to stay with that package until we know who gets it next. Hey, he wasn't in there long. He's coming out. Package isn't in his pocket now. All right, get out of sight. He yeah. was in there just long enough to open up the box and drop it. Yeah, you've seen the package now. Drift around to the front of the bank. See that nobody leaves that vault with it unless you follow him. Okay, well, where are you going? Meet the captain and get a court order to open that vault. We got the order. Then we waited until the bank closed and the employees were out. We got the president of the bank at his home and took him back to open the vault. Narcotics, eh? Most distressing, gentlemen. Oh, come in, please. All right. Which box is Green's? 421, right here. You want to open it for us? Of course. What? It's, it's empty. Now, couldn't you have made a mistake, Ranger? No. Clyde, are you sure that package wasn't taken out? Positive, Jace. I watched every single person went in or out till the bank closed. Our order covers the rest of these boxes, doesn't it, Captain? Yes. All right. Let's open them all. <laughs> found what we were after, not the way we expected to find it. The stuff was there, all right, but it had been split up into smaller quantities. 
Owners of these boxes must be names you have on your list of dope peddlers then, Captain. I'll check that on the bank records. Yeah, but how'd this stuff get split up? Green wasn't in here long enough to do it. Oh, he couldn't have done it. His key would only give him access to his own box. It'd have to be done by somebody with a set of duplicate keys. Somebody working here. Well, that's impossible. Only the head cashier and I have duplicate keys. Were you in the vault after the bank closed? No, sir. I haven't been in here all day. That's the truth, Jace. I could see him through the window. And the head cashier is our boy. He's the distributor. And a pretty clever distribution scheme, too. No direct contact, and he has access to the vault after the guard has left. If he's handled those packets, there'll be fingerprints on them. What's his name and where does he live? His name is August Weber. He's got a big ranch over near Estrella on Highway 39. And I know how he got it now. He said he was making money on investments. Investments? He meant a black market in human souls. Come on, Clyde. Let's get him and Virgil Green. <laughs> building on a fine ranch. There was another car in the driveway when we pulled up. Hey, Jason. That car in front of the place. We're in luck. It's the car Virgil Green was driving. Light around the side of the house by that French door. Maybe they didn't hear us drive in. Good. Slip up on that side of the porch and find out. Might be able to take him easy. Uh, Don't count on it. Cold-blooded killer like Green. He'd keep on killing as long as he has a gun. We slipped up to the French door. It was locked and we couldn't see through. But the horses drifted out through an open window. Tell you, wherever my leg's infected, I gotta see a doctor. Have him report a bullet wound. You want me to die? I can put a bullet in you, too. Let me know when you want me to try. Tell me to kill myself, Marie. I haven't smart about it. Nobody's caught me yet. All right, Clyde. Let's kick a hole in this door. All right. No move. No breach. Clyde. You hurt bad? My, my side. You, you're hit too, Jace. Blood on your head. Uh, just a nick. I'll get you to a hospital. How about... How about them? Leave them for the coroner. They're both dead. gun found beside the body of Virgil Green proved to be the murder weapon the Rangers had been seeking. Narcotics peddlers having safe deposit boxes at the Chino State Bank were rounded up, and they admitted they had been supplied by August Weber. They were tried and sentenced. The traffic in living death was halted. Joel McRae. A friend of mine returned recently from a visit to Texas. While he was there, he'd seen a Texas ranger, and he asked his host, a rancher, what the requirements were for a man who wanted to be a ranger. The host looked thoughtful for a moment and said, Well, I'd say if a man could ride like a Mexican, trail like an Indian, shoot like a Tennessean, fight like the devil, he might have a chance to get in. (laughs) Now, I hope you'll be with us again next week. Same time, same station. Good night. Next week, Joel McRae in another authentic reenactment of a case from the files of the Texas Rangers. Joel McRae is currently seen starring in the MGM production Stars in My Crown. Tonight's cast included Tony Barrett, Barney Phillips, Larry Dobkin, Byron Kane, Ken Harvey, and Lillian Byers. This story was transcribed and adapted by Joel Murcott, and the program was produced and directed by Stacy Keach. This is Hal Gibney speaking. Three 
chimes mean good times on NBC. The National Broadcasting Company presents Joel McRae in Tales of the Texas Rangers. Tonight, transcribed from Hollywood, another authentic reenactment of a case from the files of the Texas Rangers. Tales of the Texas Rangers, starring Joel McRae as Ranger Jace Pearson. Texas, more than 260,000 square miles. And 50 men who make up the most famous and oldest law enforcement body in North America. these stories based on fact. Only names, dates, and places are fictitious for obvious reasons. The events themselves are a matter of record. Case for tonight, Dead Giveaway. It is 1.30 a.m. December 4th, 1940. A single light glows in the living room of a farmhouse four miles from the town of Ashton in West Texas. Inside the house, a frantic young woman tries to place a telephone call. Operator. Operator. Oh, please. Operator. Operator. Get me the sheriff, quickly. Is that you, Mrs. Deneen? Yes, yes. Hi. Well, this is Mary Lou, Mrs. Deneen. I work at night now. Is some Mary Lou, stop talking and get me the sheriff. Oh, awesome. Sheriff Ross speaking. Sheriff, this is Mrs. Deneen. You've got to come out to my house right away. Right away. Now take it easy, Mrs. Deneen. What seems to be wrong? Somebody's prowling around outside, trying to get into the house. Isn't your husband there? No. He went to Ethelene on business. Something woke me up. I thought at first it was the baby. And then I heard a noise outside. <gasps> Mrs. Deneen, what is it? Somebody came in. I'll be right there. Sheriff Ross less than 15 minutes to get to the Deneen farm. But Mrs. Deneen and her four-month-old baby were dead when he arrived. The sheriff called for the assistance of the Texas Rangers. Ranger Jace Pearson was assigned. Jace Pearson? Yes, yeah, Sheriff. He got here right quick. Yeah, I was over the next county to your call came through. Well, I hope he got a little sleep because you won't get much now. Better come in out of this cold. How long ago did it happen? About a half hour ago, 1.30, Miss Deneen called me, woke me up at home, said somebody was trying to bust in. Right in here, Jace. Got right through the chest, huh? Yeah. Did she leave the phone hanging off the hook like that? I reckon so. Whoever broke in, they broke in just before I hung up. Nothing's been touched, Jace. I know. I had a time getting past your deputies down the main road. The phone operator's been buzzing everybody. We don't want half the county bars in here messing things up, so I blocked them off. Good. Where's the baby? Here. In there, the front bedroom. You can look if you want to, Jason. A little more than I can take twice. Oh, only four months, Jason. Little girl. Where'd he break in? Side door, I'll show you. Where's the husband? Abilene, on business. I call the chief of police there. He's going to check the hotels and notify him. Now, here's the door. It was wide open. That's how I got in to open the front door. The lock doesn't seem to be broken. Must have been picked. The Neens keep much money around the house? As little or as much as most folks, I guess. But I don't think any's missing. There's Mr. The Neens' purse on the kitchen table. Killer couldn't have missed that. You check it? Yeah, about $40. It hasn't been touched. Well, it wasn't robbery then, Sheriff. No. There's no sign of any other motive. There's got to be one, Jake. Yeah. The toughest motive of all. Because it's the easiest hidden. Hate. The kind of hate the devil wouldn't hold. Uh, 
went through the rest of the house, but we didn't find anything that would help us until we got outside. It's cold tonight, Chase. The ground's frozen hard. Yeah. If we find a trace, it won't be much. Keep your flash close to the ground. All right. Why are you working back of the house here, away from the driveway? Because I think the killer came in from this direction, probably on foot. Why? Well, you said Mrs. Deneen told you she woke up when she heard somebody prowling around outside. Yeah. Of course, or a car coming up the gravel road around front would have made even more noise. Woke her up sooner. Say, that's right. I heard your car coming from quite a ways off. That's why I was standing out in front to meet you when you drove hey, up. Wait a minute. What is it, Chase? It's a bailing wire. It's in the shape of a key. Well, that must about be what he used to get in. Maybe. Or maybe that's what somebody wants us to think. Let's take another look at that door. Yeah. What makes you think the wire was planted there, Jason? I'll tell you better when we try it in the lock. Beats me why a killer leaves something deliberately. That's what makes me think something's wrong. This wouldn't have been dropped so close to the house. And grab the door and hold it up high. I don't want to mess up any prints around the lock. You got it. Now, let's see how this wire fits. Yeah. Goes in perfect, Chase. Yeah. Watch when I turn it. Yeah. Hey, wire's just twisting. It'll keep on twisting. This wire isn't strong enough to turn the tumbler in the lock. Then how did the killer get in, Chase? If you ask me, Sheriff, I think he had a regular key. <laughs> and started trailing again. We found a few directional traces, but they petered out in the dark. Can't see anything at night on this ground, Jason. Try cutting back and forth a little further. Yeah. And then we're following what we've been trying to throw us off. It just makes it tougher to track. You've got to be headed for some place, some definite direction. You might as well establish which direction. Yeah. I guess there's nothing much we can do except this until we have some daylight. Save us an hour in the morning. Then we can track on horses without wasting time finding out which way to go. By sunup, we knew the killer's general direction had been west. The sheriff got his horse from town. I unloaded charcoal from the trailer and we rode. He kept heading west, all right. But there's nothing out this way for miles once he got into those hills up ahead. Any kind of a road between here and the hills? Yeah, old wagon road just beyond the scrub on the rise we're coming to. Does it connect with the state road? It does, but nobody uses it. Maybe somebody did. Is it in good enough condition for a car to run through? Reckon it is. You figure you had a car waiting for him? Had to have a car or a horse faked out someplace. Come on, let's make right for the road. Hey, get up, get up. Wagon road lead to any other farm in the area? Used to lead to old Mullen place. That's burned out. Nobody living there anymore, huh? No, no old folks dead. Young Ted Mullen moved away a couple of years ago. Oh, here's the road. Oh, 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 sharp. Had a pretty straight last track we saw. Must have reached the road right near here. Yeah, we'll find some mark if he crossed it and kept going. He didn't keep going, huh? Look. Ooh. Tire track. Had a car staked out, all right. Turned the car around here to head back for the highway. Could have been somebody else waiting in the car for him. Maybe, but I don't think so. Now, look at the heel marks. Walked around to the driver's side of the car to get in. Yeah. Something else here, too. Got this cigarette butt and stepped on it. Yeah. Sure didn't smoke much of it. Burned down to the brand mark. At least we know what brand he smokes. About all we do know, Jace. Won't be anything to follow at the main road. He sure won't leave a trail there. No. Mount up. Let's get back to the house. We rode back to Denise. As we came to the farm, we saw a couple of cars that hadn't been there when we left. Looks like company, Sheriff. The car next to mine belongs to our lab. The others must be the coroners. Oh, the coroner ought to have been and gone by now. No, no, that isn't the coroner's car. It's blue sedan. That belongs to Walter Deneen. A husband? Yeah, must have got back from Abilene. Yeah, it's Deneen, all right. There he is, sitting on the side porch. Mm. 
Walter Deneen sat with his face buried in his hands until we dismounted and walked up to him. The lab crew was in the house looking for latent prints. Howdy, Walter. Oh, howdy, sir. Walter, I can't tell you how... Don't say anything, please. Ask me anything you like, but I don't want anybody else telling me how sorry they are. You better let me talk to you, sir. Sure, sure. Mr. Deneen, it would help us a lot to know one thing. You or your family have any enemies? Enemies? Could there be an enemy as bad as this? I know the house wasn't robbed. Have you ever had any trouble with anybody, uh, no matter how small it seemed? Now's the time to remember. If there was anybody, I wouldn't tell you. I'd take care of it myself. That's no way to be, Walter. Don't go telling me how to act, Sheriff. You didn't come home to your house ten minutes ago. You didn't find your wife and kids. We are not fine. Mr. Deneen, why don't you try to get the rest? We'll talk to you later. Yeah, okay. Anything I can do, Walter, just holler. Yeah. You been able to think of anybody who might have had it in for him? Not a soul, Jace. Unless it was Ted Mullen. The one you told me about? Family that was burned out? Yeah. But, Jace, that was five years ago. Sometimes hate doesn't die with age. What happened? Well, old folks just got to brooding and died off after that house burned. Young Ted blamed Walter. Why? Windmill at the Mullen place was busted. They tried to borrow from Walter to get it fixed, but he turned him down. Ted said if the mill had been working, it would have pumped enough water for him to put the fire on. And Mullen the kind to hold a grudge? After five years, Jace. And he moved out a long time ago. Where? Who knows? Come on. I'll call my headquarters by radio. Maybe they can get a line on Mullen. All right. They find out where he is, won't do any harm to check on where he was. Last I reckon night. he won't hurt any. But I can't believe that a man after... Yeah, hold it. Huh. Well, that's only Walter's car, Jace. What are you looking at? Design of the tire there. Look at him. Oh, that may be. It's the same design we saw on the dirt road where the killer picked up a car to make his getaway. But, Jace, that was hard ground. You barely see the tread. And tires like that are standard on lots of cars. Yeah. Just the same. I'm going to look this car over. his ignition keys in. You gonna start it? No. I just want to take a look at the dash. He said he got back from Abilene ten minutes ago, didn't he? That's what he said. Take a look at that temperature gauge. Oh, let's see. Register's cold. Yeah. And it should be pretty warm if he finished the drive a couple of hundred miles just ten minutes ago. Could have dropped back, Jace. Not in ten minutes, sure. It's a cold morning, but not that cold. I want to talk to Deneen again, eh? You see something else? I sure do. Look at this on the frame of the door. Service station lubrication sticker. Dated December 2nd, the day before yesterday. 18,412 miles. The mileage on the dash shows he's driven less than 200 miles since then. He couldn't have been in Abilene. Oh, well, wait a minute, Jace. I admit that looks funny, but... The man we were chasing, he ground out a cigarette, remember? Well, what about it? I've known Walter since he was a boy, Jace. He don't smoke. Sheriff! Oh, Mary Lou Simmons, phone operator. Who let you in, Mary Lou? I told the deputy I put Mrs. Neen's call through to you last night. He thought you might want to call to me. Ain't it just awful? I, I, I was still on the line after you hung up, Sheriff. I heard it all, the shots and everything. Do you hear any voice beside Mrs. Deneen? No. No, I just heard her say, who are you, what do you want, and then the shot. That was all. Are you sure she said, who are you? Oh, cross my heart, I heard it as plain. Guess you don't want to talk to Walter now, do you, Jace? I guess not. are listening to Tales of the Texas Rangers, starring Joel McRae as Ranger Jace Pearson. And now we continue with tonight's case, Dead Giveaway, an authentic story from the files of the Texas Rangers. I didn't want to question Walter Deneen until I had a chance to check on his movements. The sheriff and I drove into town and called the Abilene police. The answer didn't fit. Don't think there's any doubt about who he was, Ranger. 
Okay, thanks. Thanks very much. Well, I guess that does it, Sheriff. Dean was in Abilene, huh? Uh-huh. Checked into the Harris Hotel yesterday about noon. Checked out again at 2.10 this morning, right after the police notified him of the murder. Police could have spoken to anybody on the phone. And they didn't tell him by phone. Police sergeant went up and told him direct. Mm -hmm. Description of Walter tallies, too. And there's something that doesn't tally, though. The mileage on that car. Could be something wrong with the speedometer cable. Happened in my car a few weeks back. Maybe. And I'll be back sometime tomorrow. Where are you going, Chase? Abilene. I hit the highway, I put in a shortwave call to headquarters, station KTXA. Unit 10 to KTXA. KTXA, go ahead, Unit 10. This unit en route to Abilene. Request Abilene police secure names of all contacts made by subject Walter Deneen, registered Harris Hotel, there yesterday. Will do, Unit 10. Unit 10 sent piece of wire back to lab for examination. Any report yet? Not yet. Wire and fingerprints both under study. We'll give you a call. 10 4, Unit 10, clear. KDXA Austin. When I reached Abilene, I got a complete rundown on Walter Deneen's activities. It was too complete. Like he was making sure his time in the city would be accounted for. One of the people who'd seen him was his attorney. Why? Well, Yes. Yes, Ranger. Mr. Deneen spent several hours with me yesterday afternoon. We had dinner together last night. Went to the theater. What did he come to see you about? Well, some investments. He's been doing a little speculating, huh? Good or bad? Well, it's client business, and I don't think I have the right to discuss it. I can find out by checking with the exchange. I'm just asking you to save time. All right. His losses have been... Rather heavy. More than he could afford? How much more? He carry much insurance on his wife and child? No, Mother Mount, nothing large. All right, thanks. One more thing. Are you sure Deneen doesn't benefit financially by his wife's death? Ranger, he couldn't have gotten back to Ashton by 1.30 last night after we'd been out. That isn't what I asked. Well... Mrs. Deneen had a good bit of money in her own right. In case of her death, though, she had it tied up in trust for the child. But the child is dead, too. What happens now? Well, in that case, the entire state will probably go to Mr. Deneen. I made one more stop before I headed back to Ashton paid a visit to the garage at the Hotel Harris. I keep the location of all guest cars on this index rack so we'll know which stores they're in when they want them. Was Walter Deneen's car in here yesterday? Deneen? That's um, D-I-N, isn't it? Uh-huh. No, there was no record of it. Was he a guest at the hotel? Yes. Is there any parking lot around here he might have used? Not convenient to the hotel, and parking is free here for guests, so I don't think he can use a lot. But neither do I. Thanks. Before I left Abilene, I called my headquarters. They had a report. No strange prints had been found in Nadine's house. The wire key looked like a plant. I hung up and made another call to Sheriff Ross. I'm beginning to wonder about Walter myself, Jason. Why? He's been kind of curious about where you are. I told him you went to Abilene just to see if it would draw him out. Good. How'd he react? Kind of nervous. Then he said something about flying up to Abilene and back. Of course, he never did say he drove it. No, but he gave the impression that he drove. Even so, he was there when the killer took place. Yeah, but the killer had the use of Deneen's car. Can you get your hands on the car? It's over and back in the funeral parlor right now. That's where Deneen said he was going just a few minutes ago when he stopped by to ask about you. Grab that car and check it for fingerprints. I'll be there as fast as I can roll. Are all worked over, Sheriff? Yeah. Ought to have reports on the prints soon. Send them to Austin. Find any strangers? Quite a few of one set that weren't Deneen's. The 
They belong to a professional killer, there's a good chance he'll have a record. Where's Denise? My deputies are out looking for him. Why? I thought he was at the funeral park. So did I, until I went in to look for him after we finished on the car. Undertaker said he'd left more than an hour ago by the front door. Must have spotted you working over the car. Come on, let's find him. Yeah. Not at the house, not any place in town. Where could he be if he hasn't run out? Trying to cover up for a couple of mistakes? He won't run, not yet. Why? Because his alibi is airtight. We can shake it. Unless we find the killer he hired, we can't shake it enough. He took a big gamble, and he's got too much at stake to run off. His wife's money? How'd you know about that? Just thinking back. A little late. Folks knew Mrs. Deneen's family left her well off. Walter married her not long after they passed on. A lot of people thought the money had something to do with it. Wish you'd remember that sooner. Well, Jace, they seemed close. And then there's the baby. The baby was just something extra that got into Neen's way. Oh. Never gotten any of the money. If... KTXA and Unit 10. Maybe report on the prince. Mm. Unit 10. Go ahead, KTXA. Have report on prince lifted from the car in Ashton, Texas. One set identified as belonging to Joe Crofton. Joe Crofton. Uh, any line on his whereabouts? Finished serving parole four months ago. Last address known to parole office was shack located west of the slope of Casket Mountain. 10-4, unit 10, clear. The Crofton must be the killer then, Chase. I'll bet on it. How far to Casket Mountain? About 20 miles and turn south, another five. After that, well, we'll need horses if he's far up. Should have brought your horse along the trailer with charcoal. I can borrow one. Crofton's gonna be tough to take. You sound like you know him. I wrote the ticket for his last trip to Huntsville six years ago. That was murder, too, but he copped out with a manslaughter plea. Better not take any chances, Jason. If he starts shooting, we'll have to toss it back dead center. No. You gotta take him alive. He'll talk to keep from burning once we get him. Yeah. Yeah, I see. If Walter Deneen paid him to do the job, he's the only one who can break Deneen's alibi. That's right. So no matter what happens, we gotta take him alive. <laughs> Crofton's cabin was up all right, way up. The sheriff borrowed a horse from the man who directed us. Quite a climb, Jase. Well, not so bad following this marsh, though. Suppose he isn't there. I got a hunch he will be. I don't think Deneen had enough money to pay for this killing. He was almost broke. You mean he planned to pay off out of his wife's money when he got it? Yeah. Uh, I wonder how Walter arranged for him to get the car that night. Not much to arrange. Left it near the airport with the keys in it. Crofton brought it back and left it in the same spot. Probably left the house key for him, too. Glove compartment, maybe. Yeah. With the airport 40 miles from Ashton, nobody recognized the car or a strange driver. Come in at night, use an abandoned road. Yeah. Look, huh? Hey, another horse left tracks in here, too. Yeah. They're fresh. Ooh. Ooh. Ooh, oh, boy. It must be Crofton's horse. No. Glad it was taking the rough way. Just cut into the wash here to find a better trail. Crofton lives up here. He'd know the best trail. Who else be coming up here? Denny, to shut him up. Come on. Yeah, here, Charcoal. give off. Not too fast, Jason. We'll spill. We gotta risk it. Too slow, we'll be too late. <laughs> the shack and crept up on it. There was no horse around and no sign of light. Tried to draw fire by showing ourselves, but none came. We had to go in. All right. Hold your gun ready, Sheriff. And don't come in till I call you. Right, Chase. All right, Sheriff. Come in. Nobody here, huh? Well, wait a... Oh... That Crawford? Yeah, that's him. Deneen got here first. Jace, this fellow looks like he shot himself. Guns in his own hand. Hey, what's his paper beside him? Let's see. Jace, he did kill himself. This note says so. Confesses the murders, too. Sure it does. But Walter Deneen wrote that. And that note's gonna hang him. How do you know? You ever seen Deneen's writing? No. But I've seen Crawford's before. He 
signed his name with an X. Prison records show he's illiterate. Never could read or write. Come on, Sheriff. Gonna put out a pickup for Deneen? We'll pick him up ourselves. He can't be far off. But if he'd headed back down the wash, we'd have passed him on our way up. He must be going across the top of the mountain to go down the other side. Come on. Yeah. our horses as fast as they could move. We spotted a rider ahead of us as he topped the slope. He heard us because he looked back and whipped his mouth and disappeared. He knows we're on him. Got about 300 yards. We'll get him. Keep pounding leather. Yeah. We're coming to the top now. Keep low on the saddle. Watch out for an ambush. There he is. Don't go down too fast, Sheriff. Your horse will tumble to the down grade. The knee was pressing too hard, Jay. He fell. Look. Behind the rocks. Whoa, whoa, charcoal. Oh, charcoal. Yeah. Who? Hit the dirt. Let's go. Go on, Charcoal. Go on. He's down under that rock shelf. Perfect cover. Not too far. Bullets will ricochet back from that ledge behind you. See that dent in the ledge? Yeah. Draw your gun and you'll empty it on it. Hit right below the dent. All right. All right. Let's hope for a billiard shot. Start firing. You met Crawford. Come on, Walter, talk up. I, I, I saw his picture in the paper when he got out of jail. I, I made a deal with him a couple of months ago. Yeah. A deal to wipe out your own wife and kid. Oh, Must be great to be as brave as you are. Get up, Deneen. You've got a long way to go. Deneen confessed and made a plea for clemency. It was not granted. And on the 11th day of October 1947, he died in the electric chair at Huntsville. And now, here again is the star of our show, Joel McRae with another interesting anecdote about the Texas Rangers. When the Allies invaded Normandy in World War II, they got an idea as to how far the fame of the Texas Rangers had spread. Both surrendering Nazis and liberated free French said they knew the war was as good as over because the Texas Rangers had landed. Of course, it was the heroic American Ranger troops who made the landings, but nothing could convince the Nazi war prisoners that these were not the terrible Texans they'd heard about in many American legends. Good night, folks. See you same time next week. Next week, Joel McRae in another authentic reenactment of a case from the files of the Texas Rangers. Joel McRae is currently seen starring in the Universal International Technicolor production Saddle Trend. Tonight's cast included Tony Barrett, Lorreen Tuttle, Mike Barrett, Hal March, and Paul Freese. This story was transcribed and adapted by Joel Murcott, and the program was produced and directed by Stacy Keach. This is Hal Gibney speaking. Three chimes mean good times on NBC. Monday means music. Fine music on NBC. Listen tomorrow for these great musical programs, the NBC Symphony and the Band of America. Be sure to listen Monday as Milton Kadams conducts the NBC Symphony Orchestra in a full-hour concert of the finest music on the air. And listen, too, for Paul Laval conducting the Band of America every Monday on NBC. Bill Harris reminding you that next it's Theater Guild on NBC. The National Broadcasting Company presents... 
Joel McRae in Tales of the Texas Rangers. Tonight, transcribed from Hollywood, another authentic reenactment of a case from the files of the Texas Rangers. Tales of the Texas Rangers, starring Joel McRae as Ranger Jace Pearson. Texas, more than 260,000 square miles. And 50 men who make up the most famous and oldest law enforcement body in North America. From the files of the Texas Rangers come these stories based on facts. Only names, dates, and places are fictitious for obvious reasons. The events themselves are a matter of record. Case for tonight, Soft Touch. It is 11 a.m. on a Sunday in August 1949. A blue sedan comes to a stop in front of a ranch house 30 miles from the town of Salt Flats, Texas. Come on, kids. This is Grandma's house. What? Bill, huh? hey, let them sleep. We started so early, they're tired. Well, we can't leave them in the car. <laughs> if we wake them up now, they'll never finish their naps. We'll bring them in in a few minutes. <laughs> okay. Getting up at 4 a.m. was kind of early, even for them. <laughs> Hey, look. Pa's painted the windmill. Mm. Oh, Phil, I love this place. I wish we didn't live so far away. Yeah. We don't get here often. Hey, wonder where the folks are. They usually stand in the middle of the road waiting for us when they know we're bringing the kids for a visit. Oh, the door's open. Your mother's probably in the kitchen cooking enough food for a dozen. Yeah. Don't smell anything cooking. Ma? Ma? You home? Maybe they're still at church. No, they're always back by 10 o'clock. The garage door was closed, too. Pa always leaves it open when he's got the car out. Oh, then they must be in back someplace. Yeah. Hey, Ma? Ma, where are you? I've never known your mother to be any place but in the kitchen, though. Yeah, but she doesn't hear so well anymore. Let's take a look. Ma? Hmm. Nobody here, Judy. Yeah. Bill, what's that spilled on the floor at the door to the pantry? Huh? Hey, Judy, it looks like blood. Oh, Bill. Ma! Oh! Oh, good Lord. Ma! It's dead. Oh. Bill, honey, come away. Come away. Oh. murder of the rancher and his wife was reported. Texas Ranger Jace Pearson was notified by shortwave radio. He reached the ranch house less than one hour after the bodies were discovered. I'm sorry to have to ask questions at a time like this, Mr. Ross. It's all right. My, my kids are asleep in the car, though. Mind if my wife takes them in town? I won't leave you here, Bill. Please, honey, I'll be all right. I don't want the kids to come in here even know about this. Might be best, ma'am. I'll, I'll meet you at the hotel later. All right. Better tell me anything you know, Mr. Ross. Yeah. Well, we drove out from Fort Worth this morning. That's my home now. I'm a commercial artist. This is the first time we've been here in five months. Hello, Sheriff. Howdy, Ranger. Your wife told us to come right in, Bill. Sure, I'm sorry. Yeah, it's, it's... I'd have known something was wrong when I didn't see your folks at services this morning. They never did miss. You better go on with what you were telling me, Mr. Ross. There's nothing else to tell. Judy noticed the blood in the kitchen by, by the pantry door. Okay. Better take a look at him, Sheriff. Mm -hmm. uh, just one thing more, Mr. Ross. Your parents have any enemies you know of? No. Jed and Martha Ross never made an enemy in their whole lives, Ranger. Say... You don't, you don't want me to go in there with you, do you? No, it won't be necessary. 
Just take it easy. Kitchen's here. They took a pretty cruel beat, Ranger. Yeah. Sign of a weapon, though. Hey, help me move the old man's body a little. Sure. Take it easy here. and then put in here. Blood comes mostly from hemorrhaging, though, not so much from cuts. I think a weapon would have cut him up more than that. Unless it was wrapped or something. Only one other thing I can think of. Bare fists. Mm -hmm. Hey, what's this? Let me see. Oh, just a little hook of paper. Yeah, crumpled, too. A piece of a larger sheet. The rest of it must have been torn away. Mm -hmm. It was like a good grade of letterhead paper mean anything to you? If we find the rest of the paper this came from, no. But if we don't, it could mean plenty. Like what? The way this is crumpled might have been part of something the old man was hanging on to and somebody tried to get it away from him. Mm. I'm going to send this into our lab at Austin. Looks like this happened sometime last night. That's something we'll know when we get an autopsy report. to have the bodies and the piece of paper picked up. And then we checked around the outside of the house. The gravel road wouldn't hold a car track. But behind the house, we found marks where a horse had been tied. I got charcoal out of the trailer, and the sheriff got a horse from the ranch barn. We went right toward the southeast quarter. Ross has 200 acres and cotton down there. Yeah, I see it. Might have ridden over there yesterday on one of his own horses. No. The horse that made this trail wasn't one of Ross's. The pony we're following has a spread hoof. Ooh. Look. See the marks? Mm. Bar across the frog on the right forefoot. Yeah. Wondered why you were checking the shoes on the horses back there in the barn. Yeah, that's why. Loan's the adjoining place. Other side of the cotton. Big Chuck Whitaker. Now let's get moving. I want to have a talk with this Big Chuck Whitaker. Come on, Charlie. Hey, hey, hey. Yeah, I was over there yesterday afternoon, but I didn't kill nobody. Well, that's very interesting, Mr. Whitaker, because we didn't tell you anything about anybody being killed. I know you didn't, Ranger. My phone happens to be on the same party line as the Ross Ranch. I heard their son Bill call when he found him this morning. You make a habit of listening in? I had a call to make. I picked up the phone I heard. Couldn't help it. Now, if you're through asking questions, I'd like to go back to men this morning. That can wait, Chuck. You're not exactly broken up about losing your neighbors. Ranger, I got troubles enough in all of Why did you go to Ross's yesterday? What time were you there? In the evening, just before sundown. Ross was fixing to have some crop dusting done again. I wanted to talk to him about it. About doing the job for him? No, Ranger, the crop dusting plane comes down from Salt Flats. Oh. Well, go ahead, Whitaker. And then last time Ross dusted the spray he carried over on my place. Some of my cattle water down near that cost and made him sick. Did Ross say he'd watch out for it? Yeah. And that was all? That was all. And I come home. All right, Whitaker. Come on, Sheriff. Go ahead. Go on, Chuck. Yeah. Easy, boy. Yeah. <clears throat> Hey, hey, wait a minute. Whoa, whoa. Hey, Chuck. Now, just saw something. When I left Ross's place just before dark, a car drove up as I came around the house. Who was in it? Man, that's all I know. You didn't see his face? No. The only thing that makes me think of it was something I noticed. The car wasn't from around here. Well, how do you know? Well, they had one of them fancy frames around the license plate. You know the things mean that... Like the name of the town stamped on it. Did you notice the stamp? Yeah. The car was from San Antonio. San Antonio. Huh? Thanks. Yeah. Let's go, Sheriff. Get up, Chuck. Help, help. Good thing you noticed that car and remembered it. Might be a big help. Yeah. Might be a big lie, too. That man's hard. He just acts hard, Ranger. Kind of sour since his wife ran off with one of his cow hands a few years back. But he don't need no harm. Maybe not. He makes a bad impression. He's liable to send more flowers to Ross' funeral than most anybody around. I've known killers to do that before, too. Ah! 
We checked other ranchers in the area, but we didn't get any information until next morning at the sheriff's office. Morning, Jace. Heard anything from your headquarters yet? No. Wait for him to call me now. What's that? The autopsy report? Yeah. Medical examiner seems to agree with your idea. Death might have been caused by a beating with fists. Hmm. Pretty thorough job of beating. You read this? Yeah. The woman died of a broken neck. Struck right at the base of the brain. Rabbit punch. Yeah. Old man Ross hemorrhaged to death, like you said. Broken jaw, broken nose, ribs smashed in under the heart. Vessels ruptured from being beaten on the kidneys and in the solar plexus. I'd like to get my hands on anybody who'd do that. If you did get your hands on him, you'd have your hands full. Whoever did it was big, and he could hit. Plenty hard and in just the right spots. You still got Chuck Whitaker on your mind? Only because he fits the bill in a few ways. Never hurt nobody before. No, but he's a bitter man. That kind can... Excuse me. Hello? Yes, he's here. Here. For you, Jace. Captain Stinson calling long distance. Thanks. Hello, Cap. Hello, Jace. Who's got a report on the scrap of paper you sent him? Special type. The paper stock indicates the original sheet was a letterhead printed in the government printing office in Washington. Know which bureau? No, but we're checking. But try and find out if any department there has had any correspondence with Jed Ross recently. That's what we're doing. But don't expect anything in a hurry. I won't. Bye, Jace. Bye, Cap. Find out where the paper come from? Yeah, some government office in Washington. You been checking on that car from San Antonio? One Whitaker told us about? Yeah. Nobody I found saw it. How about you? Nobody. Seems like the only one did see it was Chuck Whitaker. I hate to admit it, Jace, but it's beginning to look that way. Let's get our horses. I want to see Whitaker again. <laughs> When you've known a man all your life, you hate to think he's a murderer. On the other hand, you hate to see a neighbor get killed, too. Whitaker's telling the truth. He's got nothing to worry about. I feel mighty sorry for young Bill Ross. He was all busted up at the funeral parlor. Tough for him to take it alone. He made his wife and kids go back to Fort Worth. He the only child? Bill? Yeah. Only one living, that is. Had a sister, Joan. Nice a girl as you ever see. What happened to her? She was a Navy nurse. Got killed in the Solomon Islands during the war. Ross has sure had this share of trouble, all right. The trouble somebody ought to pay for. Hey, look. There's Whitaker now on a pony coming toward us. Just rode out of the gully. Yeah. Get up, John. Get point. Oh, 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 oh. Coming back to see me, huh? That's right, Whitaker. You think I've been lying to you, don't you, Ranger? I take it easy, Chuck. Get one thing straight, Whitaker. I got nothing against you or any man, not personally. But I do intend to find the man who killed your neighbors. Well, then you can stop looking around my place. Sheriff, I rode out to meet you because your office called. We both wanted back in town. Why? Because I ain't blind and I ain't lying. One of the sheriff's deputies has found somebody else who saw that car from San Antonio. are listening to Tales of the Texas Rangers, starring Joel McRae as Ranger Jace Pearson. And now we continue with tonight's case, Soft Touch. We went back to town and from there to a roadside cafe about 15 miles out the state highway. Yeah, I sure did see the car, like I told the deputy. It had that thing my jig on the license plate. Noticed it when I give him some gas. Are you sure it was on Saturday, huh? It sure was. About five o'clock, I'd say. Guess there's not much traffic from San Antonio comes through here, does it, Sheriff? Nope, we're off the main U.S. highways. Anybody coming down here on a state road would have to have some business around here someplace. You remember the man in the car? No, I sure do. After I give him the gas, he'd come in for some coffee. Can you describe him? 
three days ago, but he's better than six feet, maybe 200 pounds. Then, of course, there was his face. What was wrong with it? Well, Sheriff, his face looked like he tried to bulldog a steer on rocky ground and lost. It sure was scarred up. He bleeding any place? Oh, no, Ranger. I didn't mean fresh scarred. I reckon he looked that way for a long time. And when he left here, did he drive on towards Salt Flats? He sure did. Wasn't nobody else in here when he stopped and or when he left, so I didn't have nothing much to do when I was watching him go off. He's going in the direction of the Ross Ranch, all right? Yeah. But who was it? That's what I'm going to find out if I can. Uh, Bill Ross said he's a commercial artist, didn't he? Yeah, why? Because I want to bring him out here, get a detailed description of that face, and see if Ross can draw something that comes close to it. We sent for Bill Ross. Before he joined us at the sheriff's office, something else turned up. Long distance call from Captain Stinson. We found out what that letter from Washington might have been, Jeez. Good, Captain. Let's have it. Well, it might have been from the Veterans Administration. Answer to a letter Jed Ross wrote asking if they had any record of a United States Marine named Herbert Walsh. What else? Well, for some reason, Ross wanted to know if there really had been a Herbert Walsh in the Corps, and especially if he'd been wounded and hospitalized in the Solomon Islands. The piece of paper you sent in might have come from the answer the Vets Administration sent to Ross. What was the answer? There's no record of a Herbert Walsh, Chase. Does it fit anything? I don't know, Captain. But the Ross has lost a daughter in the Solomons, a Navy nurse. Now, Bill Ross just came in with the sheriff. I'll get on it. Bye. Bye, Chase. Uh, Ross, hmm? does the name Herbert Walsh ring a bell with you? Uh, yes. Yes, Ranger, it does. My father told me about him in a letter two months ago. You know who he is? No, I never saw him. Folks wrote that he stopped by the ranch and told him my sister had taken care of him in Solomon before she got killed. Is that all? No. According to my father's letter, Walsh gave my folks the idea that, well, that he and my sister had been very close. Had your sister ever mentioned him in letters to your folks when she was overseas? Well, they couldn't remember, but we were awful fond of my kid sister, Ranger. Anybody who'd known her would have found an open door with my folks. Somebody found one, all right. Two open. What do you mean? There isn't any Herbert Walsh. What? Well, but my pa gave him some money. When? Did he write to you about that? No, but I've just been going over my father's affairs. In the past two months, he loaned Walsh several hundred dollars. I have the canceled checks. Where are the checks? At the lawyer's office on the corner. I want to see where those checks were cashed. Come on. Jase, you figure this Walsh is a phony working the old war buddy racket? Of course he is. But with a new angle, a dead girl. What do you mean? I mean that families of servicemen and women open their hearts too easily to strangers they think might have been close to somebody they love. You mean Walsh killed my family? Your father must have suspected him. He wrote to Washington and found out Walsh had never been in the Solomons or the Marines. And when Walsh came the last time, your father called his hand with a letter he'd gotten from the VA. Here's the building where the lawyer is. <laughs> Here are the checks, Ranger. Four of them, total of $600. Hmm. Endorsed by Walsh. Cashed for him by merchants in San Antonio. That car came from San Antonio, Jace. That sure fits. It sure does. Let's get out to that cafe and get that sketch drawn up. Like that around the eyes, and it's uh, marks around the eyebrows. Uh, she means scar tissue. Oh, see, eyes deeper set then. Hmm. Like this? Yeah, sure would. Uh, the nose didn't come out so far. Kind of a dent in the middle. Yeah, like that. Real good. If somebody knew the man, would they recognize him from that? They sure would. That's almost a spitting image, I think. Thanks a lot, ma'am. You're sure welcome. I'll take that, Bill. Thanks again. Uh-huh. Come back. Well, you ain't the prettiest fellow I ever saw. I don't know. My folks said that, too. 
But Waltz told him he'd been in a Jap prison camp, been treated bad. Waltz was lying, if Waltz is his real name. Must have got beat up someplace, Jace. Yeah, and I've got a hunch I know where. Who do you think? In a prize ring. The man who killed your folks was a professional fighter. You figure that just because of his face? And one other thing. Don't forget that autopsy report, Sheriff. That's right. Well, you remarked right then that the fellow who threw those punches knew what he was doing. I'd sure like to get my hands on him. Two old people. Getting at him through my kid's sister. Think about your own revenge. The law will take care of that. Yeah. But no law can bring them back to life. Uh, drop you at the office, Bill. You and the sheriff. I, I'll be in touch with you later. Where are you going, Jase? Out of your territory. San Antonio. <laughs> Throw that one too fast. Faster. Come on, roll with it. That's it. Oh, now, let me see, Ranger. I was seen that face before, sure. Oh, yeah. Well, been some time, but we used to train here, all right. Heavyweight. Wait a minute. Hey, Pop, come here. Yeah. Go. Come here, mate. Pop is the world's oldest fight fan. Knows every fight in his record for the past 50 years. Maybe he can tell you something. Yeah. You know what can I do for you? You know a man who looks like this? Yeah, I seen him before. His name Walsh? Walsh, nothing. That's Eddie Bowler. I never did amount to anything. Had a punch like a bullocks, but no science. Wide open for a left hook. Had 31 fights and ended yeah, up... fine, in... Pop. Hold it, hold it. Eh? Range, you don't care about all that. Huh. The main thing I want to know is, when did you see him last? Oh, six, seven years ago. That long ago? Well, ain't long enough to suit me. Bowler never should have been allowed in the ring. He wasn't the kind of fighter that loved the sport. He, he liked to hit men to ruin him, that's what. You have no idea where I might find it. Well, not me, you know. Well, thanks for your help. Yeah, you're welcome, stranger. Well, sure, glad to help, Ranger. Hey, 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 wait a minute, wait a minute, Ranger. Yeah? I, uh, I just remembered. There was a gal Paula used to hang out with. Her name was, uh, uh, uh Dolly, uh, D Dolly Richards. Uh, she might uh, know where he is. Do you know where I might find her? Well, she used to work in the box office of the Empire Theater. Uh, that's all I know. Thanks. I'll try it. Uh, you uh, planning to arrest Eddie Bolton? That's my plan, all right. Why? Well, don't surprise me none, you understand, but uh, let me give you some advice. Go ahead. Watch yourself in the clinches if you find him, Ranger. He's tough with nine miles on paved road. He's bad medicine. And he won't be fighting by the rule books if he knows you want him. Thanks, Pop. I'll be careful. Yeah, being careful ain't enough. Get off first. Remember, he's a sucker for a left hook. If he gets a chance to hit you good, he won't stop till he kills you. I checked the Empire Theater for Pola's girl, Dolly Richards, but she hadn't been seen for years. I put through a call to headquarters asking them to check auto registration for one in Pola's name. It was late afternoon when Captain Stenson got back to me by phone. The car he was using must have been stolen, Jace. There's nothing registered in that name. You checking for a criminal record on him? Yeah, but there's nothing in this state. We're checking with other states, though. I just sent teletypes off. I'll have to wait a while, then. Nothing else you can do, Jace. So long. Hey, uh, wait a minute, Captain. What? Now take one more crack at the license bureau in Austin. See if they have a car registered to Dolly Richards. Dolly Richards? Who's she, Jace? Paula's girlfriend? She was. Let's hope the torch is still burning. I didn't move from the phone until the captain called back. This time he had something. Here it is, Jace. Car registered to Dolly Richards. Texas license T49753. Her address is RFD number 4 on Farm Highway 73. It's a turnoff north of Tilden. That doesn't sound right to me, Captain. The car I want had San Antonio marked on the license plate frame. That's still all right, Jace. Donna Richards bought the car six months ago from a San Antonio dealer. Frame might have been on there. That's better. Any out-of-state record on Pola? Not yet. You want to wait another hour or so? No. You can give me word by short wave. I'm heading toward Tilden. KTXA. Report on subject Eddie Pola. 
served three years Leavenworth, impersonating Army officer and using mails to defraud. One year Oklahoma State Penitentiary for fraud. One year Louisiana assault. 10-4, Unit 10, clear. KDXA Austin. <laughs> took the turnoff north of Tilden, headed for the sprawling country ridden by Farm Highway 73. It was midnight when my headlights picked out the mailbox and the name D. Richard. I left the car on the road and slipped up to the house. It was dark. All right, Eddie, all right. Don't blow your top. Try your cheating. Ola isn't oh. home, huh? Ola? I don't know anybody with that name. You can save the static, lady. Where was he last Saturday night? He was right here with me. During the late afternoon and evening? You heard her, Ranger. Hey, baby, I, I didn't know you was him. He knocked and I thought you forgot your key. All right, over. Dolly, shut up. Like we said, Ranger, I was here last Saturday. I know somebody who says you weren't. Described you well enough for this to be drawn. Good likeness, too, Paula. I was here. What are you going to prove with a drawing? I'm not going to prove anything with a drawing. But I'm going to have an eyewitness prove that you were near Salt Flat Saturday when Jed and Martha Ross were murdered. Murdered? Shut up, Dolly. I get to tell her about that part of it, eh, Fola? Maybe you forgot to tell her about the checks to Herbert Walsh, the Marine the VA never heard of. Where's that letter you ripped out of the old man's hand? All right, Ranger, I'll show you. Come in. Yeah, it's over here, and... The boy at San Antonio Jim told me open for a left hook, Polo. I don't try that again. Get on your feet and turn around. You too, miss. Why, me? So I can cuff you together. What are you taking me for? For harboring a murderer. To give you a chance to decide whether you want to stick to your story or tell the truth. All right, move. Dolly Richards turned state's evidence against Eddie Fuller. Fuller was tried, convicted, and sentenced to death in the electric chair. Here again is the star of our show, Joel McRae. Many years ago, a group of Texas Rangers had a showdown battle with a notorious band of killers. Several days later, the Rangers assigned to the case staggered back to their headquarters, showing the marks of combat, many of them badly wounded. The captain of the company, too impatient to wait for a written report, went to the barracks where the men were cleaning up and tending to their wounds. What happened, the captain asked. There was silence for a moment as the Rangers looked up at him. Finally, one of them said, Oh, nothing much, Cap. We had a little shooting match, and they lost. Good night, folks. See you again same time next week. Next week, Joel McRae in another authentic reenactment of a case from the files of the Texas Rangers. McRae is currently seen starring in the Universal International Technicolor production, Saddle Trend. Tonight's cast included Tony Barrett, Paul Fries, Mike Barrett, Tom Tully, Bill Johnstone, Byron Kane, and Virginia Gregg. This story was transcribed and adapted by Joel Murcott, and the program was produced and directed by Stacy Keach. This is Hal Gibney speaking. Three chimes mean good times on NBC. The chimes are really excited about a big show. In fact, it's the big show. An hour and a half every Sunday with Tallulah Bankhead as Femme C. And starring Jimmy Durante, Fred Allen, Jack Carson, Groucho Marx, Jose Ferrer, Meredith Wilson, and many, many more. All this and Tallulah too. No wonder it's the big show. The premiere date is Sunday, November 5th, just one week from today. 
Bill Harris reminding you that next it's Theater Guild on NBC. The National Broadcasting Company presents Joel McRae in Tales of the Texas Rangers. Tonight, transcribed from Hollywood, another authentic reenactment of a case from the files of the Texas Rangers. Tales of the Texas Rangers, starring Joel McRae as Ranger Jace Pearson. Texas, more than 260,000 square miles. And 50 men who make up the most famous and oldest law enforcement body in North America. Rangers come these stories based on fact. Only names, dates, and places are fictitious for obvious reasons. The events themselves are a matter of record. Case for tonight, the white suit. It is 6 a.m., June 23, 1947. There is only one prisoner in the Live Oak County Jail. He is John Elliott Bascom, a notorious and dangerous gunman. In the anteroom connecting the jail with the sheriff's office, Deputy George Keaton dozes, snoring at the end of a long and uneventful night's duty. Miss George! Miss George! Oh, Uncle Ben, you still here? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. That prosecutor's office down the hall was powerful dirty. I'm about ready to go along home now as soon as I hang up my mark, but I brewed this here coffee for you. Coffee? Put it here. Oh! <laughs> She's hot, Jonah. Uh, coffee. Uncle Ben, you're an angel. <laughs> Don't know about that, Miss Jones. Ain't nobody else feed my wings. Yeah, just put the pot and cup in my closet when you're through. I'll take care of them when I come on tonight. Sure thing, you, Uncle Ben. Yeah. Hey, Stewart! Hey, Taylor! What's the matter with you now, Bascom? Take a look! The cell floor's wet! Water's running all over! This jail may have all the comforts of home, but I wouldn't give you up for your blood! Yeah, this building's so old, it's a wonder it doesn't all come apart. Bells must have stuck it. Yeah, water all over the floor! All right, all right, I'll take it easy. You keep back, Bascom. Don't worry. You can do the waiting. I'm not putting my feet down in that water. Stay there in your bunk. I'll see what's the matter. Uh, let's see what's wrong with it. Uh, you, your undershirt stuffed in the tray. Yes. Oh, 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 Sheriff Chris Olson discovered the bodies of his night deputy in the courthouse janitor when he came into his office at 8 o'clock. He immediately telephoned the Texas Rangers, and a short time later, Ranger Jace Pearson arrived. Jace Pearson, I'm glad to see you. Quite a while, Sheriff. Jace, that's a bad thing. Anything involving Baskin is. Got any line on him yet? No, apparently he slipped out of town afoot. We don't even know what direction he took. Probably east up Rocky Valley. That's the quickest way into open country. Ranger Harris was ordered out on this assignment with me. Oh, where is he? I dropped him with a walkie-talkie at Two Mile Bridge on the way in. He's riding through the brush now, cutting for a trail. We'll to find out pretty soon if Bascom is still afoot. And if he isn't? Well, the highway patrol's already closed the main roads into this area. As soon as we get a localization, mounted units will move in and attempt to close the gaps. We'll get him, Sheriff. Well, I sure hope so. Oh, excuse me. Sheriff's office, Holson speaking. Sheriff, this is Bob McDougal out on Route 7. A man just stole my truck out of the field where I was working. You got a description? But I didn't get a very good look at him. He was clear across the field. A medium-sized fellow wearing a pair of white coveralls headed toward Prado. What kind of truck? A red half-ton pickup, 46 model. Anything else you identify? Uh, it's kind of beat up. A grill's broken out in front. Uh, I think that's enough for us, McDougal. You know who it was? I think so. 
But you better get in as soon as you can and file a theft report, just the same. Palmer's truck was stolen about eight miles out of Route 7. It's Baskin, all right, Jase. White coveralls. These jail suits sure show up. Come on, my unit's out front. We'll get this on the radio as we roll. Racing out of town on Route 7 with my double horse trailer still coupled, I radioed all units to be on the lookout for the truck. Then I contacted Ranger Harris through his walkie-talkie and asked him to meet us at Two Mile Bridge. He was there when we arrived. Nice timing, Ed. What's up, Jase? Got a line on Bascom. Let's get your horse loaded in with charcoal. Okay, Bascom still afoot? No. He grabbed himself a truck about eight miles down the road. Yeah, he would. This side's clear, Jase. Watch your toes. Charcoal, you got company. In you go, boy. Yeah, better bring the walkie-talkie up front with you, Ed. Got it. Ready? Heave! Come on. Sheriff Olson, meet Ranger Harris. Howdy, Sheriff. Howdy, Ranger. So, that's your walkie-talkie, is it? Yeah, how much you do it? Yeah, pretty contact, all right. Hangs right on the saddle. You can keep in touch with your headquarters with him? At Austin? No, no. Perhaps the range about five miles. Closer the better. Strictly a field outfit. Oh, I see. All set? Maybe we can drive Mr. Bascom right into the roadblock at Dry Creek Crossroads. Just made it. Yeah. What's the matter? Out of gas? Yeah, fill her up. Treat me my regular? Anything, fill her up. You betcha. <laughs> Say, isn't this old Bob McDougal's truck? Yeah, I'm taking it into Fredo. Well, he got all his repair work done at Livo. Not this time. Hurry it up, will you? It's trying to bubble over on you. Fill a pipe must have been. Old Max sure beats up a truck, too. Yeah. Best farmer in the county, but awful careless about machines. Seems come like on, come on, wind it up. That's enough gas. Hey, okay, Mr. Okay. You must be in a hurry. I am. Gonna lose some time at Dry Creek. Yeah. Why? The law's got a roadblock at the crossroads for some reason or another. Booming everybody through down at the seams of their drawers. Five and two tenths. That's one thirty. Charge it. Hey. All right, you smart mechanic. Let's see how far that gas gets you. Radio operator. This is Jim Perry. Get me the Dry Creek store quick. I'm sorry, that line's busy. Breaks in on it. The highway patrol's got a roadblock there. I want to talk to one of the officers. Is this an emergency call? A smart aleck in Bob McDougal's truck just clipped me for some gas. He was in too big a hurry to be honest, and he deliberately took the wrong turn when I told him there were officers ahead. Mr. McDougal's truck, is that a red one? Sure, everybody knows that truck. A red pickup with a mechanic and white coveralls driving. You're on Route 7. What turn did the truck take? The crazy fool took off down the old big wash road. Tell the patrol they can box him in there. The road ends at the wash. You keep a watch on that road, Mr. Perry. That's the man they're looking for. Huh? It's Jack Bass. Broke jail and killed two men at the county seat this morning. Jack Bascom. I can ring Dry Creek now. KTXA to Unit 10. KTXA to Unit 10. Unit 10 to KTXA. Go ahead, KTXA. Subject Jack Bascom refused to pay for gasoline. He turned south from Route 7 at Perry's filling station. Perry's down there at the foot of the hill. 10-4. Unit 10 approaching Perry's now. We'll keep KTXA advised. Unit 10 clear. 10-4, KTXA Austin. And there's Jim Perry out in front, flagging us down now. Officers, I just got held up. Yeah, we know. For some gasoline. You know. And the radio, Jim. Now, that's the turn you took over there? Yeah, the big wash road. How long ago? Maybe 10 minutes. Pretty good start on us, Jace. Yeah. What kind of country there is down here. Let's don't let him get any more. We found the red pickup.
up abandoned in the sandy bed of Big Wash, four miles from the highway, and radioed the surrounding units. John Baskin's tracks led straight into broken country beyond the wash. Eh, he couldn't go any further than the truck, and neither can we. It's like work for the horses from here on, Ed. Let's get him out. Right. I'll give you a hand, Jeans. Easy, boy, easy. easy. Come on, Jeff. Oh. Better get the walkie-talkie, Ed. We ought to be able to contact any unit south of Dry Creek with it pretty soon. Yeah, I believe you're right. Hey, uh, you boys leaving me a foot, Jeans? Uh, you can take the unit back, Sheriff. Maybe join the highway patrol at Dry Creek. Baskin's headed southwest. Probably figures to slip past the roadblocks. He might be making a wide detour over toward Highway 11. Might be. All set, Jase. Okay. Anything else I can do? Yeah, keep your fingers crossed. I will. Well, and Baskin isn't going to be any sense for you boys. He's desperate, armed, and he knows his trail tricks. I know. Yeah, easy, boy. For good measure, I don't like the looks of those clouds over there. But all we need is a storm to wipe out what little sign he may leave. Well, let's get started, Ed. Yeah. Go on, boys. Good hunting. Thanks, Sheriff. Come on. You are listening to Tales of the Texas Rangers, starring Joel McRae as Ranger Jace Pearson. And now we continue with tonight's case... The White Suit, an authentic story from the files of the Texas Rangers. By four o'clock, Ed Harris and I were deep into the rough country south of Big Wash. We'd continually cut back and forth for Baskin's tracks, finding them and losing them again. With slow work covering five miles to his one, he steadily built up his lead on us. He was infernally clever. Take it easy going down here, Jake. This canyon wall was any steeper, we'd be hanging by a collar. Ooh, who charcoal? Hey, wait a minute, Ed. Pull up. Oh, boy. Whoa, da. Whoa. Now what, Jace? Bascom didn't slide down here like we thought. No? Look. There's the rock he pushed over from the rim to make the skid marks we've been following. See, it's lava, like the cap on the rim. Different from the rest of the rock down here. So we've got to climb back to the top. I'd have sworn he started down here to cross this canyon. That's what he wanted us to think. Anything to cost us time. The trouble is, we've got to follow out every one of these blind trails he's leaving us. Any one of them may be the McCoy. Yeah, he'll be to California before we ever get out of these badlands. He isn't to California yet. Don't worry, he's working as hard as we are. Up to Lift them up. Come on, Red Hawk. Maybe I can go. Come on. Watch it, Ed. Oh, what a climb. It's getting late. Look at that sun, Jase. Yeah. Hey. That low sun has got its advantages. Oh, ooh, boy. Ooh. Oh, no. Easy. Take a look at that slope over there across the canyon. That patch of sand past that big mesquite. Yeah, tracks, footprints. And Bascom did cross the canyon after all. Probably someplace a little downstream. Jace, how come we didn't see those tracks when we started down here from up before? He couldn't have made them since then. We aren't that close behind him. No, tracks were there before. We just didn't see them. Now the sun's low enough to throw longer shadows into the prints his boots made. Makes them twice as visible. Yeah. Well, we better start looking for a place to cross ourselves. Now, let's climb a little higher first. I'm worried about that storm the way it's piling up. Up, Red Horse. Come on. Well, Doc, in black, Probably loaded with static. We've got to try to make radio contact with the walkie-talkie while we can. We'll need to work from this high ground to get through. General call, Jake? Yeah. Yeah, I suppose you try it now, Ed. Yeah. Unit 902 to unit in range. Unit 902 to unit in range. Unit 8 to unit 902. Go ahead, unit 902. Oh, boy. Oh. Yeah, Jake. Oh, Charles. Unit 902 requests the location of Unit 8. Unit 8 is at the intersection of County 5 and State 11, 10 miles south of Dry Creek. 10-4. Unit 8 is now too far north. Fugitive still bearing toward Highway 11, approximately 12 miles south and east of Dry Creek. Suggest Unit 8 move south about 5 miles. Unit 902 has had no direct contact with Fugitive, but is following an identifiable trail. 
We'll report any change. Please relay to other units. Unit 902, clear. Unit 8, 10 4. Say, look, Chase. Vasca may stay on the other side of the canyon, or he may double back to this side. Why don't we save ourselves a lot of riding and split up for a bit? Might not be a bad idea. I'll take the canyon floor. It's sandy. Tracks will be easy to spot there. And you can work along this rim. All right. But watch yourself, Ed. You'll be in the open down there. Yeah, just let Bascom show himself once. That's all I want. Come on, Red Horse. We're going down. Easy now. Easy. Give me a chance to get to the bottom before you start, Jay. Okay. <laughs> about a manhunt sharpens the hunter's senses. I sat on the rim for long moments watching Ed Harris descend that canyon wall, feeling danger without being able to identify it. And suddenly smoke blossomed behind a rock in the opposite rim. I saw Harris sag in his saddle before the horse carried him out of sight. And dim by distance came the lagging sound of the shot. Go, Charles. Go, boy. Leave out of the way. Yeah. He would pick my left arm. How do you know I was a southpaw? It's something we may be asking him right sudden. Are you okay now? Yeah, I do. Pick up his trail on the rim. We'll have to watch sharp. He's going to try to keep that white suit out of sight. Now that we're this close to him. Come on, Red Horse. Show that charcoal out of clock. Come on. Get him. chance of picking up anybody's trail here, Chase. A herd of elephants could have crossed this loose shale without leaving a trace. Maybe. Right, look here. You see them? Yeah. Ants, a whole trail of them. Ants don't go after anything in this country they can't eat. Let's see what these are having for supper. Here we are. On this piece of shale. Yeah, blood. And yeah, then I did nail them. We got a wounded animal on our hands, Chase. May let go at us from behind any of these brush clumps. I don't think he's hurt so bad he won't keep on running. There's just a few drops here. I'm afraid you just creased him. That was pretty long range. Well, it won't be the next time I get him in my sights, I promise you that. I owe him something for this arm. Let's go. Probably headed for that big mesquite picket. Yeah, he would. Come on, Red Horse. Up, Charles. Hey, Jace. Hey, Look, out there in the open. His coveralls, he's peeled them off. There he goes, into that big clump of brush across the clear. Come on, let's go get him. Hey, wait a minute. Whoa, 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 whoa. Circle around below him, Ed. Make a lot of racket like we're still together and hunting blind. Maybe you can flush him back between those big rocks. Okay, I'll try it, Chase. I'll hide charcoal down behind the side of them. Maybe we can rig up a little surprise party for Mr. Bascom when he comes through. But be careful, will you? He won't give you a chance. Don't give him one. Chance? That killer? Just let me get my hands on him. Come on, Red Horse. Hit that rock. Let's go. Hit Easy, Charlie. Easy. We go this way. Ooh, ooh, boy. Under the shade of this rock to you, Charcoal. Easy now, boy. Quiet. Quiet. Head down, boy. Shh. Shh. Shut up, Charcoal. Two, three times. When? Now, a few minutes ago. 
I think maybe it's my friend Diego come from Next Valley with gun to kill Coyote. We have much trouble with Coyote here, senor. We aren't looking for coyotes. Where's your clothes? I go to see if it's my friend when this mono hombre, this very bad man, is jumped from the bush. His gun is very big. He took my clothes. He tell me not to move when he run. I stand still till he's gone. Then I run too. Which way'd he go? How do I know, senor? May Pedro, I am scared to think. All right, Pedro. Forget about your clothes. You're a lucky man to be alive. Si, I know, senora. Si. Better get some more clothes before that storm hits. You aren't exactly dressed for bad weather. Oh, steady, Charlie. Uh, looks like our surprise didn't come off, Ed. Let's get moving before Bascom builds up a lead on us again. Yeah, let's go, Red Hawk. Yeah, yeah. stay ahead of us using a large bag of tricks to keep out of sight, even if he couldn't shake us. When the sun set behind towering thunderclouds, we were working our way down a wide, arid valley, keeping some distance apart. Hey, Jay, here's the tracks again. Pick them up, Charco. Yeah. Ooh, oh boy. See him? There they are, heading right down there in the valley. Yeah, precious daisies, too. Yeah, no blow sand drifted into them at all. Better try that general call again, Ed. To report opposition? Look at the direction those tracks are taking. They've been swinging that way the last half hour. Yeah, I noticed that. Headed almost due east now. Baskin's pulling another big red herring on us. He made for Highway 11 long enough for us to report it and set up interception for him there. And then he swings straight east for Highway 13. Sort of catches us with our units down, don't it? Baskin's gambling that it does. Yeah, I'll try the call. Unit 902 to unit in range. 902 to unit and range. 902 to unit and range. Gosh, no use. Jace, you can't raise anybody. We're too far out now. The weather isn't helping any either on this lower ground. Looks like we're in for real soaking before night. Yeah. And Bascom can't possibly be much ahead of us. Maybe we can tree him before he gets through to the highway. Handle him on our own from here on. We can't risk it, Ed. If he slips us and gets through to make a ride with somebody or steal another car, he'll be gone. Well, I guess here's where we separate them. I'm kind of out of the running with this here bum arm. Give me the walkie-talkie and I'll double back till I'm in range of the units on Highway 11 again. Yeah, that's good. It'll ride all right like that. Anything special for the boys? Ask them to request coverage on Highway 13 all the way to Prado. I'll keep trying until you get through. I'll stick on his trail. I'll have a relay into KDXA in half an hour. As soon as you do, you better head out toward Dry Creek and get that arm looked after. I'll wait till we've got Baskin. Good luck, Jace. Same to you, Ed. Come on, Charles. Yeah. Twenty minutes later, the rain struck with cloudburst intensity, bringing complete darkness. Not before John Baskin's tracks led me on an adobe bench where sheep had been grazing. He removed his boots here, and his tracks blended with a maze of other bare footprints left by Mexican sheep herders. I rode on slowly. Suddenly, a small, rain wrenched boy stepped out from the brush. Charco nearly ran him down. Whoa, whoa, Charco. Steady, boy. Hey, you there. Hey, boy, Nino. Hey. Get him. He ran like a frightened little rabbit. Light winked as the door opened and closed. The door to the adobe shed. I approached and saw the blinds were tightly drawn, almost as though to prevent the leakage of any telltale light from a candle burning dimly inside. Oh, Charco. Oh, boy. Open up. Open up. Jenny, who are you? Texas Ranger. Being out of this range, I want to ask you some questions. Oh, no, senor. I cannot let you in. My husband, he's sick. He's very sick. That's your boy that just ran in here? The senor, my Juanito. He was going to look for the mama goat. Storm, she's fine. You frightened him, senor. You gave me a turn for a minute, too. Look, I need a little help. Me, I would do anything for the Texas Ranger. You're trailing a man, a very dangerous man. He must have passed close to here about the time the rain began. Where is he now? We have seen nothing, Juan. He told me nobody, senor. Maybe your husband did then. Anyway, I want out of this rain. Senor, no, you must not. My husband. This woman was deathly afraid. But her eyes told me she wasn't afraid of me. Of the storm, perhaps, of the sickness in her house. Or of the blanket-wrapped man lying on a bunk in the 
the corner of the room with his bare feet protruding toward me. The door was thick, twisted inward as far as it would go and step to the behind me. Senor, please! Slide your gun out from under that blanket and drop it, Bascom. <laughs> The gun, Bascom. Drop it or I'll break your other arm. Drop it! <laughs> you would be stubborn, Bascom. Now you really got something to be sick about. Do something. I'm bleeding to death. You can get off that easy. We're saving you for the electric chair. You got something I can use for bandages, senora? Oh, my arm. Come on, Gracias. This will do fine. Uh, how did you know? He was holding a gun on you and the boy, making you do what he said. See, how could you know? Your real husband's a sheep man, isn't he? Yes, he is. He's working me proud on now. Look at these bare feet sticking out here. You ever see an honest-to-goodness sheep man with his toes all crowded together from wearing cowboy boots? Better put some water on the heat. I'll need it to patch him up enough to take him in. John Bascom was tried in Live Oak County and found guilty of the murder of two men. On the second day of December 1947 at Huntsville Prison, his sentence was carried out. Death in the electric chair. And now, here again is the star of our show, Joel McRae. One of the pleasures afforded us here in this show is the large number of letters we receive asking for special information about the Texas Rangers. This week we received one especially interesting letter in which the writer said she had heard of an official Rangers prayer and inquired if such a prayer actually existed. It does. The prayer was written by Captain Pierre Bernard Hill, chaplain of the Texas Rangers, and I should like you to hear it. Oh God, whose end is justice whose strength is all our stay. Be near and bless my mission as I go forth today. Let wisdom guide my actions. Let courage fill my heart. And help me, Lord, in every hour to do a ranger's part. Protect when danger threatens. Sustain when trails are rough. Help me to keep my standard high and smile at each rebuff. When night comes down upon me, I pray thee, Lord, be nigh, whether on a lonely scout or camped under Texas sky. Keep me, O oh God, in life. And when my days shall end, forgive my sins and take me in. For Jesus' sake. in another authentic reenactment of a case from the files of the Texas Rangers. Joel McRae will soon be seen in the Universal International Technicolor production, Frenchie. Tonight's cast included Tony Barrett, Herb Butterfield, Barney Phillips, Bill Johnstone, Herb Ellis, and Lillian Byer. This story was transcribed and adapted by Tom W. Blackburn, and the program was produced and directed by Stacy Keach. This is Hal Gibney speaking. Three chimes mean good times on NBC. Tonight, Theater Guild on the Air presents Judy Garland in the prize-winning novel Alice Adams, co-starring Thomas Mitchell. Another Sunday evening favorite is The $64 Question, starring Jack Carr. Tomorrow on the Station of the Chimes, you'll hear Gordon McRae as your singing master of ceremonies on one of his wonderful musical journeys aboard the show train. The Chimes are your invitation to the best in radio entertainment. 
Be sure to hear Judy Garland next in Theater Guild on NBC. Listen at the close of this program for an important announcement of a change in time for Tales of the Texas Rangers. The National Broadcasting Company presents Joel McRae in Tales of the Texas Rangers. Tonight, transcribed from Hollywood, another authentic reenactment of a case from the files of the Texas Rangers. Tales of the Texas Rangers, starring Joel McRae as Ranger Jace Pearson. Texas, more than 260,000 square miles. And 50 men who make up the most famous and oldest law enforcement body in North America. of the Texas Rangers come these stories based on fact. Only names, dates, and places are fictitious for obvious reasons. The events themselves are a matter of record. Case for tonight, Blood Relative. It is 4 p.m. June 26, 1949. Will Bonner, proprietor of the general store at Stump Hill, Texas, is waiting on Mac Kennedy, the dirt pumper. Yeah. Fifty pounds of flour and the bacon, Mac. Anything else? Yeah, carton of cigarettes. Yeah. How about making in a couple of sacks of tobacco, huh? What's the matter, Will? My credit no good anymore? Mac, I think you ought to put in your home for that. The bill's running kind of high. You get your money, don't you? Ain't a question of getting it, Mac. You stand to make a good profit this year. Unless you have to pay out, the better chance you'll have to get on your feet firmly without no credit. Let me worry about it. Uh, go ahead. Wait on him. Yeah. That's all right. I, I got time. No, no. I'll take care of you, stranger. What do you have? Stranger? Time ain't helping your sight any, is it, Uncle Will? Huh? Ben! Ben! <laughs> Dang it, boy. You can't. How do you like that? Didn't make a nice morning blood relative. Yeah. Well, Liz, Liz, come see who's here. Well, will you answer? What is it, Will? I don't see nothing. Uh, fella wants to know if you want to buy some uh, perfume. Perfume? Well, no, Will, you could have told him that. What would I do with Why, it's your brother's boy, Ben. <laughs> it sure is. <laughs> Stop tackling, Will. You... You know about you, Paul. I know he's dead. Being glad to see you, Ben. I almost forgot. It happened last winter. The pneumonia. Yeah, we tried to locate you, boy, but nobody knew where you were. Nobody would have wanted to know. I was in the pen at hospital. Huh? That's where I've been for four years. In the prison? Your Paul never sent... Well, nobody's business but mine. Ben, I, I guess we can talk that over later. You want to stay in this place here? I ain't asking you. you for nothing except what's coming to you. I just want you to buy out my pa's share of the store and pay me off. Ben, your pa never did have a share in the store. You only work for him. What you trying to get away with, Uncle Will? He told me he was going in with you when he moved out here. But Ben, you knew your pa. He always talked big, but he never did have a dime of his own. You telling me about my own pa? You know, we ain't running him down, boy. He never harmed nobody, but talking big was just his way. Look, I come to get what's mine. Do I get it up, don't I? Ben, there's a bed and a job waiting for you if you want them. You're kinfolk, and that makes you welcome. But outside of that, there ain't nothing here that's yours. You're going to pay me. What are you doing? You're just holding on, young. Let it go. Turn him loose. Turn him loose. Reckon I can still take care of myself. Maybe you can. Maybe you can't, Uncle Will. I'm staying around town to give you a chance to change your mind. I'm warning you. I'm going to get what's mine if I have to kill you for it. On the following morning, June 27th, neighbors found Will Bonner shot to death. 
and his wife Liz critically wounded and unconscious in the back room living quarters of their store. The sheriff called with the assistance of a Texas ranger. Ranger Jace Pearson was assigned to the case. Well, that's all of the story, just like I found it, Jace. You were pretty downhearted, Sheriff. Found a friend of yours? I knowed him all my life. He helped me get elected. Bodies in the back room, you want to see it? Yeah. You can stay here if you'd rather. No, no, I'll come. Guess you noticed the way the safe was cracked and the door where the killer got in? Yeah, professional job, all right. I, uh, covered Will over with the sheet. Maybe I shouldn't have, but I... It's all right. Coroner hasn't been here yet, huh? No, he's on his way. Hmm. Dead about six, seven hours. How do you figure that, G? Rigor mortis just beginning to set in. You see a lot of them, you get to know. Nine o'clock now. That means it happened about two or three this morning, huh? That's close to it. How about Bonner's wife? She gonna pull through? Doc Woodson took her to the county hospital. He said there's a little chance. You've got a deputy posted at the hospital in case she comes to? Yep, he can take any statement she... Sheriff! Sheriff, I gotta talk to you in a... Well, all right, Jody, come in. Farmhand works for Mac Kennedy on and off. Howdy, Ranger. Sheriff? What's on your mind, Jody? Well, I, uh, I just come pick up some feed in Mac's pickup. Heard about what happened. You know anything about it? Not exactly. But I was in town with Mac yesterday afternoon. He come across some supplies from Bonner. What time? Oh, about four o'clock. I wasn't in the store with him, but when he come out and we was driving back, Mac said Bonner had a fuss with somebody. Phil had threatened to kill him. Did he say who the fellow was? No, but whoever it was, he took a swing at Bonner. Mac had to grab him to stop a fight. Where's Kennedy now? Well, he was out plowing when I left. I'll be able to get him by phone then. Come on, Sheriff. Let's get out there and talk to him. Dead? Will Bonner dead? Yeah, and Liz is mighty close to joining him, Mac. Better cut the motor on your tractor. Yeah. Sheriff... Will should have told you about that, fellow. I should have called and told you myself after what he threatened to do to him. Too late for what anybody should have done. You know the man? Never saw him before, but I know who he is. Bonner's nephew. Fresh out of Huntsville, I heard him say so. An ex-con and you didn't say anything about it? Sheriff, how could I know he'd do it? A blood relative. It wasn't my affair, was it? You'd know the man if you saw him again? I'd know him any place. Better come into town with us. Talk while we ride. Okay. Bonner mentioned his nephew's name? Well, he, he called him Ben. He will. Bonner had a brother die last year. Must have been his boy. We'll find out. On the way to Stumpkill, Mac Kennedy told us the story of the threat and gave me a description of Ben Bonner. I put a shortwave radio call through to KTXA. Unit 10 to KTXA. KTXA, go ahead, Unit 10. Request all units be alerted to look out for subject Ben Bonner, recently released from Huntsville. Subject wanted for questioning in murder of Will Bonner at Stump Hill. 10-4. Request special alert on all roads leading from Stump Hill. Subject may be leaving area on foot or by hitchhike. 10-4. Unit 10, clear. KTX Austin. Maybe young Bonner didn't run for it, Jace. He may be hiding out someplace nearby. Not likely, Sheriff. If he killed his uncle, he'll go for distance. He killed him, all right. You can bet on that. When a man's life's at stake, Kennedy, I don't bet. Ben Bonner wasn't around Stump Hill. He pulled stakes and made a run for it, all right. We got the information from a woman in the crowd near the store when we got back to town. Her name was Sadie Wattle. She ran a rooming house. I rent all my rooms to extra farmhands, generally, because I don't have to serve no meals that way with them eating where they're working. So naturally, I thought this fellow was one of them migratory hands. Yeah, I... yeah, I understand all that, ma'am. All I want to know is when Ben Bonner left your place. Well, it must have been just around midnight last night. Everybody was in and sleeping, and the house was locked up. And, well, the phone woke me up, and it was for him, that Ben. Oh, no. You know who called him? Of course not, I didn't know who he was or nothing about him, except his name was Ben. Uh, did you recognize the voice of the person who called? No. Well, please go ahead about the phone. Well, I called him to the phone, that's all. Fine time of night to be waking people, I told him. Then he answered it. Right after that, he lit up like the devil was after him. You 
hear any of the conversation? I did not. I mind my own business. Besides, all he said was hello. After that, all the talking must have been done by whoever called him, because he never said another word, just listened a minute, then hung up and let out. Uh, phone ringing in the store, Jace. I better get it. Go ahead, Sheriff. Well, thanks for your help, Mrs. Waddle. I'm glad I'm alive to get it. Whew. I might have been murdered in my own sleep with an ex-convict under my roof. Ought to be some way we could tell them from other folks. A man who served his time can't be expected to carry a brand man. Besides... How did you know Ben Bonner's an ex-convict? How did I know? What? It's all over town, ain't it? Jace, the call is for you. Right there, Sheriff. Thanks, ma'am. Excuse me. Who's calling? Your headquarters, Captain Stinson. Hello, Captain. Got some good news for you, Jace. The highway patrol has picked up Ben Bonner. Fine. Where'd they get him? Almost real Paso. Patrol car was stopped at a railroad crossing waiting for a freight to get through. They spotted him riding an empty flat. Freight, huh? Good thing they saw him. If he made El Paso, he'd been across the border into Juarez in no time. Well, he didn't make it. They're bringing him back to Stump Hill now. You'll have him there in a few hours. You getting the case against him? Uh, they seem to be getting plenty. Well, you don't sound too sure, Jase. I don't know. You look up his record? What was on his last ticket to Huntsville? Burglary, Jase. It fits all right, like the executioner's glove. Stump Hill was five miles cross country from the nearest railroad spur. We had time before the highway patrol would be delivering Ben Bonner. We sent Kennedy back to his farm. I unloaded charcoal from a horse trailer, and the sheriff got his horse. We rode to the railroad tracks. Yeah, he was smart, Jace. Almost got away. Lots of them almost got away. He sure made a lot of distance in the train. Don't know why you wanted to be sure he came this way to get to the train. I just wanted to be certain he cut through this five miles on foot. Proves he didn't hitchhike a fast ride and pick up a train further on down the line. Well, luck was with him for a while. He caught the only train he could have caught. You mean only one freight goes through here at night? Yep. Hot shot passenger clears first at about 1 a.m., Freight comes through about 15 minutes later. Slows for the grade here where he jumped it. About 1.15 is the schedule for the freight then, huh? That's right. Well, let's get back to town. Come on, Chuck. You look like that train schedule means something, Jase. It might. Farner's report ought to be in by the time we get back to town. Hey, I see what you mean. If Bonner was killed between 2 and 3 a.m., like you figured... It'll mean his nephew Ben was on that freight at the time the old man was killed. <laughs> Bonner's report had been completed. It was waiting at the sheriff's office when we got back. Well, he didn't miss by much, Jace. Here's the report on the time of day. What is it? Between 1 and 2 a.m. Then Ben Bonner didn't kill his uncle. Even if he ran the five miles across country, his track showed as he walked, he couldn't have made it in time to catch that freight. Doesn't look that way. Bullets from Bonner's body have been sent through to Austin. We may get a lead from ballistics. I'm going to do some more checking around town on it. Give me just a second, Jake. Sheriff sure speaking. Oh, good, good. She did, huh? If no... No, you stay right there. Goodbye. Well, Jace, looks like there's been a mistake someplace. That was my deputy at the county hospital. Liz Bonner regained consciousness for a few seconds. What'd she say? She said her and her husband were shot by their nephew, Ben. Listening to Tales of the Texas Rangers, starring Joel McRae as Ranger Jace Pearson. We continue with tonight's case, Blood Relative, an authentic story from the files of the Texas Rangers. The highway patrol brought Ben Bonner back to Stump Hill and unloaded him at the local jail where the sheriff and I questioned him. But I didn't kill him, I tell you. Didn't he know he was dead till now? You said you was gonna kill him. You said it in front of a witness. Man, there's a difference between saying and doing. If you had nothing to do with it, why'd you run away? Because somebody called me up last night at the rooming house late. 
was a man. I said he was a friend and wanted to warn me the sheriff was going to pick me up for threatening Uncle Will. You scare easy, don't you? Bet your life I do, mister. I just pulled four years at Huntsville and I had enough. No one no more. Maybe I was tough when I went to Uncle Will yesterday, but last night when I got that call, I was scared sick. And you don't know who called you? No, no, I don't. You sure it wasn't somebody you served time with, letting you know he was here to help you with the job? No. Look, you've got to believe me. This is a murder act. You can't send me up for it just because I shut off my mouth. That ain't evidence. Ben, there's more than that. Your Aunt Liz didn't die. She came to at the hospital. She says it was you who gunned her husband. That's a dirty lie. Look, if I did that, if I shot them and robbed the store, what was I doing on a freight? What did I do with the money? I ain't going to say anymore. I ain't going to talk till I see a lawyer. That's your right. We told you that in the beginning. All right, Sheriff. Guess you can lock him up again. Go on. Go ahead. Ranger, please. I didn't do it. Maybe the fellow who told you I threatened Uncle Will didn't tell you everything. Maybe you ought to ask him why there was arguing when I come into the store. All but... right, Ben, all right. Hmm. What do you think, Chase? I don't know. Let's get outside. If, if he did have an accomplice, the other fellow might be carting the loot and the gun. Might be. I'll see you later, Sheriff. I'm driving over to the hospital at the county seat. I want to talk to his aunt, Liz Bonner. doctor will only let me stay a minute. Well, shot Will. Just getting up. Who shot him, Mrs. Bonner? Ben. Ben, I'm grateful for wanted to help him. Well, how did it happen? There was a noise in the store. Woke us up. Mm-hmm. Well, Cole said, who's there? Then he got up, went to put on the lights. Then shot him. Did he get the lights on? Did you ever see your nephew? No. But it was him. He said he'd do it. It was him. If you didn't see him, did he say anything? Did you hear his voice and recognize him? No, he just shot Will. I screamed. That's all. But you didn't see Ben or recognize his voice? No, but he said he would. It couldn't be anybody else. I think you're wrong, Ben. I think it could be. up the road back to Stump Hill and got the sheriff. I wanted to make another check of the store and find out a few things about Mac Kennedy. Doggone it, Jace. You're sending your dog at the wrong tree. Mac Kennedy's been Will's friend for years. I just asked if Kennedy had ever been in trouble. Never. He's an honest, God-fearing dirt farmer, and that's all. What kind of shape is he in financially? Well, he's... Oh, Jace, a man don't have to be a criminal just because he's down on his luck. Max crops have been bad. Sheriff, I'm just asking a few questions, that's all. Well, I'm sorry, Jace. I reckon Max in hawk up to his neck. Plays in all his equipment as more. How come he can afford a hired hand? You mean Jody? Oh, he just drifts in and out. Ain't much of a worker, but he's all Mac needs. Migrates in in the spring for planting season, then out again in the fall after harvesting. He doesn't work for nothing, does he? Mac pays him right off when he makes his crop and sells it. That the way he pays everybody? Yeah, that's the only time he ever has any cash. Why? Just wondering. Did Mac buy here on credit from Bonner? Well, I guess so. Why? You find something in the ledger? Come take a look. There seems to be a page torn out. The book is kept in alphabetical order. Missing page is in the caves. If there was a charge page in here for Kennedy, it'd be right here. <sighs> now you got something I can't find, Case. What a sad. An ex-con threatens to kill a man, makes it perfect for somebody else to do the job and set the jailbird up for a frame. Come on, Sheriff. Let's get out to Kennedy's place again. Only this trip, we won't be asking questions about Ben Bonner. There's one thing still bothering me, Jace. Matt Kennedy's never been in trouble. So how come we both spotted the marks of a professional knob-knocker on the burglary? Yeah, it's been bothering me, too. And the more I think of it, the more I wonder why he tore that charge page out of the ledger. Why do something that would point right at him when he had somebody else all set up to take the fall? Just beating the bill wouldn't make the chance worthwhile. Not with murder, it wouldn't. KTX-80, Unit 10. Oh, this may be the ballistics report, Jase. Yeah. Unit 10, go ahead, ktx A. Lab report completed on bullets used in the slaying of Will Bonner. 38 caliber, probably Smith and Wesson Police Special. 10-4, Unit 10, clear. 
KTXA Austin. A minute, KTXA. Stand by, please. KTXA standing by. What's the matter, Geese? Just got an idea, something that didn't fit before. That hand who works for Kennedy, that Jody. What's his last name? Jody? Oh, I see it. It, it, it's Pelham. Jody Pelham. Why? I'll tell you in a minute. You there, KTXA? Standing by, Unit 10. This unit requests quick check on subject Jody Pelham. Repeat, Jody Pelham. Urgent. 10 4. Get back to you with information soon as possible. Unit 10, clear. KTXA, Austin. Jace, you figuring Jody helped Matt Kennedy to pull this job? Maybe. Or maybe Jody did it on his own. I want to know if he's got a record. What Swiss you thinking to him? He was waiting outside Bonner's store for Kennedy when Ben walked in yesterday and made his threats. Well, sure, he admitted that. Kennedy told him about Ben when he come out and they drove on back to the farm. Yeah, but when Jody came into town the next morning and came to tell us about the threats, he pretended he didn't know too much. Just knew that old Will Bonner had been threatened and couldn't say who made the threats. Well, I don't get what you're driving at, Joe. If Kennedy told him, he must have told him the whole story about the threats coming from Bonner's nephew, a nephew just gotten out of prison. That'd be the logical way to tell it, and that's the way Kennedy did tell it. But Jody was anxious not to seem to know too much. Hey, sure, I see what you mean. Kennedy wasn't in town this morning till we went out and brought him in. Yeah, but when we got back, everybody in town knew that the man we were looking for was Bonner's nephew, and that he was an ex-con. Sadie Waddles told us that. Only one it could have come from was Jody. He spread it around while we were out getting Kennedy. When we get to the farm, draw him out. Don't pounce on him until I get an answer on him from Austin. I hope it's the right answer. It may save Mac Kennedy's life. It was dark when we reached the farm house. There was a light on in the house, but the pickup truck wasn't in sight in the open garage. We left my car around the back of the house and went up on the porch. Ranger, huh? I thought it was Jody coming back with the pickup. Where'd he go? Drove up north to Edgeville this afternoon. Said he wanted to get something. He ought to be back soon. Well, aren't you going to ask us in, Mac? <laughs> sure, sure thing. Make yourself at home. I understand you got Bonner's nephew today. Heard a couple of women chewing about it on the party line. Well, yeah, we got him temporarily. Well, what do you mean, temporarily? He didn't kill anybody, Mac. Hmm? You had an argument with Bonner yesterday. What about? I reckon that's my business. Yours and Bonner's. But he's dead now, so that makes it my business. Better talk up, Mac. Well, uh, I've been running up a big bill. Will was cutting me down a little. You admit you owed him money. Why wouldn't I admit it? I pay my bills. Any man says otherwise is a liar. Nobody is saying otherwise, Mac. You keep a gun around here anyplace? Yeah. What kind? Smith and Watson 38. It's right there on the mantle over the fireplace. I'll get his case. Oh, don't wipe off any prints. Stick a pencil in the muzzle and lift it that way. Pencil okay. won't go in, Jay. Something jamming it. Now, let me see. You don't have to worry about prints on that. Outside's been wiped clean with an oil rag. Looks like paper jammed in there. We'll soon find out. I'll take these shells out. Put the pencil through. There. Why, it's Mac's charge page from the ledger. What are you trying to pull? Take it easy, Mac. We're not after you. Smell this gun and look at it, Sheriff. It was used, then reloaded, but never cleaned. Well, that gun hasn't been touched in years. Mac, this gun killed Will Bonner and almost killed his wife last night. Jody Pelham did it after you told him about Bonner's nephew. But why would he tear out that page and plant it here? So he could use Mac here to give himself a double cover-up. He made the call to the rooming house and got Ben Bonner to run. But he knew if Ben was caught any place and could set up an alibi, there'd be a second search. That's why he tore out the page and planted it here on Mac. I'm sure glad you know it wasn't me. If it was you, you'd have burned the page. That dirty little... Hey, here he comes now. That's the pickup. You want to help us nail him? I'd like to blow his brains out. There's a better way. Let him feel safe. Here, let me put these cuffs on you quick. Mm -hmm. Put that gun back in the mantle, Sheriff. Yeah, but uh, are you sure that you... He says, Mac. Boy... I didn't know anybody was here. Mac, Mac, what's the matter? What are you doing with those things on? What's your guess, Jody? Well, what's in that bag you're carrying? Well, I just uh, picked me up a bottle and a pack of stone in Edgeville. What'd you use for money? You don't get credit on liquor. Well, Mac, 
Mac, he, he paid me some wages this morning. What, you dirty little liar? Oh, I get it. I kind of wondered where he got the money. Now you know, huh? Well, yeah, when I got up last night and found he was gone, I, I sort of got to wondering this morning. You shut up. Uh, All right, Sheriff. I guess we can take him in. You better come along to make a statement, Jody. Sure, sure. I hate to do a thing like this to a friend, but I guess he deserves it. Doing old Bonner like he did. Yeah. I thought you'd feel that way. Let's go. You might as well admit you fired the gun, Mac. The Diphenylman test will prove you did. What kind of test is that? A man fires a gun. The nitrate from the powder gets into the pores of his hand. Chemical application shows it up. Well, he's washed his hands since last night, I reckon. Oh, washing will get it out. It stays for a couple of days. Uh, you fired a gun recently, Jody? No, no. Well, then we'll make the same test on your hand. It'll show you the difference. Well, you, you don't have to do that. I, I don't understand that kind of stuff anyway. Oh, it's too bad. I thought you might like to see how we work. Get in. Watch him, Sheriff. All right. Well, Austin ought to have that information I requested before, Sheriff. Yeah. This might bore you, Jody. Unit 10 to KTXA. Go ahead, Unit 10. This unit back in service. Been waiting for you. Have information you requested on subject Jody Pillow. What? What's that? Two years Huntsville burglary. Three years Louisiana State Penitentiary burglary and safe cracking. 10 4, Unit 10, clear. GDX sales. Shut up this car. Let me get out of here. Watch your sheriff. Don't make me use this gun, Jody. You can rock. Never mind that, Mac. Here, take these keys and put the cuffs on the right man, Sheriff. We might as well have him there. He'll be wearing them a lot until he reaches the death cell at Huntsville. Jody Pelham was tried and convicted for the wanton murder of Will Bonner. On the morning of December 6, 1949, at Huntsville Penitentiary, his sentence was carried out. Death in the electric chair. And now, here again is the star of our show, Joel McRae. Folks, Tales of the Texas Rangers is moving to a new time. You won't hear us next Sunday, but the week after that, we'll be back just an hour and a half later than usual on NBC, right after Theater Guild. So, we'll see you in two weeks, on Sunday, November 26th. I hope you'll be listening. Good night. Good night, Joel. See you one week from this coming Sunday. Remember, friends, as Joel told you, Tales of the Texas Rangers will come to you an hour and a half later, immediately following Theater Guild. Beginning next Sunday at this time, you'll hear Hedda Hopper's fine program. The week after next, November 26th, Joel McRae as Ranger Jace Pearson will be with you again. A week from Sunday, Joel McRae in another authentic reenactment of a case from the files of the Texas Rangers. seen starring in the MGM production Stars in My Crown. Tonight's cast included Tony Barrett, Bill Johnstone, Joe Duvall, Virginia Gregg, Harley Bear, and Byron Kane. This story was transcribed and adapted by Joel Murcott, and the program was produced and directed by Stacy Keach. One week from next Sunday, Tales of the Texas Rangers will be back with you immediately following Theater Guild. Consult your local radio schedule for time. This is Hal Gibney speaking. Three chimes mean good times on NBC. The National Broadcasting Company presents Joel McRae in Tales of the Texas Rangers. Tonight, transcribed from Hollywood, another authentic reenactment of a case from the files of the Texas Rangers. Tales of the Texas Rangers.
Texas Rangers starring Joel McRae as Ranger Jace Pearson. Texas, more than 260,000 square miles. And 50 men who make up the most famous and oldest law enforcement body in North America. Texas Rangers come these stories based on fact. Only names, dates, and places are fictitious for obvious reasons. The events themselves are a matter of record. Case for tonight, hanging by a thread. in the morning of May 5th, 1947, the telephone rang in the sheriff's office in the little town of Finney, Texas. Sheriff Hanson answered. Sheriff's office, Hanson speaking. Sheriff, this is George Hawks. How are you, George? What can I do for you? Nothing. Nobody. Uh, How's that? I just called to tell you I'm going to kill myself. What did you say? You heard me. It'll take you 20 minutes to get out to my place. By that time, I'll be now, now, wait a minute. Wait a minute, George. What? Hello? Hello? George? Uh, operator? Operator? Yes? Oh, uh, this is the sheriff. That call that just came in here, where was it from? One moment, Sheriff. This is someone's idea of a practical... Hello, Sheriff. Yes? yes? That call was placed from 317 out on Gun Creek Road. The residence of Mr. George Hall. <laughs> Sheriff raced out to the Hawks Ranch and found George Hawks dead, hanging in the barn. Then he made another discovery which prompted him to put in a call to the Texas Rangers. Ranger Jace Pearson was assigned to the case and drove to the Hawks Ranch to meet Sheriff Hanson. Jace, am I glad to see you. Howdy, Sheriff. It's been a long time. Yeah, a month of Sundays. I hope I didn't call you down here for nothing, Jace, but this looks mighty fishy to me. So I want you to take a look at the body. Hasn't been taken down yet? No, I put in a call to the coroner, but he was out somewhere. I left a message for him to come out here as soon as they could locate him. How'd you find out about the body, Sheriff? I got a phone call, Jace, about 9.15. Said it was George Hawks and he was going to kill himself. I thought maybe it was some joker, so I traced the call. And? It came from here all right. So I drove out fast as I could, but George was dead. Hanging by the neck in the bottom. No pulse. Body's still warm. Sheriff, I know you didn't call me down here to investigate a routine suicide. What's the catch? Well, I'm getting all that. Come on the barn. This is just the way he was when I found him. You notice that's a wire he's hanging from, not a rope. Yeah. Cut off the clothesline, probably. Huh? How do you know? Guessed. I saw the clothesline had been cut, part of a dragon on the ground in the yard. <laughs> you rangers don't miss much, do you? Not if we can help it, Sheriff. Well, I want to show you something I found. Look at this, right under the body. Mm-hmm. It's an oil drum. Right. And the exact position I found it in, on its side. Now you'll notice, Jace, that... It's the only thing near enough that George could have stood on while he put the wire around his neck. And here's the rim marks where it stood on the straw before it was tipped over. Yeah, only he didn't stand on it. Look at this end of the drum. Thick with dust. Hmm. Now look at the other end. Dusty, too. Jace, is not a sign of a footprint on either end of this oil drum. You're right, Sheriff. Couldn't have climbed up in the loft and jumped, or that wire would have taken his head off. Yeah, that's what I figured, and that's why I called you. What about fingerprints? Nope. Couldn't find any, just a few smears. What does it spell to you, Jace? Just one word, and an unpleasant one. Murder. Line and nosed around for more evidence. The sheriff went up to look over the house while I combed the barn. How'd you make out up at the house, Sheriff? Nothing, Chase. Absolutely nothing. 
No note from George. Everything tidy. No sign of a struggle. Funny nobody's around. Who would be on now? His wife, Millie, and one of the hands. He had two men working for him last I heard. How are you coming, Jason? Well, I found a couple of things, but not the thing I want. What's that? The tool that was used to cut the wire he's hanging on. No, I found in the barn here was this pair of rusty pliers. Well, couldn't they have been used to cut it? No, Sheriff, they wouldn't cut butter. Besides, the cut's too clean. How about footprints? No luck yet. But I think I found what the killer stood on to string the body up. What? The step ladder. I found it under the tool bin. It's been used lately. Marks in the dust where it's been dragged out and then pushed back. Well, what are you fixing to do, Jace? Going up the ladder and take a look at the beam where the wires loops over. Here, here, I'd better hold it for you. Pretty rickety. Thanks. Find something? I think so. What is it, Jace? Look at this. Stuck on the splinter where the wire went over the beam. It's a piece of black thread. Yeah, black wool thread. <laughs> well, are you a string saver, Jace? In a case like this, yes. Let's take a look outside. What about a motive, Sheriff? For suicide or murder? Either. Uh, can't think of one offhand. George is a pretty normal guy. Happily married. Didn't have any enemies that I know. How about those two hands you mentioned? Well, this new one, Brad Johnson, been working for George about six months. Only met him a couple of times. Seemed to be all right. In a quiet sort of way. The other? <laughs> Old Tom. He's okay. He drinks a lot. George used to fire him regular and then take him back when he sobered up. There's no good footprints in the yard here. Nope. Ground's packed pretty hard. Oh, the sheriff, hmm? A car coming up the house. Is that the corner? That? Uh, well, no, that looks like... Well, sure, that's George Hawk's car. That's Millie driving. Mrs. Hawk, come on. We'll have to tell her, Sheriff. This is the only part of the job I really hate. Yeah, I know, Jace. Doing out this way, and Good morning, Mrs. Orts. This is Ranger Pearson. Howdy, man. Ranger, what's happened with man? I'm sorry to have to tell you, Millie, but George. Is... Something happened to George? Yes, he's dead. Oh, no. <laughs> oh, Mrs. Orts. <laughs> we'll take you to the house. <laughs> Believe it, do it. Mrs. Hawks, when did you last see your husband? Just a few hours ago at breakfast. How did he appear at breakfast? I mean, was anything wrong? Was he upset about anything? Well, yes. There was a big fight at breakfast. I never seen George get in my head. Fight? Between you and your husband? Well, all four of us went on it. Old Tom and Brad was there, too. They're the hard hands. How did it start? I cooked breakfast for the four of us, like I always do. Old Tom was late, so we started to eat. When we were about through, old Tom came staggering in. He was half drunk. Again, huh? Yes, Sheriff. Then he and George had this big row, and George fired him for being drunk. Go on. Old Tom was fighting mad. He gets mean when he's been drinking. Started making all kinds of wild accusations. What kind of accusations, Mrs. Fox? Lies, Ranger. All of them lies. He said he wouldn't have been drunk if Brad hadn't bought liquor for him. Brad? Well, that's what he claimed. Said Brad got him drunk on purpose, so it... Oh, it was awful. So he could what? Well, it's a lie, Ranger. It... What did he say, Mrs. Hawks? Well, old Tom said to Brad, I wouldn't be drunk if you didn't buy me the stuff. You're always trying to get me out of the way, so I won't see you... So I won't see you playing up to the boss's wife. Then what happened? Well, Tom left. And my husband started swearing and threatening Brad, accusing him of what Tom said. Brad said it was lying, and George threw some money in his face and told him to get off the place that he was fired, too. What did Brad do? I thought for a minute he was going to hit George, but he didn't. He went outside, and a few minutes later, I heard his car stop, and he drove away. By this time, George was in a terrible rage. He even threatened to kill me. So I grabbed the car keys and ran. Did he ask you where you were going? Yes, he did, Ranger. I told him I was going into town to see Mr. Harris, the lawyer, to see about getting divorced. What time did you leave? About 8.30. Ranger, you said you found him hanging in the barn. 
If it was suicide, why are you asking me all these questions? Because I don't think it was suicide, Mrs. Hawks. I think it was murder. After the coroner and the doctor arrived, the sheriff borrowed a horse from the corral, I got charcoal out of the trailer, and we headed for Tom's shack up in the hills. There he is, Chase. Just around those rocks. That Tom's horse, Sheriff? Grazing out back? Yep. He's around someplace. Up, sir. I just can't see old Tom as a killer, Jace. He ain't the type. Huntsville's full of them, Sheriff. Killers who aren't the type. Ooh, ooh, ooh. ooh charcoal. Ooh. Yeah. Let's try the front door. Okay. All right, Tom. Open up. He's not here, Jace. I can see through the window. Shack's empty. What the... Somebody's shooting close by. Maybe Tom. That shot came from back up in that draw. Come on, Sheriff. There he is. Back by that clump of trees. Is that Tom? Sure is. Hey, he's running through all the trees. Hold it, Tom. There we are. I'll put one over his head. Ah. Yeah, he's stopping. See what he's wearing, Chase? Yeah. Black sweater. Now, what's on the commotion? All right, Tom. Throw down that rifle. Sure. Sure, Ranger. But, uh... What for? Why didn't you stop when I told you to? Well, to tell the truth, Ranger, I didn't hear you. I'm kind of deaf. I heard you shot, though. Yeah, that's right, Jace. He's hard of hearing. What's that, Sheriff? Oh, never mind. Why'd you shoot at us, Tom? Shooting you? Why, I never did no such thing. What were you doing, then? There ain't no law against a man killing himself a rabbit for supper. All right. Get his rifle, Sheriff. Let's go. Uh, where to? To your shack first. We're going to have a long talk about George Hawks. I'll tell you, Ranger, I didn't know George was dead until you told me a minute ago. Uh, what call would I have to kill him? If he was killed, he was my friend. You don't seem very clear about what happened this morning, Tom. Well, I... Uh... I was a bit foggy. I had me a couple of nips. But I do remember George getting mad and firing me. What happened after that? Well, I took a few more out of the bottle in my saddlebag. I don't remember much after that. I must have rode up here and fell asleep. Woke up a while ago. I was hungry and I went out to get me a rabbit. Tell me, Tom. Do you often draw a blank when you've been drinking? Do, do I what, Ranger? Have a blank space. Do things you don't remember anything about later. Oh, I suppose I have once or twice. Hey, wait a minute. I didn't do it. I couldn't have killed George. He was my friend. Is your wire cutters on the table, Tom? Oh, yeah, they are. I'll take them. And I think you'd better come along to town with us. are listening to Tales of the Texas Rangers, starring Joel McRae as Ranger Jace Pearson at our new Sunday time. We hope that our many friends who have listened to us at the earlier hour will continue to be with us each Sunday. And for those of you who are hearing our program for the first time, we extend a warm and cordial welcome and invite you to be with us each Sunday from now on. And now we continue with tonight's case, Hanging by a Thread. An authentic story from the files of the Texas Rangers. The finger was pointing straight at Tom. When we got back to the Hawks Ranch, there was a man in the back lot feeding the hogs. It was Brad Johnson, the third witness at the breakfast fight. While the sheriff took Tom into town, I got Brad's version of what happened. And then he threw the money in my face, Ranger. Thirty dollars. Told me I was fired. I wanted to hit him, but I didn't. Then what, Brad? Then I got my duffel bag, filled my car, and drove off. Where'd you go? To Finney. Drove around town for a few minutes. And then I went to the White Spot Cafe and had a cup of coffee. What time was this? When I was in the cafe? Oh, about 9.30, I guess. Why'd you come back here? Well, somebody in town said that George had killed herself and that the coroner was on his way out here. So? Well, I figured if it was true, there wouldn't be anybody to do the chores. He fired old Tom, too. And Mrs. Hawks always treated me so friendly. 
Well, sir, I've come out to do what I could. Very nice of you. Tell me, Brad, is there anything between you and Mrs. Hawks? No, sir. It's a lie, Ray. Never even spoke to each other seven at meal times or say good morning. What are you planning to do now? Well, I don't know. Have Mrs. Hawks till she can get somebody ready. I see. Well, I gotta be moseying along. Oh, uh, don't leave town without letting me know. Oh, I, I won't, Ranger. I'll be around. the evidence off to Austin and then went to the White Spot Cafe. Brad had been seen there at 9.30, and Mrs. Hawks had been with her lawyer half an hour before. I radioed headquarters where I was staying over in Finney, and about 9 that night, I got a phone call. Hello? Chase, Captain Stinson. I've got the report on that stuff you sent in today. You got a pencil? Sure have, Captain. Shoot. On that black wool sweater, the thread you sent in the envelope matched all right. It's definitely off the sweater. How about the wire cutters? Well, yeah, Fred, I got a disappointment for you there, Jase. They couldn't get a match. I'm afraid the murder wire wasn't cut with the tool you sent. Are you sure, Captain? The boys in the lab are. They made sample cuts with every millimeter of those blades and couldn't match up a single one with a murder wire. Oh. What kind of a fix does that put you in, Jase? Oh, I'm not sure. Well, thanks, Captain. I'll keep in touch with you. All right, Jase. Good luck. <laughs> getting tangled up. It's about 4 a.m. when I finally dozed off trying to dope it out. Then at 8.30, I met the sheriff in his office. Well, you look like you've been through the ring at Jay's. Hotel bed's too hard for you. No, but I didn't get much sleep trying to figure this Hawks thing out. Looks like we have to let old Tom go, Sheriff. Why? What's up? The lab says Tom's cutters didn't cut that wire. They didn't? No. Of course, old Tom could have used other cutters, but in his stupor, I doubt if he'd be that clever. No. Well, I hate to complicate things more than they are, Jason. What do you mean? Carna called a little while ago. He sent him his report over with one of my deputies. Should have been here by now. His verdict is suicide. Suicide? <laughs> Doesn't make sense. Well, apparently does to him. We'll know when the report gets here. Yeah. George Hawks, deceased. Climbed up a stepladder, put a wire around his neck, and then placed the ladder neatly under a workbench 12 feet away. My dusty oil drum snoring things up, Jason. Considerably. Morning, Sheriff. Mm. Howdy, Ranger. Hi. Good morning, Joe. Did you get it? Yep. I had to wait while the car and signed it. Here it is. Yeah, thanks, Joe. Anything more I can do, Sheriff? Wait. No, not right now. Well, I'll go get me some breakfast then. Yeah, let's see. No marks of violence on the victim's body. Autopsy disclosed no brain injury. Death probably caused by strangulation. Coroner's conclusion, suicide. Signed G. Parker Carr. Mm -hmm. There it is, Jace. Couldn't be. Now, here's something from the doctor. I examined the body at 11.30 a.m. It was my opinion the death occurred approximately three hours previous. Uh, um, hey, wait a minute, Sheriff. Uh, what is it? I didn't make it about 8.30 when George died. What time did you say he called you? At 9.15. Great suffering. Sheriff. Are you sure it was George who called? Well, now that you mention it, I'm, I'm not sure. Said he was George. Could it have been somebody else? I suppose so. It's beginning to piece together, Sheriff. Whoever it was could have killed George, then called you and tried to sound like him. To establish an alibi. Exactly. And then pop up someplace else a few minutes later. Like the White Spot Cafe. I'll call you later. Well, where are you going, Chase? Back to the Hawks Ranch. <laughs> Pulled up to the ranch, Brad Johnson was running water into the big trough near the barn. Well, hi, Ranger. This brings you out this way. I want to talk to Mrs. Hawks. We're releasing Tom. Warner's report came in a few minutes ago. Suicide. Is she around? Why, sure, she's up the house. Okay. Oh, I... I just happened to think... Charcoal, my horse here in the trailer, hasn't had a square meal since I left headquarters yesterday. Is there some hay around that I could give him? Why, sure, Ranger. Some fresh bale just inside the barn there, hip, sir. Thanks. I'll be glad to pay for it. No, no, forget it. I'm sure Mrs. Hawks wouldn't mind. Oh, well. Uh, have you got something to open one with? Why, sure. Here. Here's my cutters. <laughs> into the barn and made 
made some cuts on a wire sample. After I gave the cutters back to Brad and fed charcoal, I spoke briefly with Mrs. Hawks, and then I tore out the lab in Austin. By one o'clock, I got the results. Here it is, Jace. Take a look. The wire's masked, Johnny. See for yourself. That dual microscope never lied to me yet. The left one's the murder wire. The one on the right is one of the samples you brought in. That's it. Look at those striations. It's a perfect match. Thanks, Johnny. Take care of this stuff. Got to get back to Finney pronto. Oh, will you do me a favor? Sure, Jace. Call the sheriff at Finney. Tell him I'm on my way and I got something hot. I'll be there in two hours. Well, Jace, you sure made good time. What'd you find out? You got positive proof the murder wire was cut with Brad Johnson's cutters. Brad's? You gonna pick him up? Not right yet, Sheriff. Why not? We only know that Brad's cutters were used. We don't know he used them. We've got to be sure. What are your plans, Jason? I've been thinking. Those stories that Mrs. Hawks and Brad told me, they were alike, all right. Too much alike. What do you mean? A couple of times they used the exact phrases. Mm -hmm. What about Tom and the black thread? We keep an eye on him, but I think he's clean. He could have caught his sleeve on that beam doing anything. Kitchen hay or anything. Yeah, he could have. Well, uh, what do we do now? We've got to catch him alone. Brad and Mrs. Hawks. And they don't know anybody's around. We've got to hear what they say to each other. Maybe after the funeral. It's this afternoon, 4 o'clock. You know where it's being held, Sheriff? Sure, out of the ranch. It'll be a graveside ceremony. Where's the cemetery? Clear over on the other side of town from the Hawks' place. Take them a while to get over there and back. Sheriff, while they're at the cemetery, you and I are going to the ranch and fix up a little surprise. Why three microphones? Jace, wouldn't one do? Not if they wander around the house while they're talking, Sheriff. I want to hear everything. And how do you know that Brad and Mrs. Hawks will talk? How do you know they'll even come into the house? I don't know, Sheriff. I'm guessing. My guess is that after the funeral's over, somebody's going to let his hair down. Hey, it's almost five, Jace. They'll be coming back soon. I'm finished in here, Sheriff. And all we have to do is string the wire to the stake out. Come on. set up our equipment in a clump of trees close to the house. Three neighbors' cars drove up, then Brad's. We watched him as he fed the stock. About sundown, the last of the guests left the house. I go the last of them, Sheriff. Can you see Brad? He's been in the barn the last few minutes. Mm -hmm. There he is, Jason, heading for the house. Good. Put on your earphones, Sheriff. I want you to hear this, too. There he goes, up on the porch. Brad. Oh, Brad. Ah, come on, mate. Oh, Brad, I'm so tired. I'm scared. Ain't nothing to be scared about. Everything worked out fine. Oh, take me away with you, Brad, now, tonight. Billy, I can't do that. You know it. Why not? Why can't you? The plan. Baby, we gotta follow the plan. Now that now there's no time, we gotta let it go. Oh, I can't spend another night in this house, not alone. I can keep seeing his face. You hold it. That's not the best when I put the pillow over his face. I can't stand it. I can't stand it. Shut up. Look, you, I put a lot of hard work on us. My alibi's got him clear off the trail, and I'm gonna let him get back on. You have him. All right, Sheriff. I've heard enough. Let's take. You cover the back, Sheriff. I'll take the front. Okay, Jace. All right, in there. Open up. Ranger Pearson, open up. What do you want? You know what I want, Brad Johnson. He's not here. I know different. Okay, Sheriff, let's search the house. All right, Jace. I don't know what this is all about. We'll find out. Stand in the kitchen, Jace. All right, Sheriff, work this way. Ranger, what's the meaning of this? He's not in the back of the house, Jace. Maybe he's in. What was that? He's upstairs, Sheriff. Sounds like he jumped from up there. Come on. Don't see him. He didn't run for his car. Couldn't have gone far. Maybe he hit for the highway. What's that? Chickens in the barn. Something scared him, and I think I know what. Come on. If you play this right, we've got him trapped. 
I know you're in there, Brad. Come on out. All right. The dark is pitching there, Jason. Turn on your flashlight, Sheriff. Take the other side. I'll look behind you. Okay. Hey! What is it, Sheriff? Pitchfork! Threw it from the loft! Hit me! You hurt bad? Don't think so. My shoulder. Hey, give me your flashlight, Sheriff. All right, Brad. I'm coming up. No! No, don't come up. I'm coming down. Come on where we can see you then. With your hands up. Jace, he's jumping! Look out! Oh! He dead? No. No, Sheriff, he's not dead. And I can't say he won't be, though, when the state gets to him. After Mildred Hawks turned state's witness, Brad Johnson confessed to the murder of his employer. For her part in the crime, Mildred Hawks received a sentence of 50 years in a women's prison at Huntsville. Johnson's sentence, death in the electric chair. And now, here again is the star of our show, Joel McRae. While most of the mail that comes to us here at Tales of the Texas Rangers is written by grown-ups, the youngsters have their questions, too. Tonight, I'd like to read you a postcard from a boy in Newark, New Jersey. It says, Dear Mr. McCray, I am nine years old. Me and my friend Tony was talking about being Texas Rangers when we grew up. How do you go about getting that job? Your friend, Tommy Cook. Well, Tommy, a lot of people have asked us that same question recently, and I guess maybe it's high time for us to tell them. First, a ranger has to serve at least 10 years as an outstanding police officer. Then he may compete with others for the job. If he's selected, he works under the wing of a ranger captain for at least six months, and then he's put out in the field with other seasoned rangers for a year and a half. By this time, he is or he isn't a true Texas Ranger. And Tommy, your card's being sent to Colonel Homer Garrison, Jr., chief of the Texas Rangers. Good luck. Good night. Next week, Joel McRae in another authentic reenactment of a case from the files of the Texas Rangers. is currently seen starring in the Universal International Technicolor production, Saddle Print. Tonight's cast included Tony Barrett, Byron Kane, Betty Lou Gerson, Jeff Corey, and Wally Mayer. This story was transcribed and adapted by Andrew McBroom, and the program was produced and directed by Stacy Keach. This is Hal Gibney speaking. Three chimes mean good times on NBC. Tuesday nights are bright with comedy on NBC. Start off the evening with Baby Snooks. Hear Fibber McGee and Molly of 79 Wistful Vista. Listen as Art Linkletter proves that people are funny and laugh with Bob Hope and his gang. It's truly fine entertainment every Tuesday night. So be sure to listen for Baby Snooks, Fibber McGee and Molly, People Are Funny, and Bob Hope. The National Broadcasting Company presents... Joel McRae in Tales of the Texas Rangers. Tonight transcribed from Hollywood, another authentic reenactment of a case from the files of the Texas Rangers. Tales of the Texas Rangers starring Joel McRae as Ranger Jace Pearson. Texas, more than 260,000 square miles. And 50 men who make up the most famous and oldest law enforcement body in North America. Now, from the files 
of the Texas Rangers come these stories based on fact. Only names, dates, and places are fictitious for obvious reasons. The events themselves are a matter of record. Case for tonight, room 114. It is 4.47 p.m. the afternoon of October 29th, 1927. Liz Ferris, a chambermaid at the Hotel Alamo in the town of Limpia, Texas, approaches Sam Bixby, the desk clerk. Mr. Bixby. Hmm? <laughs> oh, Liz, thought you went home. I uh, can't see if I'll ever get home till I get the rooms finished. And I still ain't been in room 114. 114? Mm -hmm. That's Mr. Boland's room. Oh, he went out a couple hours ago. Well, he left one of them do not disturb cards on his door just the same. His key ain't in the box there. I looked before while you were sorting out the mail. Well, he probably just forgot to leave his key. You got your pass key, you can get in. Well, how'd you know he didn't come back again without you seeing him? Suppose he's in there taking a bath. <laughs> all right, Liz, all right, come on. I'll come back with you. Give me the keys. Mm -hmm. Some folks don't care at all when I finish work, long as they can sleep the day away. Now, Liz, Mr. Boland's been here for two days, and this is the first time he's given you any trouble. Well, if it ain't him, it's somebody else. There, there's that do not disturb card on the door, like I said. You'd try knocking? Not on the door, of course I didn't. I got some consideration for other folks, even if they ain't got none for me. Besides, I run the vacuum clean on the hall hard enough to wake the dead. Well, he don't answer the knock. Sure, he went out. Well, if you're so sure, why don't you open the door then? You, uh, you in, Mr. Boland? Mr. Boland? He's out, all right. Go ahead, Liz. All right, I'll make the bed first and get the bed. Ah! Oh, oh, man, it's legs sticking out from under the bed, and, and there's blood on the rug. Let me out of here. No, 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 be quiet, Liz. Don't let the other guests hear you. I better call the sheriff right away. Sheriff James Kerfus reached the murder scene and immediately sent out a request for assistance from the Texas Rangers. Ranger Jace Pearson was assigned to investigate. He joined the sheriff in room 114 of the Alamo Hotel. Everything just like I found it, Ranger. Except I had the bed moved so as I could get a look at the body. Throat slashed, huh? It's like it was done with a straight-edge razor, Sheriff. Yeah. A uh, weapon ain't around any place, so that's what made me figure it was murder for sure. Well, figured that out even if the razor was around. Hmm? Palms of his hands are cut, too. He tried to grab the razor and get it away from whoever killed him. Oh, she. Better cover him with a sheet. Austin will have fingerprint man here soon. You know who he is? Name on the register is Henry Bowen. Been here two days. Come up from Lone Star to sell some cattle at the auction barn. All the way up here from Lone Star to auction cattle? It's pretty far. Yeah, now that you mention it, yes. Yeah, plenty far. Who discovered the body? The desk clerk from Keenan Moon. You must have passed him out in the hall. I told him to wait right outside. Yeah, I saw him. We better talk to him. Right. Just trying to clean the Fix me. Uh, huh? Yes, Range wants to talk. Oh, sure thing. I already told you all I know, Sheriff. Anybody come in to visit in this room today? Well, it's hard to say, Ranger. A lot of cattlemen in town when the auction's running. Well, nobody stopped by the desk, but you know how it is. Men know each other, visit around. Sure. If he'd been out tending his business like a man ought to be, he mightn't be dead. That's what I said. Now, Liz, I told you he was out. I saw him go. When was this? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. A little later, maybe. But I didn't see him come in again. You sure it was Boland you saw? Might have been somebody dressed like him. Wearing his clothes, maybe. Oh, no, I saw him good enough to know for sure. Stopped just a few feet from the desk to wipe his eyeglasses with a handkerchief. Eyeglasses? Something wrong with that, Jeez? I'll tell you in a minute. Uh, he wear glasses all the time? Mm, every time I yeah, see him, sure he did. did. Let's see. When you opened this door, most of the body was hidden by the bed, wasn't it? Yeah. That's right. The bed's been moved since then. I think you better come in and identify the body. Oh, do we have to? Yeah, I'm afraid it's necessary. Because the man in here didn't wear glasses. Oh. Come on. Yeah. Okay. Now, look, he, uh, he wouldn't have to be wearing them when he was killed, Jay. He never wore them. 
man who wears glasses all the time has little pressure marks alongside the bridge of his nose. It's a thing we always look for. Helps with identification. Now move the sheet. Mm -hmm. What? That ain't Mr. Bowling. No, it ain't. Well, then who is this fellow? Sheriff, I don't know. I, I never saw him before. He, he's a lot different. Mr. Bowling not only wore glasses, he had a mustache. Mm -hmm. And this fellow don't. This couldn't be him clean-shaven? No, sir, could not. Looks like Boland isn't our victim, Sheriff. Looks like he's the killer. <laughs> made some photos of the dead man, got a quick developing job done, then headed for Lone Star, the town Boland had given us his address. On the way, I called my headquarters and asked to have Ranger Steve Clark meet me there. He was waiting at the county courthouse when I drove up. Howdy, Jason. Howdy, Steve. Been waiting long? No, just got here about half an hour ago. Say, what's up? Headquarters fill you in on the killing of the Alamo Hotel in Olympia? Yeah, they told me about it. Good. How far out's the Boland Ranch? Well, it begins nine miles southwest. What do we do, go out and grab Boland? If he's around, well, it isn't likely. After checking out of that hotel and leaving a dead man in his room... Why'd you head this way, then? Well, nobody at Olympia had seen the dead man before. You gotta find out who he is. If there was bad blood between him and Boland, somebody around here might know about it. That's good thought. I'll lock my horse in with yours, and we can go out to the ranch and wake him up. <laughs> was plenty big, spreading and sprawling out south of the main highway. The ranch house was deserted except for a Mexican woman. She was frightened and wouldn't unlatch the screen door. We just want to talk to you, man. Go That's away, all. go away. You come back again when Mr. Boland is here. We're Texas Rangers. We just want some information from you. I know nothing, please. You go away. If Mr. Boland is in there, we'd like to talk to him. No one is here, senor. No one but me. It won't do you any good to hide him, ma'am. If he's not there, why can't we come in and look around? No. We should have gotten the search warrant, James. No, nah, she's just frightened because she's alone. There ought to be somebody else around the ranch this size. Bolden must have hands. Yeah. Uh, where are the men, senora? The vaqueros who work on the ranch. Round up. All out to work. They round up. All right, senora. You can go back to bed. We'll go talk to them. <laughs> Your senora wasn't really too happy to see you, boy. I know. Well, let's get the horses out of the trailer. You really want to look for those cow folks tonight? Yeah, because we got plenty of other things to do in the morning. Come on, Charco. Not Come on. What's on your mind for the morning? Find out where Boland banks. Watch his account so we can trace him if he cashes a check anyplace. Hey, it'll make it tougher for him to hide, all right. That's how I want to make it. Tough. Well, let's ride. Get up. Get up. Get up. Get up. Boland had plenty of stock, all right. He passed cows and calves for the score. But ground marks showed that the main herds, the selling beef, were driving south. The railroad runs to the south, Chase. Guess they're moving them that way for shipping. Figures. That's why we had to ride so far. Yeah, it must make, take them three or four days to cut out the steers and drive them to a main camp. We ought to be spotting some riders soon. Trail marks have been getting fresher. And if we don't, we're going to have to rest these ponies. We've been knocking on them steady now for about it's three... It's all right. We're getting yeah. close. They can rest soon. Look. Where? Mace over there in the moonlight. Look down at the base. On the east end. Yeah, campfire. Come on, sir. Come on. Get up. You can see the stock now. Only part of the herd from the looks of it. Probably got a few folks working each section driving into the railhead from different angles. They can drive them any way they want. All I want is somebody who can identify the photographs of a dead man. <laughs> Chase, nobody around it. That's kind of funny, isn't it? The fire must have been made by cow folks. They gotta be around. Horses couldn't move far if they were hobbled, but there ain't any horses inside either. Nothing but part of the herd. Maybe they moved around the other side of the mesa. <coughs> whoa, whoa, whoa. Where'd that chuck come from, Jace? Up a brush and rock, the edge of the mesa. Oh, easy. Come through, fellas. Come on, we can see you keep your hands high. Not while you're gunning from cover. Who are you? 
Small. Never mind the introductions, Tuller. You always throw lead at anybody riding this range? I fired over your head. Just a warning. A warning for what? Yes, orders, Rangers. Somebody's been making off with some stock, and Bowling told us to be on the lookout for strange riders. Bowling? You around? No. When did you see him last? Just before we started out on Roundup. Tuller and I ain't seen anybody but each other for almost a week. And you don't have any idea where your boss might be? How would we know? You seem mighty anxious to find him. I am mighty anxious. Yeah, the boss in uh, some kind of trouble? He's in plenty of trouble. We'll find it out sooner or later. Yeah. He's wanted for murdering a man in a hotel in Olympia. So if you know where he is or even where he might be, you better talk up. Well, if we knew, we'd tell you right off, but we don't. You know anybody Bolin's been having trouble with? No. Nope. Well, the boss never had trouble with nobody. There's a dead man who'd disagree with that if he could. Get those photos out of your saddlebag, will you, Steve? Right. Why? Maybe you can identify the man Boland killed. Here you are, Jase. Thanks. Here, Tuller, you're yeah. too small. Huh? Take a look. What's she? Ranger. Boland never killed this man. What makes you so sure of that? Because this is the boss. This is a picture of Boland himself. Listening to Tales of the Texas Rangers, starring Joel McRae as Ranger Jace Pearson. We continue now with tonight's case, Room 114, an authentic story from the files of the Texas Rangers. We had our killer, Cole, knew his name, his address, and he turned out to be the dead man. The case fell apart. It didn't make sense. You're sure this is a photo of Bowling? We ought to know. We've been working for him for a year ever since he come down from Wyoming and bought this spread. The desk clerk at the hotel in Olympia said he'd never seen this man before. I can't have that. Bowling was registered at that hotel for two days. The clerk said he wore eyeglasses and a mustache. And then the man he saw wasn't Henry Bowling. There's something fishy about this whole thing, Jace. I can't figure why anybody... Wait a minute, Steve. Huh? You fellas said Boland thought somebody was running his stock off? Yes, right. Is his brand registered? Sure it is. Box B brand. Thanks. If you want any more information, we'll be out to see you later. Come on, Steve. But, Jay, sweet... Come on. Get mounted. Get up, sir. Get up. Come on. Hope you catch the men yet, sir. Hey. What's on your mind, Jace? What'd you ask about the missing cattle and the brand registration? Boland thought some of his cattle were missing. The registered brand stolen cattle are hard to get rid of. It wouldn't be so hard if the thief took them to an out-of-the-way auction barn like the one in Limpia and then pretended to be Boland when he sold them. Hey, Jace, that makes sense. Sure it does. That's why somebody registered the Alamo under Boland's name. Then Boland must have found out about it, went up to Limpia for his showdown, and got himself killed. That's the picture. I'll buy it, Jace, but who killed it? That's something we're going to have to find out. Whoever it was, it was somebody Boland knew. He wouldn't have been able to follow him to that hotel room. And if the cattle were stolen from here by somebody Bolin knew, Bolin hadn't been here very long, the thief might have been one of his own ranch hands. We'll play it that way, Steve. Let's stick around here and see if we can find a poke with a mustache and eyeglasses. During the next morning, we spotted a pair of riders and asked if they knew of a hand with a mustache and glasses. There was such a man on the ranch, and they told us what general direction he might be working in. A couple of hours later, we found him alone, pushing some strays out of a blind draw. That's him, Jace. Just saw the sun reflect on his glasses. Let's go. Get up. Get up. You! There I where you are. Don't move for that rifle holster. We'll ask the questions. Mustache, too, Jace. Yeah. Just sit tight on that horse until I get your rifle. Now look, Ranger. 
When you come riding down on me like I've done something and grab my gun, I reckon I've got a right to know what it's all about. You been at the Alamo Hotel in Limpia recently? Never been in Limpia in my whole life. Where you been for the past four days? Right here on this range, work. Anybody with you? No, just me. How come? The other hands are working in twos and threes. Well, I ain't. I've been working through this Badlands strip. No herding here. Nothing but a few strays that one man can dig out. That's how it come. Anybody seen you here in the last couple of days? How could anybody see me? I've been way back in that scrub canyon. Yeah. Nobody saw you there. Nobody'd see you if you weren't there either. What's your name? Dave Booden. Booden, huh? All right, you better come with us. Come with you? For what? I ain't coming any place. I'm not asking you. I'm telling you. Somebody murdered your boss, Henry Boland, up in Limpia yesterday. Murdered Hank Boland? That's right. The description of the killer fits you. What? Well, you're crazy. I, I've been right here, I tell you. Tell me anything you want. But you're coming to Limpia. I want a couple of people to get a look at you. We got back to the car and drove Dave Booden to the sheriff's office in Limpia to see if he could be identified. Ranger, I'm telling you, I ain't never been near this town. If you haven't been here, you got nothing to worry about. Did you send for the chambermaid and the desk clerk, Sheriff? Yeah, yeah, they be here right off. Thanks. As a matter of fact, here they come now, up the outside steps. Seen through the window? Ranger, I'm telling you... You better I... not say anything just now, Booden. Come in. Uh, Howdy. Howdy. Uh, Reckon you remember the ranger here? Well, ain't likely we'd forget him after seeing him only yesterday. Liz, Mr. Bixby, I want you to meet Mr. Booden. Hi. Howdy. Howdy. Doesn't seem like you've ever met Mr. Booden before. Thought maybe you had. No. Ain't say I ever had the pleasure. No, me neither. Although for a minute he did look like... Like who? Now listen, lady, you never... Quiet, Booden. Oh, What's everybody getting excited about? I was just going to say, he looks like Sarah Leamy's old beau, the one that run off when everybody expected they was going to get married. <laughs> oh, right, Liz. Oh, right. Thanks, Liz, Mr. Bixby. I just wanted to be sure that this man wasn't the one who was registered under the name of Henry Bowler. Oh, oh, I see. Oh, no, nothing like him, except for the eyeglasses and the mustache. Yeah, I guess we might as well let these folks go back to the hotel, Chase. Yeah, it's like you were telling the truth, Putin. I'm sorry. No harm done, Ranger. No way you could have known uh, geez, I've been thinking. You suppose a uh, mustache and eyeglasses might have been a uh, disguise to throw us off? That's a thought, Sheriff. It's been done before. Well, that ain't the way it was this time, Ranger. Why not, Bixby? Well, them glasses may have been fake, but not the mustache. Man, you're after had a real mustache. I know, because cause I seen him in the barber shop, and the barber trimmed it. <laughs> put Booden on the bus to Lone Star and sent him back to the Boland Ranch. Clark and I spent the next day questioning everybody in Limpia. The crew at the auction barn, cattlemen, everybody. They couldn't add a thing to what we already knew. When we got back to the sheriff's office, there was more bad news. Had a call from your headquarters at Olson, Chase. They checked those prints the lab crew lifted from 114. Whoever left him had no record. Yeah, that does it. I still think it must have been somebody from Boland's ranch. Somebody he knew. That's what we think, and that's the way it looks. Let's face it, Jace. Could have been a stranger stole the cattle. Boland found out about it, went in for a showdown like any hothead, and got himself killed. Killer could have come in from any direction and left in any direction. Yeah, that's right, Jace. No way you're telling... Come in. How'd they, Sheriff? Rangers? Yeah. Something we can do for you? Well, my name is Denny. I drive a line haul for interstate trucking. Route between New Orleans and El Paso. I think I got some information you might want. At least was I thought so over at the Alamo Hotel. What kind of information? This. Key to room 114, Alamo. Where'd you get this? Was it was nightfall last. The night of the day Bolton was killed, Jake. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, so my relief man was driving. We made a coffee stop, placed about 40 mile this side Lone Star. Pull the truck in the side of the service station there. I was sleeping and didn't want my coffee, so I stayed in the cab and dozed while a relief man went inside. I got it. Go on. Well, cattle truck pulled in for gas. Empty. Empty cattle truck, huh? Headed which way? Southwest. Toward Lone Star. You notice the license? No, no, but there was a mark on the side. Box with a B in the middle of it. Bowling's Box B brand, Jase. Must have been the truck used to haul the stolen cattle up here. Yeah, to haul the killer back to the ranch. Uh, what about the key? I was coming to that. Uh, fell in the cattle truck. He paid for the gas. I didn't say him too good. I 
I've just sort of slumped in my cab, you know, half groggy, not exactly watching him, but seeing. Yeah, I know what you mean. Well, when he fished money out of his pocket, I saw him kind of look at something he dug out with him. Then he sort of looked around like he was looking for some place to throw it. Station man left him to go inside the change. Then the fellow walked right past my truck real quick. He didn't see me, of course, because the cab was dark, and I heard him throw something. Make kind of a clink. Then he went back to the cattle rig and drove off. That's what it threw away, this hotel key here? You see, I found it when my partner came out. We went back to check the top and the tailgate, and I sort of looked around and found the key with my flash. How come you didn't just drop it in the mailbox? Well, we had a lot of stops along the line, loading, unloading. And the route came right through here. Thought I'd stop it and just drop it off. Information help you in? It sure does. Thanks. Our headquarters will see to it your boss hears about it, too. Sheriff, better take down his statement. Okay, Jeeves. Come on, Steve. Uh, see you later. All right, Jeeves. Heading back to the Lone Star. As fast as the wheels will turn. Pile in. Yep. How are we going to narrow it down, Jakes? Booten was the only hand with a mustache and the glasses, and he's clear. Glasses still could have been phony. Some of the killer wore only while he was in Olympia. We know the mustache wasn't a phony. Bowen's hands have been on Roundup for a couple of weeks. A lot of them let their beards grow. It would have been a simple matter to shave the beard and leave a lip cover. Sneak away with a load of cattle and then shave clean before he got back. I know, I know, but Booten wasn't the only hand working alone. If one of the others did it and disappeared for a few days, his sidekick know about it. It doesn't have to be a one-man job, Steve. The sidekick could be in on it, too. Yeah, that figures. Well, what's our play, Jase? Fingerprint them all and get a check on the prints up at Austin? I think we can wrap it up quicker than that. We know the killer doesn't have a beard now and uses a straight razor. That was the murder weapon. Yeah. Booten can tell us which of the men shaved with straight razors, and once we know that, we can settle the rest with a camera I got in the car trunk. Now... By asking the straight razor men if they'd like to pose for a couple of identification pictures with eyeglasses and a phony mustache. Tell them we'll have to hold them until the pictures are seen by a couple of witnesses in Limpia. That ought to flush some action from them. Action? I'm betting the man who killed Boland will raise more fuss than the alligator when the lake went dry. Got back to Lone Star just in time. The bank had taken over the management of Boland's ranch as executors, and the roundup was just about complete. Last, the herd was being driven into the stock pens near the railroad siding when we reached the south end of the ranch. There's Booten, Jason. Take care of the horses over there by the corral. Yeah. Come on. Hey, Booten. Hey, Booten. Yeah? I want to talk to you a minute. Oh, no, Rita. How are you making out? It'll we'll make out fine if you will help. Pretty sure it was somebody on the ranch who killed your boss. Well, how can I help you? Just tell me which of the pokes use straight razors for shaving. Hmm. Let's see, is Jones, and Tuller, and Happy. Tuller, huh? Hey, Jace, isn't he the bright boy that fired on us first time we rode out on the range? He's the one, all right. He was keen shaving, too. The fella with him was named Small. You know where they are, Booten? Well, it was over there a minute ago, driving the last... Oh, oh, here they come now, Chase, around the end of the corral with the horses. Hey, you better drift away, Booten. Sure thing. Well, howdy, Rangers. Back again? Yeah. I'd like to have another talk with you, Tuller. You too, Small. Sure, ain't you? What's it about? Make your way till you this, Ma. Right. What do you want? Yeah. Find out who killed Bowling? I'm pretty sure it's one of the hands. All you fellas without beards are going in with us. What for? Why? Yeah. What would that prove? Prove plenty when we get what we want. Take photos of all of you with prop eyeglasses and mustache on you. A couple of people in Olympia want to see them. Well, if they think they recognize somebody, that ain't legal evidence. We'll have something to help it along. We'll fingerprint the man they think they saw what? because Boland's killer left his prints all over that hotel room. Raise it, warn me. Shut up. Huh? I helped steal the cattle, that's all. I didn't go to Olympia. He did. I told you to shut up, you rat. All right, Tuller. You can both... Get out, get out. Tuller lashed his horse and dove behind the other mounts at the rack. Right, an animal reared over us and knocked Small into me before Clark could grab the bridle. Oh, keep your eye on Small, Steve. I'm going after Tuller. He jumped the fence into the cattle chute, Ranger. Don't let him in. Don't let him in, I'll climb up. Get him from above. Let me out. Stay flat up there, Ranger. 
I can see you better than you can see me. You got yourself in a trap, color. Yeah? I'll have you if wanted to come down after me. I don't have to come down after you. You're a dead pigeon in that cattle chute. Yeah, don't you believe it, Ranger? No? That shot you fired's already got the cattle stirred up. Hey, you man down in the pen. Go, yeah, go. Open the gate so the herd can move into the chute. Right, Ranger! Go on! Give me more cover! Yeah, cover you won't like. If they open that gate and I fire into the herd, they'll run you down. You'll get chopped to death. All right, boys, open up the gate. I'm not fooling, Teller. I'll fire into them. No, 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 come on, come on. Here's my gun. All right, and climb up on the fence. All right, Major. All right, I'm coming. Now, here, give me your arm. I'll pull you out of there. Good, cool, Ranger, okay. Don't, don't let me drop now. I, 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 don't, I don't want to make no trouble, Ranger. I made a mistake, I admit it. You made a big mistake, Tuller. Too bad you didn't use that razor strictly for shaving. Go on. For his part in the crime, Charles Small received a sentence of 25 years. Frank Teller was tried and convicted for the murder of rancher Henry Boland. Today, after two decades, he still serves his sentence. Life imprisonment. And now, here again is the star of our show, Joel McRae. Reflecting on the old-time One Riot, One Ranger reputation of the Texas Rangers, a visitor to Texas recently mentioned to a ranger that he'd been noticing a number of current press reports where two rangers had participated in the quelling of a riot or investigation of a crime. After citing this observance to the ranger, the man asked, how come two men are being assigned to some of these cases now? Are the rangers less effective than they used to be? The lanky ranger shook his head. Oh, no, he said. One ranger is still sufficient to handle the situation, all right, but... In these days of complex legal technicalities, we've been sending two of them along. One to take care of what trouble there is, and the other one to serve as a sort of a disinterested witness. Good night, folks. See you next week. Next week, Joel McRae in another authentic reenactment of a case from the files of... The Texas Rangers! Joel McRae is currently seen starring in the MGM production Stars in My Crown. Tonight's cast included Tony Barrett, Ann Diamond, Herb Bygren, Peggy Weber, Tom McKee, Bill Johnstone, Herb Ellis, and Barney Phillips. This story was transcribed and adapted by Joel Murcott, and the program was produced and directed by Stacy Keach. This is Hal Gibney speaking. Three chimes mean good times on NBC. Monday chimes mean the best in music on NBC. Tomorrow night, Gordon McRae stars in the Railroad Hour presentation of the operetta The Firefly. The NBC Symphony presents a one-hour concert featuring works by Vivaldi, Wagner, and Stravinsky. Tomorrow's NBC Symphony concert marks the first in the series under the baton of the widely acclaimed young conductor Guido Cantelli. Now the $64 question. Three chimes mean good times on NBC.